Welcome to the free high ticket e-commerce accelerator, everybody. Uh, it's great to have you in the group. I'm just gonna go over some brief introductory notes before we actually dive into the content of the program. So first of all, welcome. I'm very happy to have you here. Uh, this program's obviously completely free. So hopefully I can provide you some value that in some way can make a positive impact on your life, whether that's building a store and escaping a job, or if you have an existing store, you have an existing um, agency or something, you can just take something from the program. Um, that's kind of my goal of it. The goal of the program is if you, it's built with this in mind. So if you've started, if you haven't started an e-commerce store, it's essentially taking you from zero, like you know absolutely nothing, to making your first sale. That's my goal of the program. So we're gonna help you, step one, set up your business, pick your niche, find your suppliers in your niche, demo store, build your demo store, close suppliers, onboard suppliers, and set up some preliminary advertising. So nothing here is going to be super, super complex or complicated or um, like obviously if you're starting, you need different information than someone who's trying to go from 100,000 a month to 200,000 a month. So this is taken, this is designed to help a beginner get to their first sale. So before we get started, um, you can take advantage of a free Shopify trial, and we are going to do this again in module four, but once you create a Shopify account, you can create as many stores on your account as you want. So I recommend you take advantage of this. When you click this, I believe you get three free days completely, and then you get three months at $1 per month. So it'll be $3 for the next three months. Um, so sign up. And I would just even just create a fake store and start familiarizing yourself with the platform. It'll be very valuable for you to get used to it, um, play around, learn how to learn how everything works. So then when we get to module four of the course, you're already very familiar with everything and setting up your store for real at that point will be that much easier. But that's all for this video, everybody. So just wanted to give you a welcome. I'm very happy to have you here and that you're part of the community. The goal of the program is to get you from zero, knowing absolutely nothing, to making your first sale. Um, make sure you take advantage of clicking this link. It'll also be linked on the course. So let me pop in there for a sec. So it will be linked here as well as here. So click that, take advantage of your free Shopify trial, um, get used to playing on the platform and that's all for this video, and I will see you in the next video, which is going to be about your instructor, which is a little bit about me, just so you have some background before we delve farther into the actual content. But very happy to have you here and being part of the community. Looking forward to working with you and helping you crush your goals. That's all for now, and I'll see you in the next video. Welcome to video two, everybody. So this is going to be a bit about me as the instructor of the course. So to sum it up very briefly, uh, from age two till about 20, um, I was a hockey player, so I played semi-professional hockey, um, played AAA all the way growing up, and ended up playing three years in the Ontario Hockey League, which is the highest junior hockey league in Canada, which is obviously known for its hockey. So in the NHL, all the best Canadian hockey players in the NHL get drafted out of the OHL. So I played in that league, um, had concussions put it into my hockey career. After that, I went to school. I was in law school. Um, many of you have probably heard me talk about this before, but always knew it wasn't for me, but I knew I wanted to start a business, but I, I didn't... I, didn't, I couldn't figure out where to start, what to do. So I, I made the justification like, oh, I'll become a corporate lawyer and I'll work with um, businesses as a lawyer instead of actually just starting my own business. So wasted, <laughs> I don't want to say wasted, but I was in school for six years of my life. Um, got Never even got the law degree, so I ended up dropping out my very last semester in February of 2022. I had started my e-com store in 2021 and I grew to $5 million in sales in my first 16 months, which allowed me to obviously make far more than I would have ever made as a lawyer, drop out of school. And then in late 2022, I launched my paid coaching program and mastermind. So I don't wanna sit here and blabble on about myself forever, just wanted to give you some high level background about me. So former semi-professional athlete turned law student, went to school for six years, excuse me, dropped out my very last semester because I was doing e-com, built my store to $5 million in my first 16 months, and then launched my coaching program. And now I launched my my free high ticket e-com accelerator, which is the school group that you are in now. So I hope you take some value from this program overall, but I just wanted to give you some brief preliminary info on myself. If you want to see me playing hockey, you can Google me. I'm sure it will come up. But um, yeah, I'll see you in the next video. Next video is going to be on the differences between this program that you're in now 
in the paid program that I offer. So I'll see you in that video and thank you for watching this one. Welcome to the video everybody. Today we're going to be discussing why high ticket e-com compared to some of the or other uh, styles of e-com. So uh, just to go through the list with you. Number one is higher priced items. So rather than selling um, $1,010 items, we can sell one $10,000 item. So obviously we're, we have a much higher profit per order and rather than having to deal with a thousand people for a ten dollar item, we get to deal with one person. So we can obviously give one person a much higher quality of service than we could give one thousand people, and the business is going to be much more administratively easy to run. There's just going to be less orders, less people to deal with, uh, less customers, less orders to submit, less returns, less warranties. It'll just overall be a much much easier business to run, and much higher profit per order. So we could. If we're making fifteen hundred dollars a sale profit, we could um, make six, seven sales and be at over ten k a month. So that's one of every like four days, which is obviously it's not even close to the same as if we're selling ten, fifteen dollar items. So number one is higher priced items. Number two is higher quality items. So rather than selling junk from AliExpress or from China, where people are just going to file chargebacks and we're going to have to start over once the business stops working because we're selling junk products, we can sell high quality products from the top brands in the USA. So we can get good reviews, we can get use those good reviews to get more customers down the line. Um, it's overall a much more sustainable business model. We're selling actually good quality stuff and just morally you can feel much better about selling high quality items um, from well-known brands that have been around for 50, sometimes even over 100 years and selling junk on like a one product store on from AliExpress. And um, obviously much higher profit margins need specific. So on high ticket com, profit margins will range from like um, on the low end, like 15 to the high end, 50, usually around 25 to 30%. Um, rather than shipping products from China, that's gonna take two, three weeks. We usually ship and it takes about a week to arrive at our customer. We're working with real brands. So people already know the products they're searching for. Um, we've already touched on a lot of these. There's much less customers to deal with. It's much more of a real business. Like you can grow your store to, um, there's not really a limit as to how big you can grow it. Um, to show you an example, this is a essentially a high ticket e-commerce store that is doing like over $50 million a year. They're selling all like fire um, place, fire pit barbecue stuff. So there's it's infinitely scalable, which is much different than low ticket. Um, you can use your reviews to get more customers and just versus low ticket. So low ticket, you're selling like one product in a store. It's usually low quality you're using Facebook ads. Um, you're going to have to sell a whole bunch to make any money. High ticket, it's complete opposite. So you have less customers, you have more profit per order. You have less um, orders to deal with. And versus direct to consumer, direct to consumer can work. It's definitely like when you have your own brand, but you have to usually buy inventory. It's much more costly up front. So high ticket essentially like you can start the business with under a thousand dollars and um, you still like it's crazy that you can start a business with under a thousand dollars that you can leverage and build into something that's worth fifty to a hundred million dollars. Uh, it's doing fifty to a hundred million dollars in sales every year. So very um, you kind of get the best of everything and if you down the line want to launch your own brand on your store or just your own brand altogether it's certainly possible. But um, launching your own brand when you're starting can be difficult because it's very difficult to build your own brand and it can be very costly to get inventory and everything like that. So you kind of get the best of all the worlds with high ticket income. You get real brands to work with, which allows you to skip the difficult process of creating a brand. You can sell stuff to people already looking for the stuff you're selling. So if I'm selling Ford cars, I can target people searching for my brands that I'm selling. So if you imagine a funnel, Someone at the top is searching, like, let's say, grill. Someone is searching Napoleon grill here, so a brand name grill. And at the bottom, Napoleon 32-inch grill in black. I can list Napoleon's products in my store and target people searching Napoleon 32-inch grill in black and sell them exactly what they're looking for. So they don't care where they're getting the products. Like, if you were buying an iPhone, you probably don't care if you get it from Amazon or Best Buy. You just want the best deal, best customer service. So it's very much the same thing. So as long as we have a nice website, we can give our customers good service and responsive they have no reason to not buy from us because they're getting the product that they're looking for so you really get kind of the best of all scenarios with high ticket e and it's infinitely scalable which is very very unique for a business that you can start with such little startup costs but i hope that gives you um, an overview of the business model why it's so advantageous to start with high ticket e compared to some of the alternatives um, if you have any questions throw them below the video but that's all for this and i'll see you in the next one where we will discuss the advantages of owning a business overall 
Welcome to video three, everybody. Today, we're going to be discussing the differences between this program that you're in, the free high ticket e-commerce accelerator, and the paid mastermind. So I always get asked, what is the difference between this and the paid course? The first thing is that's the wrong question because this, what you're watching right now, is a course. The paid program is not a course. It's a, it's a program slash mastermind. So just in terms of content, there is more content. So everything from like business setup to launching your store is the same. So business setup, niche selection, um, supplier research, demo store, closing suppliers, all that content. There is some other stuff in the paid one that's not in this, but it's quite, quite similar, um, same idea. The only difference with the paid program in that process is you're getting our coaching. So you get either myself, right now it's myself, I'm not sure what that will be like down the line, but you get my help or a coach's help who's built a six-figure store one-on-one -on -one help with you selecting your niche. So we, you essentially pick three to five that you think you like, you book a call with me and I help you. And I say, this is where I see the most opportunity. This is what I think makes the most sense. This is why, and we pick your niche together. So obviously your niche is the most important decision you're going to make at the beginning of your store. So you get one-on-one -on -one help with that. You have us actually, once you build out your supplier list, we look over that for you and make sure you're understanding everything when you're finding suppliers, that you're getting that right. You have our help setting up your business. Um, any questions you have about your jurisdiction or getting everything set up properly, we help you with that. We look over your demo store for you. So it's very much the same content from start to launching your business, but you're getting our help, our one-on-one -on -one help with you throughout the entire process. We're coaching you. We have calls on actually closing suppliers where you can role play with other group members and practice. We um, have like one-on-one -on -one help for you to set up your Shopify store. So the content is the same, but you're getting exact like one-on-one -on -one help throughout the whole process. But once you actually launch your store, there's far more content and advanced strategies on Google ads, conversion rate optimization, search engine optimization, email marketing, and more. And all this stuff is really, really required to help you scale your store significantly. And this is all very, very valuable, which is not in this free program. Like I said in the first video, the free program's goal is to get you from zero to making your first sale. So you don't really need a lot of this advanced stuff to make your first sale, but you would need it to really scale. So in the whole beginning part, you have our one-on-one -on -one help, picking your niche, building the demo store, closing suppliers, all this. Um, there is some more tips and stuff on that stuff that's not in this pay in the in the free one. But then the real extra stuff that is in the paid and not this is on all this kind of more advanced stuff as well as I also forgot. Um, there's a free traffic module. How to get free traffic to your store. So that's in terms of content. You have a one-on-one -on -one Slack channel with myself and all the other coaches to get instant responses all day, every day. So if you ever have questions about anything, you can write it in the Slack. You have our Slack group, which is essentially the community where people, there's different channels where the group can mastermind and answer questions together, much like you have here with the, the forum. But the forums probably, it's not as instant messaging like, it's more just like a forum that people check every so often. You have 10 hours of group coaching calls per week. You have access to our expert guest coaches on these specialized topics. Um, you have one-on-one -on -one help with me selecting your niche. You have one-on-one, -on -one, when you actually launch your ads, you get one-on-one -on -one help with your advertising um, structure with a coach one-on-one -on -one looking in your account, um, covering all the strategies in this, as well as the advanced strategies, making sure everything is set up properly. And you also get access to obviously a very active, motivated community, which I think is probably the biggest value driver just being a part of a whole bunch of other people who are taking it very seriously, who have paid to join the pay program and who are all very motivating, um, helping each other out. So, um, that's kind of the differences. I know I'll get asked this. So that's a brief summary of what they are. The paid is more of a mastermind program. This is a free course. So while some, there are some similarities for sure. Um, you get all this extra stuff when you join the pain program. And if that's something you're interested in throughout this course, there will be a link here that you can book a call. Uh, we're very selective about who we work with. We just want to make sure you meet certain criteria in terms of um, how much time you're going to dedicate to the store, what your goals are, everything like that. So if all that aligns, we discuss that with you on a call, um, then we can invite you to join. But in order to join, we ask that you book a call at this page here. And there's a questionnaire to fill out usually um, that will go over some questions with you. Just will help us qualify you to join the program. So if that's something you're interested in, this apply for coaching link will be throughout the program. But um, yeah, this video is just to discuss the main differences between the two. So I hope that clears that up. If you have any other questions, you can always send uh, a message to me directly in school. But that's all for this video. I'll see you in the next one. This is going to be on why high ticket e-com versus other types of e-commerce. Thank you for watching.
Welcome to everybody. Uh, my name is Brooke Hitting, and today we're going to be discussing the advantages of owning a business. Number one is tax reasons. So obviously, depending where you are, this is going to vary. But just to give you an example, um, in Canada, where I lived before I lived in Dubai, in Dubai, there's no tax, so it doesn't make a difference. But if I was to make, um, there's a tiered tax system in Canada. So any money you make up to 50,000, you get taxed at, I don't know, 10%, and then from 50 to 70, you get taxed higher, and then 70 to 90 higher, and so on. But any money you made over 100,000, you'd be taxed at 50%. So I think if it, I was gonna work at a law firm and I was gonna make 120,000 a year or something, I was gonna get taxed like 35,000 of that. Where in Canada, they have something for businesses where the first $500,000 net profit you make, you get taxed at 9%. So you could take 500,000 in the business, pay 9% tax on that. Um, and anything over that, I think it's 25% corporate tax, but you also get write-offs. So you pay tax. So if you're an employee of a business, you get your salary, you, you're taxed on your salary, and then you spend money to live your life. If you have a business, you write off a lot of your life, which means a write-off is essentially you spend money before paying tax on it. So when you pay the lower tax rate, you've actually already paid a lot of your expenses by that point. So let's say um, your laptop, your office expenses, your office groceries, your, I'm not gonna tell you like what you can write off, what you can't, but you can essentially write off a whole bunch of things which takes down your income before paying tax. And then you pay a smaller tax on the amount left after you cover all your expenses. So there's lots of tax reasons to do so. Obviously that's gonna vary depending upon where you are. So if you wanna speak to an accountant in your jurisdiction uh, about that, that would make sense. And the other thing is you're not trading your time for money. You're building an asset that has enterprise value and you can eventually have a liquidity event. So let's take two people, both making $100,000 per year. One is an employee, one owns a business. So the, per, the employee, when you're working a job, you're trading your time for money. So if you stop going to the job, you're gonna stop making money. Um, <clears throat> and a business is much different. So obviously you're building an asset. It's a thing that can generate you income outside of your time being traded for it. And the other thing is a liquidity event. So usually if you own a business, assuming you're out of the business, no one wants to buy a business that is a job. Like they don't wanna buy a business and then have to go do work in it. They wanna buy a business that's running itself. So assuming you've done that and you've created systems and you have a team of people managing the actual business, you can usually sell it. In this business model, you should about a three to four X multiple. The longer the business has been around and the more out of it you are, the higher multiple. So let's say you can get four and a half multiple. So if you're making $100,000 a year, you could sell that business for $450,000 right then and get a $450,000 check. Obviously the guy or girl working the $100,000 a year job cannot do that. So even though they're making the same thing, one is has a, an asset that they can sell and one, He's just trading the time for money. So that's the other piece of it. Um, obviously there's a huge fulfillment aspect when if you're doing the same thing, working for someone versus doing it in a business that you own, it's a completely different experience and mindset. So you get, you'll take, like I would do things in my business that no one could in the world could pay me to do, but it's just because I'm building the thing, I'm building an asset for myself. So it's much more, it's a different feeling. It's more fulfilling when you're building a thing for yourself. You obviously have freedom. So once you build it up, it's not gonna be right away where you can get out of your business, but when you get to the point where it's bringing in cash automatically for you, month over month without your involvement, you have freedom. You can go, especially like with this business, you can live anywhere in the world. You can go move, move to Dubai like I have, and it hasn't been any issue at all for the business. You can move to Thailand, you can move to Bali, you can move down south to South America. It doesn't matter, you can live anywhere you want. So you're very free. You have freedom over your time, and you have freedom over um, your location, where you are. And the other thing is transferable skills. So. This business model especially, it's very much like a hot, an online income MBA, the amount of skills you're gonna learn. You'll learn product market fit, product research, hiring, Google ads, Facebook ads, email marketing, conversion rate optimization, search engine optimization. There's so many skills that you will learn in this that will really turn you into a weapon of online income. So say you develop your store, you outsource it, and down the line you wanna start an agency or you wanna have a course. You can start a course for any one of those skills I just listed. You can start a course on that business model itself like I'm doing right now. You can start a Google Ads course, an SEO course. Obviously, you're gonna to have to become more of an expert in those areas, but you're gonna have the solid baseline skills that will allow you to then double down and become an expert in that area. You'll be very familiar with everything. And if you ever do start an agency, I actually experienced this myself. When you go offer your services, you're so much more valuable as a store because rather than knowing just one thing, like let's say if I know I'm a CRO, conversion rate optimization agency, um, 
I can go in and give my recommendations to someone, but if you, if you go into store, you can really see the whole picture. So you can be like, yes, I think here's an issue with CRO, but this thing in your Google Ads account will actually probably really help this as well. But you wouldn't have that broader perspective and holistic understanding unless you had owned a store and had all of those skills. So just having the broad skill set, it will really allow you to see the whole picture and become a much more trusted advisor should you ever do anything down the line. And it will be, you'll be able to see how all these different pieces of e-commerce relate to one another. And if you want to become an expert in one, offer your services or a course or an info product once you're actually out of this business, you certainly can. Not to mention you're building enterprise value. You can have a liquidity event and sell. Um, there's tax benefits. It's much more fulfilling. You have time, time, freedom of time and location. There's not really any reason to not own a business. Um, there's the advantages are just so much that um, I think you'd be crazy not to. Obviously, the specific advantages are going to vary depending on where you're from. But um, I hope that gives you a brief overview of some of the advantages of owning one and hope you see the value in it and um, take advantage of this free program and, and, and build one for yourself. It's one of the most, it's by far the most fulfilling thing I've ever done. So I recommend you do the same. And I'll see you in the next video where we will discuss how to use this group in school overall. Cheers, guys. Welcome to the video, everybody. This is going to be on business setup. So essentially, there's a few different situations. So if you're from the US and you're selling in the US, which you most likely are, you want to set up a US company. Um, I recommend doing that with the Zen business. Very easy to do so. If you're from Canada, you can have a Canadian company and you can sell in the US because there's a free trade agreement between Canada and the US where you will not be double taxed. If you're from other countries, if you're from Europe, for example, and you have a European company and you try and sell in the US, you'll be taxed in the US and taxed in Europe. So you'll be double taxed. Canada is an exception. So you can have a Canadian company and sell in the US. But otherwise, um, if you're not from the US or Canada and you want to sell in the US, you can create a company in the US. So if you're from New Zealand and you want to sell in the US, then it would make sense to file a US LLC with Zen Business as well. If you're not from um, Canada, the US, and you want to sell in your home country. So if you're from the UK and you want to sell in the UK, or from Australia, you want to sell in Australia, you'll create a company where you're from, obviously. So it varies to, uh, depending a little bit. If you are creating any US company, I recommend using Zen Business. If you're um, creating a Canadian company from, from, from Canada and going to sell in the US, I recommend using Lodipo. Um, just to discuss the difference between your DBA and your corporate name. So when you sell, file your corporation, I recommend making it something. Um, Make it something along the lines of like a numbered company, which is essentially just a bunch of numbers, LLC Inc. or something. Or you can do your initials or like, so for me, it would be BH Stores Inc. This is different than your store name. So this means you could have multiple stores. Your DBA is your doing business as. So you could have multiple doing business as names. Each store name would be a doing business as. In Canadian, uh, in US, some states require you need one, others don't. So let's say you're registered in Texas. Do you need a DBA in Texas. Just put in whatever state you are incorporated in. And I recommend incorporating in Delaware or Wyoming. I'm not from the US, so I don't know the specifics about this, but I know that these are non-tax states that most people file in for tax related reasons. I'm not sure specifics why. Um, I'm not from the US, again, I'm from Canada, so I don't know. But I recommend filing in either of those two states but wherever you do file, you need to see if you need a DBA in your state. So for Texas, you must file a DBA. So very easy to do so. You can just type in file DBA in Texas, um, and it will tell you exactly how to do it. It should be very, very simple. But you don't need to do this right away because you're not going to know your DBA until you pick your store name, which is in Module 4. So don't worry about that right now. Just be aware of it. I recommend um, getting a business phone number to separate your business and your personal life. So these are apps that go on your phone. You can give them access to your team, but you essentially can set business hours. You can separate your text, your calls into this app on your phone. Open phone is very good. Air calls a little bit more, um, more features like you can, you can essentially coach people. So if someone's on the phone, you can be talking to your team member who you're coaching while they talk to the customer and the customer can't hear you. Um, there's call recordings, there's analytics dashboards. So you can see like what percentage of calls were picked up during business hours. Um, how many times the phone rang before, or how long the phone rang before it was picked up. All sorts of different features in AirCall. 
Um, so I'd recommend open phone to start, but maybe down the line you want to switch to air call. So business banking and credit cards, again, you want to separate your personal and your business life. I really recommend using WISE. Um, even if you're not from the U.S., you can get a U.S. bank account for your company. Um, whether you have a U.S. company or a Canadian company, wherever it is, you can usually get a WISE bank account. You can use brick and mortar, but for most part, it's a lot longer payouts when you're receiving your money from Shopify. Uh, WISE is very quick and they have very low exchange fees if you're switching money between different currencies. So I recommend WISE, but you're going to need a business bank account. You can use whatever you want. My recommendation would be WISE. Credit cards, if you're in the US, Capital One, Chase, and Amex are all great options. If you get Amex, get gold for ads and platinum for orders. So gold for ads, you'll get 4% of any money you spend on Google and Facebook ads back. Platinum, um, is good for travel points and things like that. Canada, so if you have a Canadian business and you're selling in the US, you want a card that has zero Forex fees. So Scotiabank Visa Infinite and RBC Royal Gold are both good options. Amex um, is good to have as a backup, but you will pay Forex on Amex until you hit 2 million revenue, at which point they will give you a US card. Applying for an EIN, this is an employer identification number. So most suppliers that when you contact them, they'll require you to have an EIN. So how to apply if you are in the US. So if you have a US company and you're living in the US, you can just do it at this link. Um, if you are international, so you have a Canadian company or a European company for some reason, and you're selling in the US, you do it at this link here. I'm not sure why this says Google, let's see. Okay, yeah, that's the one you need. Resale certificate. So Essentially, this means you have to charge tax in sales tax in a state. So income tax is tax that the business is making on its income or you are making on your personal income. Sales tax is what you're charging the customer. There's two situations where you have to charge sales tax, economic nexus and physical nexus. So physical nexus means you live in a state. So if you live in a certain state and your business is headquartered there, then you will have to charge sales tax in that state. Um, if you're from Canada, like me, I do not have any physical nexus in the US. So the only situation where I'll be required to charge sales tax is if I have an economic nexus. For most states, that is $100,000 in sales in the preceding 12 months, but it really varies by state. Some of them are higher, um, but usually it's $100,000 in the previous 12 months. And once you hit that, you have to register for sales tax in that state and then collect sales tax from your customers. I recommend reading this article from TaxChart. I'm not a tax expert, none of this is tax or legal advice, but I recommend reading this. It'll go a little bit more in depth on these concepts for you. And um, most suppliers will actually ask for a resale certificate, but there's something called a uniform resale certificate where if you sign up in one state, it will work for like 40 of the 50 or something like that. So I recommend signing up in one, one of the, if you are gonna sign up, make sure you sign in one of the ones that's a uniform resale certificate state. Um, and it will work for all the states. And I think it will discuss that in this article. And you can give the same resale certificate for all your suppliers, no matter where they are, um, with a few exceptions. But um, yeah, every person's gonna be different depending on where they're from, where their company is incorporated and everything like that. I'm not a tax advisor, but generally speaking, these are the things that you need. I hope that's helpful. Um, so just to review, we wanna incorporate a business, send business, Law Depot are good options. You wanna get, um, Register your DBA once you pick your store name, which you won't have done yet. Get a business phone number. Um, get your business banking and credit card set up. Recommend WISE. Get a credit card. Here's some recommendations. Get your EIN. And ideally, get a resale certificate for your business. So those are the action steps in step one. Um, that's all for this video. Next video, we're going to discuss some cash flow and profit first accounting, at which point we'll wrap up part one. But that's all for now. Thank you for watching. And I'll see you in the next videos. Welcome to this video. So just gonna go through a few different things on tracking cash flow, um, your profit and loss statement, uh, your cadence for tracking, and cash flow management to scale. So um, it's gonna be best that I actually go in and, and show you a few examples live. So I have this sheet here, which I'm going to link below the video. So this is your, your P&L essentially. It has all your expenses categorized. Um, it has your orders, it has your expenses, um, listed accounts, whatever else. So I'll link this below. And 
I guess first is when you get orders, they can come here. So let's say order 1000 comes in today from supplier XYZ, customer Bill Smith for $6,000, costs you 3000, shipping's 500, merchant fee is probably usually about 2%. And invoice status just means have you paid your supplier for it? So 39% margin. Um, and then what this does when you put this in, once you've paid the invoice, I would recommend hyperlinking. You'll create a Google Drive separately. And in your Google Drive, you'll have folders for each month. And then you will put your invoices in that folder and hyperlink it to this column. So you have an easy way to track them all. Um, and then that also goes right to your PL. So let's hook that up so you have your revenue. And then you have any marketing dollars you spend here, your website and tech, travels, meals, other expenses. So, what I would recommend you do is in this one, this is just an example as a, a website that you might have bought. Um, and I would link, I would put in the amount who the merchant was. So, this is where I bought the website theme, the date, the expense type. So, it's for my website, marketing, travel, and then sub expense categorize it and then put also in your Google Drive a separate a separate folder for like receipts. Uh, so you have your order receipts and then you'll just have um, the all the other ones and you'll have it categorized by month. You can subcategorize it into these areas if you want to. It doesn't really matter. And then you'll link the receipt here. What I'll also recommend you have a list of your accounts um, here. So your bank account, your credit card, whatever else, just for easy access. Um, and then over time, like say we spent $1,000 in Google ads, 500 in Facebook ads. And then this is actually filtering in to our P&L for us once we categorize them. Facebook, and then we see they should be pulled right here. So then this is our profit after cost of sold and shipping. And then we probably have not spent this much on ads to only make this much in sales, but let's say we made a second sale of the exact same. Then our P&L looks like this. Then we'd have to pay our team, freelancers, um, anyone else would go, what would they do? Looks like I forgot to put them. So you'd actually just put like uh, a category for employees or something like that. But this is just the general template you can use. I'll edit it in after the video. Um, but that's the idea on the template, you're tracking cash flow. So what I want you to realize is, let's say this month we spent $1,500 in ads and we made 12,000 in sales. Like that's somewhat accurate of like what would actually occur or what your goal should be to occur. So now after the month, we have 27,000 or 22,775 remaining. So if we spend the exact same amount on ads again next month, our sales are not going to go up. So if you took 1500 out of this, this is your amount remaining at the end of the month. If you take 1500 out of this for yourself, your own personal use, and then put 1200 back into the business, your sales are not going to grow. So what you need to do to scale is you need to leave money in the business and reinvest your profit into more ads. So now, instead of spending instead of spending fifteen hundred on ads, next month let's say if we spent um, two thousand two hundred of this, then we could make more than twelve thousand in sales, and then this number would be invested again. Then we take more and put it into ads again, and that's how we would scale the business. So just be like if you have if you spend thousand dollars in ads and make ten thousand in sales. You have 2,500 left over, 
if you take 1500 out of that and then just spend the exact same amount on ads as you did last month, your sales aren't going to go up. So you need to reinvest your profits into more ads to grow the business over time. And the more aggressively you do that, the quicker you will grow with the caveat that you need to make sure that your ROAS, your return on ad spend, in other words, every dollar you spend on ads, how many are you getting back in sales? And more importantly, POAS, how much profit are you getting back in sales for every dollar you spend on ads? Needs to be staying consistent. Because hypothetically, like I could spend $5 million on ads this month, but if I'm only making $10 million in sales, then I'm losing money. So you need to maintain a strong ROAS, which is very important, but we'll cover that later in the advertising lesson. But just for the purposes of this cash flow lesson video, you need to reinvest what you're profiting into more ads so your business can grow over time. If you just take out the money that is in excess of what you spent on ads and you spend the same amount on ads, your business will not grow, especially early on when you're reliant upon pay traffic. Um, so cadence for tracking, I would recommend you go add in I would recommend you do this weekly, like just go through your bank accounts, look at your expenses, categorize them weekly, and maybe monthly, either you or if you have a VA, you can get them to actually go in and link all your receipts to your sheet for you, um, and always have them do the order invoices as well. Um, just stay on top of it, but don't spend like, your time is higher value on other things, but it's very, very important to be organized, <clears throat> and this will make your life very, very easy when it comes time to file your taxes or whatever. So just stay on top of it, but don't spend um, a ton of time stressing over this or anything like that. It's just good to stay organized. Um, yeah, so we covered this, covered pretty much everything here, I think. So um, just have this in mind from the beginning, make the template, hook up uh, your accounts to here so you have easy access to them. Um, anything that you've spent on like your incorporation, setting up your business, that can all be here. So corp corporation would be legal. Um, if you bought like a Shopify website theme, it would be website. So any expenses you have, make sure you're putting them here, categorizing them so you can, you can write them off. But that's all for this video. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Welcome to this video, everyone. <clears throat> so this video is going to be on a concept called Profit First. So I recommend you get this book. Uh, it's called Profit First by this name I'm not going to try and pronounce um, and I'll also link a couple YouTube videos below that explain the concept but we're just gonna go over it at a very high level here so on traditional it's it's a it's essentially it's accounting it's an accounting method that will help you run your business effectively um, from a mindset perspective as you scale so on most accounting statements it's sales minus expenses equals profit and as you'll find out when you're running a business, there's endless things that you can spend money on. There's agencies, there's consultants, there's softwares, there's team members, there's apps, there's endless, endless things that you can spend money on. So sales minus expenses equals profit. So usually there's very little of this left after you spend everything you want. The way that Profit First recommends is you pick your profit first. So let's say for sim simplicity's sake, Let's say you make $100 and you determine based upon your margins and what you're spending on ads that you are going to take $7 profit. So what you would then do is it's a flip in your mind. So if you have $100 and you make 25% net, so you have $25 profit and you have $25 after all your costs, landed, like shipping, cost of goods sold kind of thing. So $25, like for this, accounting methodology with products, your profit is, your, your sales are considered your, your revenue after your cost of goods sold and shipping. So you get $100, you pay uh, 75 in shipping and for the customer and for the product, you have 25. So that is the 25 sales here. Um, then you decide how much of that you want to keep as profit. So let's say you want seven. Then your expenses then you have $18 to spend on whatever you want. Grow your business, you can take a trip, you can do whatever you want with these expenses to farther grow your business. But your profit is already taken out and accounted for. So rather than having your sales, spending all this money on endless things that you may or may not need, and then you have this left over, 
It's instead picking your sales, deciding what you want to have as your profit, and then having this to further grow your business the next month. So the more, the bigger you make this number and the smaller you make this number, the quicker you can grow your business when you reinvest it. But this is already accounted for. So you've already made this decision consciously and decided exactly what you want. And then you put it away and you have this to spend to grow your business, which is opposite of this, where you just spend, 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 and then, oh, this is what you got left over. So it's a much better way of thinking. I recommend you read the full book. He gives you the whole process on exactly how to do it. But at a high level, what happens is every time money comes in your business, you have five bank accounts. And you can do this at your bank or on WISE. You can use something called JARS, which are, there's one parent bank account, and then there's like all these different sub accounts you can create underneath it. You can create as many of them as you want with different names like right away, like no delay. You don't have to go in, you can just do it yourself. Um, I know there's one called Airwallex that does something similar, but it's actually automated. So what you want to do is you want to have percentages for each of these accounts that you are going, every dollar that comes in your business is going to go at a specific percentage into each one of these accounts. So again, for profit first with products, sales is our cost, is our sales is after our cost of goods sold and shipping is accounted for. So it's after those. So in our $100 example, say we have 25. Um, let's say we wanna have 20% of our sales go to income. So this is net profit. Income is like income for the business. <laughs> Owner's compensation, what you wanna make. Operating expenses, so paying your team, whatever else. This would be like reinvesting into the business. What you wanna reinvest. Profit is what you're actually putting away. So you're gonna have three checking accounts and two savings accounts. So anything that you owe in tax will go in a savings account. Anything that you want to keep and you set aside as profit for your business will go into a savings account. So then you can't touch it. Like it shouldn't even be on your screen. It's just, as soon as, let's just say we had, just to make this simple, if we had $25 after our costs, let's just say we do 20% for each. So $5, 20% of 25 is $5. So we'd have, Five dollars in our income that we can reinvest the next month. We'd have five dollars for owner's compensation. We'd have five dollars in this account for operating expenses to pay our team. So you need to figure out what you actually need to do this, what you need to, to make to live, what you want to live if you're working, if you're doing this full time, it's gonna be different. You should be adjusting every month. What does your team cost you? What does your softwares cost you? What percentage do you have to put away for that? And then what do you what are you gonna put away for your profit? So five and five, the tax would be less than five. But the goal is you wanna have these percentages determined in advance and you, when money comes into your business, you just put them in these accounts automatically without thinking. And then you don't run into the problem where you, you're spending on things you shouldn't be spending on and it forces you to prioritize. So if you want to grow your business and you've already determined that you wanna have this much profit, when you put the profit away, then you have this much expenses left to grow your business. And then maybe you have 10 things you think you could spend money on to grow your business. You're forced to pick the three or four that you can afford that you think are gonna move the needle the most. Um, so you're forced to prioritize while prioritizing your profit, which is very, very important. So like I said, I recommend you read the book by this guy. Um, I've, I'll link some YouTube videos below that you can look into more depth. But um, this video and the last videos, the P&L and tracking cash flow combined with this, if you do those two things right, it will save you a ton of headaches and more importantly, it'll save you a ton of money as you grow your business. So just make sure you watch those, you understand them and um, keep them in mind as you grow, as you scale, it's, uh, it's very important. But thank you for watching. Um, I will see you in the next module. Welcome to Spare everybody. So this is um, action task checklist for module one. We're gonna have these action task videos at the end of each one. So for here, incorporate your business, get a business phone number, business banking setup, credit card, obtain the IN. Um, and you can, obviously you're not just going to apply to all these things that are going to be done in one day. So if you at least get everything moving before you get onto module two, you can put pending and then update it as you go. And we're obviously going to have different, uh, sheets for each module, but this is the last one. So obviously, um, some of you aren't, if you're not familiar, you can just make a copy and it will just duplicate the sheet for you. Um, so I recommend doing that by the time you're watching, there should be all the module sheets here. So don't worry about it. If they're not in this video. When you duplicate it, they'll be there. And then just track the action items. So definitely want to have your business incorporated, business phone number, 
business banking, credit card, EIN, resale certificate. And once you actually decide on your store name and module four, make sure you go and register your DBA. I've just put it in this section just because it is related to the business setup aspect, but obviously we don't know what the store is yet. So um, it will be difficult to do for now, but that's all for this video. Just get those action tasks done, at least get everything moving and in progress so you can update everything to at least pending and make sure you do that. And then we will move on to module two, which is going to be selecting your niche. So get everything moving here, everything in progress. Once that's done, move on to part two, which is niche selection. So looking forward to see you guys in part two. Um, if you have any questions about anything, um, obviously I'm not a tax advisor, so I can't give you definite answers, but if you guys want to network as a community, please feel free to do so and create discussion topics so you can really help each other out through a lot of the business setup stuff, because even in my paid program, everyone's very helpful to each other. And um, once kind of a few people get set up properly, if you share the knowledge, it will make everyone's life easier. And um, obviously to be a part of the community, we want you to give back value. Um, that's why I'm giving you guys lots of free value. So I please ask that you pass that along to other members in the group. If you know how to do something and you see someone asking, that's all for this video guys. Um, thank you for watching and we'll see you in part two on niche selection. Welcome this for everybody. So this is going to be on part two, niche selection, and video one is on broad store versus niche store. So just go over the differences. What is a broad store and what is a niche store? So broad store is a higher level category. You can vary in how broad it actually is. So you can have an extremely broad store. So a home store, for example, let's say like this. Um, not sure why the link's not working. There, this is a broad store. You can see they have literally everything, structures, vanities, tubs, everything. So that's a broad store, extremely broad. Then you can have a fitness store. So let's say, so this is fitness. Fitness is still very broad, but it's more narrow than home, obviously, because fitness could be within a home store, but there's still tons of different products here, uh, very broad. So these are broad stores. A niche store is usually one store, um, it, one product or related products, quite narrow. So if you think of something like, this, northernsaunas.com. They sell specifically saunas. These are all hot ticket dropshipping stores as well. I'll just put these as examples. So just to give you a difference, like uh, an idea of the difference. Broad stores, they can be um, extremely broad, home, a little bit broad like fitness, or let's say like backyard is, is a little bit more narrow than home, but still very broad. You can have niche stores like northern saunas or um, like this. So they're selling e-bikes, but literally just for hunters. So very, very narrow. Um, and just go over the advantages and disadvantages of each. So the advantages of a broad store is it's endless suppliers to contact. You have hundreds of different categories, so you can literally just keep adding more and more suppliers. Um, you can pivot very easily. So let's say you're starting in um, sauna, or saunas and it doesn't work, you can go into massage chairs because your your niche is such high a high level. You can add hundreds of categories. If one's not working, it's very easy, easy to pivot. It can be conducive to faster results because in the beginning when you have no traffic, you're reliant upon ads. So it, essentially, if you just close, go ham and go upload 100 suppliers to your website and run ads properly to them, you're gonna see results. That's not easy. Like it might sound, you, you might think, oh yeah, I'll just go out 100 suppliers. It's a lot of work to close them. It's a lot of work to get them on the website. But you can get results very fast doing that. You have a higher chance of success. This is worded incorrectly. So you have a higher chance of success on the one store. So with a new store, you can have the same chance of success. You just might have to try uh, two or three stores to see success. Where this, it's so broad, you're virtually guaranteed to succeed on your first store, assuming you just keep putting the work in. You can specialize as you go and niche down. So let's say if you start with um, a fitness store, but then saunas take off, or you can double down and really make your store themed around sauna. So you can become, you can specialize as you go. The disadvantages are it's a lower conversion rate usually. So um, if you think of someone going to a home store, they can be there for anything. If someone's going to a sauna store, they're probably there to buy a sauna. So it's you're gonna have a higher conversion rate on um, a niche store than a home store because you don't really know exactly what they're even there for. It's such a broad uh, array of products. It's difficult to rank for SEO. So Google wants to rank specialists in SEO. So to give you an example of this, um, I found this website 
last week. It's pretty crazy. So if we look up the keyword power waxer, you can see there's 496,000 searches per month. And if we click the search engine results page, you can see this website has a domain rating. So domain rating is how powerful a website is on a scale of zero to 100. You can see Amazon is a 96 and it's in spot two. But this website is with a zero. And for those of you who don't know this, like this is absurd, the fact that this one's number one. They're getting 186,000 free visitors per month. And it's because they specialize in the exact thing. The keyword is PowerWaxer, the websites that are called PowerWaxer.com. So they're an expert in the one thing. So the more broad you are, the less likely this is to happen. If you're Ambient Home USA, no one's just searching home products. It's too broad, like way too broad. So this is gonna, if you sold saunas and your store was saunas.com, you're always gonna rank above a home store. So it's difficult to rank for SEO. And SEO is really the bread and butter of e-com in the long term. So if you say, let's say you have 30% margin, and let's say you have to spend 10 to 15% of that ads to acquire the customer, your net profit will be 10 to 15, because you're giving some, or it will be 15 to 20, because you're giving some away to acquire the customer. SEO is when you make that same sale for free. So you would keep the whole 30%. So the goal of any e-com store should be less and less paid ads over time while you build up your SEO. It is a longer term gain. You're not gonna see SEO results for six to 12 months after you start. Um, broad store is more administratively complex because you can have hundreds of suppliers. We're on like a, a niche store like Northern Saunas. There's probably only like 10 to 15 sauna suppliers. So a lot more complex to manage all the supplier relationships. More difficult to have a brand. Like you can't really have a brand around home products. You can have a brand around saunas though. You can have a brand around hunting for e-bike or e-bikes for hunters. It's more uh, difficult to have a brand the drawer or the broader you are. And as we discussed before, usually a little bit lower profit margins because you're very reliant upon ads. And not that you can't rank SEO on a broad store, it's just gonna take longer to do so because you, <clears throat> you really have to have a really powerful website to rank broad. So you have to, um, and, and you can do things to help this. Like you, even though you have a broad store, you're listing ads for a whole bunch of different product types, you can do all of your blogs and all of your SEO work on one product type to really make it seem to Google like you're a specialist in that one area. And that can help you, but you're still not gonna be as strong as a very niche store that's only selling one thing. So just the counterpoints. Niche store, it's easier to rank for SEO. You have a higher conversion rate because people, if you're selling a product type XYZ and people are only on your site to buy it, you're gonna have a higher conversion rate. There's higher profit margins in the long run because we have ability to rank SEO. Administratively easier because you have less suppliers, but, um, <clears throat> and you can have stronger branding. The downside of this is you have a limited list of suppliers, so it's very hard to pivot if it's not working. Uh, you may need to pivot and start from scratch, where here you can just keep adding new suppliers in different categories because your store is so broad. Longer time period to see results because you can't just upload 100 suppliers and run ads to them because there's usually a limited supplier list. And um, you're kind of banking on SEO working in the long run where uh, this you can just run a whole bunch of paid ads right away. So key points, um, I recommend you try and find a happy medium. This is not black or white. So you can do things like fire pits direct. So you think fire pits direct, they're selling one thing, fire pits. This store does great SEO, but they also sell patio furniture, heaters. So they have a fire pits direct as their brand name, but they're selling all sorts of other stuff. So they have a number of product types. So you kind of get the best of both worlds. You have a whole bunch of suppliers. You still have the strong SEO and branding for fire pits. Um, this recovery for athletes. So they're like a fitness store for athletes. It's a little bit broader than fire pits direct, but same thing. They're really specializing in, um, rather than specializing in a product type, they're specializing, uh, specializing in a customer avatar. So rather than selling just fitness stuff or sports equipment, they're selling sports equipment for athletes. So that's their branding. Um, Mobility Paradise. So this is another good example. Um, they're selling essentially elderly care products, but they're really focusing on mobility scooters. So again, very strong branding, much like Fire Pits Direct. So they're very strong SEO, but they still have a whole bunch of product types. They even have solar kits. Like this is literally not even related to, the, to their store, but they, they're specializing in something which is gonna help them for SEO. But they still have a whole bunch of product types that they can add and run ads to. So they kind of have the best of both worlds. So go through these advantages and disadvantages and consider what aligns with your goals. What um, are you willing to really put the work in and have a strong brand? Or do you just wanna upload a whole bunch of brands and get sales as quickly as possible, but probably have a, like these 
disadvantages in the long run. Really assess both. I recommend trying to find a happy medium between both. Um, and yeah, so that's just kind of the differences between broad and niche. I really recommend finding kind of the, the medium so you can kind of get the best of both worlds. But um, and just last point is how to get around competition. So if you're in a very competitive area, let's say grills or massage chairs, you can niche down uh, one of two ways. So by avatar is by person. So rather fitness is a very competitive area, but they've got around this by selling uh, fitness stuff for athletes because fitness is very competitive. So they've specialized by avatars. So you could sell fitness stuff for old people, fitness stuff for um, who, cardio fitness stuff, people interested in cardio. Or alternatively, you can niche down by product. So rather than selling fitness stuff, you could sell just treadmills and you would get around competition because you're just an expert in that one subset of fitness. So that's kind of the ways to get around competition. Keep that in mind. Um, but yeah, I really recommend trying to find a happy medium between the broad and niche and understanding the advantages and disadvantages of each and really using those to your um, benefit in building a successful store. That's all for this video, guys. I'll see you in the next one, which is going to be on how to use uh, the product list I've given you. Hey, everyone. Welcome to this video. This is going to be on how to use the product list. So in the course, there's a 500 product ideas for 2023 right here. Um, don't use this as the be all end all, but use it as like a research tool. So let's say you're considering doing a niche store. You could pick a single product and really double down on it. And I recommend if you're doing a niche product to, to check the um, you can use Ahrefs or SEMrush, but essentially you could tr try to do um, some some product research on it. So let's say you're selling, um, I don't know, Hoyer Lift or something. You could go to Ahrefs and type in the keyword Hoyer Lift, and you can check the volume. And we're going to get into that in a minute, but you can set how difficult it is. What you want to find is this should be below 20, ideally, if you're doing a niche store. And you want to see domain ratings with low ranking first. So this one, the first one is 16, which is good. Um, you can see 23. There's some other, obviously Amazon's super competitive, but you can see some listing low there. And what you can do is let's say you want to sell solar stuff. You can use this. So you, like, say you got an idea here, um, telescopes. Let's say I want to sell telescopes. You can go to ChatGPT and ask, hey, I am starting a high e -com store. One of my products is going to be telescopes. Can you tell me other product types over $1,000? Tell me 10 other products that would fit on my store. Drones, oh, no, 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 it's not understanding. Binoculars, like, I don't even know what this is, but here are a bunch of awesome products that you could then add to your store on telescopes. And that could be a niche store somewhat. It would be somewhat niche. It could be right in the middle of broad and niche if you started adding a whole bunch of other product types. But um, that's how you can use ChatGPT for research help is kind of use this sheet to get ideas, but then use ChatGPT, um, your imagination to really round out your list of product types um, as you go. That's how to use it. Uh, if you're extremely broad, you could have hundreds of different products on your store. Um, you could have um, related products together. Uh, if you have a niche store, you could pick a single product or you could ask ChatGPT for other products. So let's say you wanted to do a niche store on telescopes. This would be kind of all stuff that would fit on your telescope store, even at the very niche store. So there's not like a right or wrong, have like um, a flexible mindset with this. There's not like a perfect way to do this, but just think of it for the list more for ideas and then use ChatGPT and, um, and to kind of help you round out your list of product types on your store rather than just being like a, a be all end all. I hope that helps. And next we will actually start filling out your research sheet. So that's all for this video. I'll see you in the next one. Welcome to this video, everybody. So step number one is on the price point module, there's going to be a product research template. So it's going to look like this. 
Go in here, make a copy for yourself. Um, just gonna do that now. Go in there, make a copy for yourself, um, and then we're gonna do the research here. So, first thing we're going to be discussing is the price point. So, um, when you're thinking of different product ideas, um, as you go through, you've you've been using this to get ideas. So, for me, in throughout this course, I'm gonna be doing an example store on solar. So. I recommend you pick a few different ones and do a few different store ideas so you can kind of compare and contrast them against one another. But mine, I'm gonna be doing solar store in in this uh, program. So I'd recommend doing a few. Um, you could do some very high level broad niche, broad stores and then a couple niche stores and just compare um, both as you're going through it and kind of like go with your gut. I really recommend you go with your gut. So. For mine, I'm gonna do solar. So the first thing we wanna check is price point. Um, we want products to have a price point over $1,000. So on a broad store, I recommend getting at least 10 products that have over a $1,000 price point on your list. For niche store, if you have two, that should be sufficient. If some are under, uh, it's not like if a product's under, just leave it off the list. Like add all products that are over a few hundred dollars. Um, but we want to meet these targets depending on what type of store you're going for. So mine's solar, um, solar kit, and honestly, I would just use Chappie GPT. So you just get a comprehensive list, as many as you can. And then what you wanna do is you wanna put your VPN on where you're selling. So for this store example, I'm gonna be acting like I'm selling in the US. And then you wanna put your VPN on for there. So then you wanna type in the product type. It's not working yet. And what we want to do is just to make sure that there's a large contingent of product types over a thousand dollars. So you can see here, this will give you a good range of the prices. And we can see the majority of them are over a thousand. Like, for example, if I type in chair, the majority are here. Sure, you might be able to find a chair that costs over a thousand, but for the most part, it's it's below. So here, we just want to see for the most part, like what do these go for, and if. It's above, put yes. I'll actually add uh, um, an option to the drop down. So you can probably put something like maybe. So overall, we just want to verify like what did these go for? Is it over a thousand dollars? Just go through and do each.
And again, just depending on what type of store you're doing. So I would say a solar store is a niche, so I'd only really need two products to make it work. But obviously I've got a whole bunch here and I even add more that I didn't add. But um, yeah, you just wanna get at least these, make sure that there's a large, sure, like you might be able to find a solar battery for under $1,000, but there's a large contingent of them for over. So as long as you're seeing like well over $1,000 here, you can put yes and just get as many as you can that meet, reach that price point. So solar charge controller. No, oh, so this one looks like it's actually low. So I'd put no. So I'm not gonna do them all, but you get the idea. To me, like these are all pretty obviously over. So that's it for price point. Um, again, just wanna make sure you have a large contingent of products over $1,000, 10 plus if you're doing a broad store, high level niche store. If you're doing like a one product, very, very extremely narrow niche store, to have at least two. That's all for this video, guys. I'll see you in the next one, which is going to be on assessing product demand. This video is going to be on assessing product demand. So on a broad store, we wanna have at least 10 products with over 5,000 monthly searches. And on a niche store, we wanna have at least one product with over 3,000 monthly searches. I recommend using a keyword tool. Ahrefs is the best one, but there is no free trial. SEMrush is good, has free trial. Moz, free trial and Uber suggest free trial. So I recommend using one of the last three if you're looking to save money. But if you are ever gonna pay for one, I recommend paying for Ahrefs as it's the best. So what you wanna do is you wanna get your list of product types and you want to see the search volume for them. So solar kit. And you just want to pick up the highest search one that you can find related to the, the search term. So solar panel kit, so 3.6K. So even though it's not solar kit exactly, it's related to the same thing. So 3,600. Solar panel. Forty-five thousand. Solar battery. Twelve thousand solar charge controller.
So do that. Um, again, keep these in mind, these numbers here. My store is kind of a little bit niche, so I really only need, like you could have an, the thing is there's, you have to think of this stuff on a spectrum. Like I could literally have a store called solarwaterheaters.com and that was all I sold. And I would have sufficient search volume to do that based on this and this. So you could have solar water heaters and then you have like one or two products over $1,000 and you're extremely niche. So think of niche versus broad on a spectrum. Solar is still quite niche, but um, have a whole bunch of different product types over $1,000 as well as a bunch over demand. But just get a good idea of the demand of your products and do not think demand, don't think more demand equals better. So if I type in barbecue, I'm sure there's like 800,000 searches, but you have to think of not demand, but demand divided by, divided by competition. So yeah, 711,000 searches for barbecue, but there's so many stores selling this at such a competitive space that 711,000 divided by all the competition, there's not a lot of opportunity. Where if you take something like solar kits, even though demand's lower, there's barely any competition in this area right now. So I would far rather start a store here than something that's so competitive. So think, don't think of, oh, my demand's low. I don't have a chance. Think of it as like, it, it's far better to have low demand without competition than a ton of demand in an extremely saturated competitive niche. So don't think more demand equals better. You have to think of it demand divided by the competition and the competitiveness of that space overall to get a sense of the opportunity there. But that's all for this video. Um, I'll see you in the next one, which is going to be on analyzing your competition. Welcome to this video, everybody. This is going to be on analyzing competition. So what I want you to do is go back, essentially just do the same things before, except we're gonna be looking at a different column. We're gonna be looking at this. So solar kit. We also wanna be looking at the other column as well. So solar kit, click the keyword that you find. You can see the difficulty is 44. And just as a guide, um, here's a good guide on keyword difficulty. And we also want to check seasonality. So you can see here, there's not really any trend of always up and down. It looks to be pretty consistent. Um, looks to be peaking in the summer. But there's not really any consistency. And just to show you what, this would be very consistent. Like we could figure out what months every year that's peaking, but here it's not, not really clear. So just put NA for peak months, solar panel, looks to be peaking in the summer. So from like, hmm. again, not really a clear trend. So it looks to be maybe peaking April till September, April till September, yeah. Let's go through and do that for all of them. Um, obviously the more keywords that are in this, these higher brackets, the more competitive the niche is. Um, and obviously if you're trying to build a store that's replacing an income, you don't want it to be extremely seasonal. So obviously like if there's a little bit of seasonality, like even saunas, you can see like there's some seasonality at peaks during the winter, but it's really not that bad. But if you're selling, doing like a fireplace only store, you're going to have huge swings in sales, which probably isn't ideal for someone looking to replace an income. So just keep that in mind. Think of it on a spectrum. A little bit of seasonality is fine, but if it looks like absolutely huge differences, then probably not ideal, especially if you're looking to replace a job. If you already have a business and you're just looking to build an asset and you don't really care about the income swings per month, then it's fine to do, but just something to keep in mind. Go through, do that for all of them. Um, here's a general guide on the competition and just have your peak months for, uh, for seasonality. Um, just so you're aware of it.
But that's all for this video. I'll see you in the next one, which is going to be on assessing your uniqueness of your products. Welcome to the video, everyone. This is going to be on assessing uniqueness. So this is a bit of an intuitive test. There's not a clear black and white answer. Just ask yourself, is this something that would be readily available at Home Depot, Wayfair, and Walmart? Examples of some not unique items, fitness stuff, saunas, furniture, unique stuff would be like blood glucose monitor, body composition machine, baseball pitching machine, just to provide you some examples. Just ask yourself, like, um, it probably will have some sort of correlation to the keyword difficulty. I'm sure if I type in blood glucose monitor on here, it's not going to be very competitive. Oh, it is very competitive, but it's still a unique product type. I would say like not, that's not going to be available anywhere and everywhere, but to provide you an example, like Hoyer lift, it's like an old age product, not difficult, um, but also very unique. So just kind of have an intuitive gut feeling test about the product. For me, uh, solar kits, somewhat unique, not extremely unique, same with solar panels, batteries, um, but some of this other stuff like solar pool heaters, solar air conditioners, um, solar inverters, like all these are a little bit unique, more unique. Um, again, it's not like a clear black or white wine. If you're doing a niche store, this will be more important for you. So if you're doing, um, if you're doing a niche store, you don't want to do something that's super competitive. If you are doing a niche store, you want it to be, um, at least because if you're only selling one product, you don't want that product to be super competitive. Have something a little bit more unique for sure. But if you're selling a broad store and you could have hundreds of product types, it doesn't really matter if some of them are competitive because like there's just so many products, so many suppliers, you're going to find success at some point just by sheer volume. But if you're really limited in your niche and you're only selling like one product type, um, I would recommend being a little bit more careful in doing something more unique to avoid competition if you only really have that one product type and you're a little bit limited but just something to think about. Um, also ask yourself about brand loyalty. So brand loyalty is like when I think of a phone, I think of Apple and I think of Android. Um, when I think of uh, Asana, I don't really think of a brand. When I think of a gazebo, I don't think of a brand. When I think of farm stuff, I think uh, tractors, I think of John Deere. When I think of um, headphones, I think of Bose. So just ask yourself, is there brand loyalty? Um, obviously I need to put a no column in here, but you want to pick stuff that um, is not brand loyal. So you don't want to be, just going to fix this quickly. So actually no is good. So that's in your template. Sorry, just one sec. So fill that in. Um, I don't really think of any brands when I think of solar, to be honest with you. But if all of them were yes, then that would be concerning. But again, think of it on a spectrum. You just don't want to be selling super brand loyal stuff. But for example, with grills, Napoleon is a grill for fitness, like Bowflex and Rogue are, are uh, brands, but there's still so many, it's such a broad space that there's many other brands that aren't brand loyal that you can still do very well in those niches, but just stay away from like super, super, um, kind of like monopolized industries overall. So put all that out. Um, and that's all for this video. Next up, we will be looking at finalizing your niche. Welcome to this video, everybody. This is going to be the final one of part two. So just to review, we've considered broad versus narrow niches, $1,000 price point, product demand, competition, and uniqueness. So you should have your sheet filled out here. I recommend doing this for three to five. You can do all broad stores, all narrow stores, or a mix of broad and narrow. Once you're done, I recommend you adding, you add the niche to your master sheet. So for solar, I would put solar niche. Um, overall, there's, these are not just yes or no uh, specific answers, just like overall, did it meet the criteria that we discussed in the video? So was there um, a thousand, 10 products over $1,000? And if it was yes, then you can put in the master sheet, yes. Did the demand meet the criteria outlined in this section? If yes, just put yes. Number of sub products, um, whatever it is. So I think I found 10, but there's probably much more. I don't know why, just delete these. And is it sufficiently unique? Yes. So go through, add the three to five, so then you can easily compare them against each other and get a sense of how they, the advantages and disadvantages 
of each. Um, obviously, in the paid coaching program, you hop on a one-on-one -on -one call with me, one-on-one -on -one call with your student success coach, and we actually help you. We walk through this with you, and I tell you where I see the most opportunity and help you actually choose this. So if you're interested in paid coaching, the link's here. But um, in the free program, obviously, you're going to need to decide this on your own. So um, consider all these factors that we discussed in the video. Um, in your action task checklist for part two is going to be consider broad versus niche store in video one, consider the advantages and disadvantages of each, come up with three to five niche ideas, um, consider the niche ideas against each other in your master sheet, and then select your niche. So before you move on to module three, which is going to be supplier research, make sure that you've actually selected your niche and you've considered everything. And again, if you want actually help choosing your niche, we do that in the paid program. Obviously, this is the free one, so you have to choose it on your own. But um, yeah, these are definitely the factors that you want to consider uh, throughout. And make sure that you select your niche before moving on to part three on supplier research. And we will see you soon. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next section. Welcome to part three on supplier research. So video one is going to be on how to find... Oops. <laughs> how to find suppliers. So my primary recommendation is Google Shopping. So I don't really recommend these. You can use them if you want. I'll show you how. But primarily, you want to find Google Shopping. So what you want to do is you're going to have all your product list from part two. You're going to have all your products. And you're going to have selected your niche. You can have your products within your niche. So let's say I'm trying to find suppliers for solar batteries or something like that. Um, the first thing you're going to do is go to Google Shopping and type in buy the product type online. Um, make sure that you are in your VPN is turned on for the location that you're selling in. So I'm selling in the US, my VPN is on for the US. Buy solar battery. Then what you're going to do is filter by $1,000 plus price point. Find stores that have your niche in the name. So try and go down to the stores where it says sellers and find ones that have solar in the name, so shop solar kits, and, and then add them to the competitor sheet on here. There's going to be supply research sheet. Go here. So when you click this, make a copy, and then shop solar kits. Solar power lifestyle. Solar town. Sunwatt sounds related to solar. Anything that seems solar related in here. Cutting edge power, bigbattery.com. Power Supply USA. You get the idea. Cutting edge power. Anyway, you get the idea. So then what we want to do is then go find the website. So just put these into Google. Scroll down past the ads. There's solar kits. And do this for many, as many as you can. Obviously, I'm not going to do super in-depth complex just out of interest of time, but you want to go in depth as you can. You should try and get all your suppliers possible. Solar power lifestyle. Solar town. Supply USA. Hmm, can't find them. Whatever. You get the idea. You want to find all your suppliers, put them in your sheet here with their URL. Next up 
after you do this is you're going to go to each of these websites and you're going to find on their website a section that says brands sometimes it's here in the menu it will say brands sometimes you have to go to the collection page and if you go to the collection page sometimes it will be along the side it will say like manufacturers or brands but ideally you just want to find brands manufacturers suppliers whatever the word they use is and then you want to copy them and put them in your second sheet supplier research like this paste values only paste values only you want to do that for each of the competitor stores that you find brands and there might be duplicates that's fine <coughs> So actually all of these are brands they have here. Popular brands, view all. Okay, well you can go add them all. I'm not gonna do that right now, just in the interest of time, but you get the idea. Go do this for all the competitors that you find. And make your list as long as possible. Ideally, your supplier should be hundreds of suppliers long in the best case scenario. So that's how you find suppliers if you want. You can also just go to wayfair.com. This is not what I recommend. I recommend all your best suppliers, I would say, would be found through the method I just showed you. You can just type in solar on Wayfair. Filter by $1,000. And then if you go to, once you do that, go to brands, show all. And you can get those as well. And you can do the same thing on Home Depot that I just showed you. Again, um, the first way is gonna be a lot better with this can get you some extra ones if you want. But make out your list of suppliers as long as you possibly can. The longer the better. Once you've done that, we'll get on to module second video, which is the characteristics of an A-plus supplier. So we'll see you in that video. Welcome to the video, everybody. So this is video two on the characteristics of an A-plus supplier. So we want the supplier to have a high price point. So just an example, if you're selling saunas, some saunas might be $2,000, other might be seven or $8,000. So the higher price point, the more revenue and the more profit product we're gonna get. We want them to enforce minimum advertised price. So what this means is MAP. So essentially, this is all the sellers of a brand's products have to list at the same price. So you can't undercut each other. No one can just keep undercutting, undercutting you until there's no profit remaining. Matt essentially will keep um, everyone listing at the same price. So the only way to compete is by having a good website, good customer service, and all the makings of an actual good business. And you maintain your profit. So you want suppliers to enforce Matt. The easiest product you will sell is to someone already searching for it. So you want there to be people searching for the brands that you're selling. You want them there, there to be minimal people selling the product, and you want to get high margins for that brand. If the supplier had all these things, there would be an A-plus supplier, and you would make millions of dollars per year selling their stuff. Um, don't think that a supplier is bad if they don't have all these things. If they have three or four, they can be excellent. My best supplier that I've done over two and a half million with has very high price point. They have very strictly enforced map. There's lots of branded search demand, but there's a lot of people selling it, and there's decently high margins, so it has four of the five. So don't disqualify one if um, it's not there. I'd say map is the most important um, out of them all. But again, think of it as a spectrum. Um, and these are just things to look for to analyze suppliers.
That's all for this video. I'll see you in the first one where we will find the price point of the brand's products. Welcome to the video, everybody. So this is video three. To find the average price point of a brand, go to Google Shopping and type in the brand's name and product type. Look and assess whether there's a large contingent of products over $1,000. Do not overthink and worry if it's $1,500 or $1,000. Just get a general sense of what is the average price point of the brand stuff. So just to show you an example, we have all of our suppliers here. Um, let's say I want to check Echo Power's price. Just type in Echo Power. Go to Google Shopping and assess what the average price is. So it looks to me like it's a little bit low. If I go to over 1500, um, there is higher price stuff as well. But for the most part, I would say um, the average price point is between like is around 1000. There's some above, some below. Say if I'm doing Blue Yeti, looks to be at least a few thousand dollars, which is good. You can tell here by what it's recommending you. So I'd say the average is around looks to be around like two or three thousand. These look to be very expensive, so seven, ten to twenty thousand. And the higher the better. And that's how you check price point. Again, don't be super picky about this. Just get a general sense of like where the range of their products are. And um, obviously the higher the better because there's gonna be more profit per sale, assuming a consistent margin. But just get an idea of like what the price point of your brands are. And that's all for this video. Uh, next one will be on map. Welcome to video for everybody. So as we discussed a little bit previously, MAP stands for minimum advertised price. It protects your margins. And um, to check if MAP is enforced, we wanna find a specific product on Google. So say I'm doing Solark. We wanna find, um, scroll down, and what you wanna find is essentially compare at price. So what you can do is type in a specific model, much like this, coffee, And then you just want to see, like, are people listing at the same price? So you can see 6,200, 6,200, 6,200, 6,200, 6,200, um, 6,200. And don't be super picky. Like, you just want to find, essentially, um, and sometimes there'll be compare at prices. So that's one way to do it. Just type in a specific model and see our stores listing at the same price. Another way is to, if sometimes it will show this compare at price. I would recommend doing it for an expensive product and just see our stores listing at the same price. So 36. Generally speaking, it looks to me like most of them are listing at 36. So sure, there's some below. They're likely violating maps, so you can report them. But for the most part, I see a general trend. So as long as you see a general trend, so I see 36, 36, 36, 36, 36. If you see a general trend, that is usually indicative of map. So you can just, again, don't overthink it. Um, just put, that was for EcoFlow, map, Yes, Solar, yes. Um, uh, you just wanna find, generally speaking, is there a clear trend? Just to show you what non-map looks like. See, 600, 300, 200, like just all over the place. So that is not, um, this was is what a non-map brand looks like. It's literally everyone's all over the place. But as long as you can see a general trend of stores listing at the same thing, that usually indicates map. So fill that out, that column out for each brand. And that is all for this video. And next up, we'll be doing branded search demand. So see you in video five. <clears throat> Welcome to video, video five of supply research. So this is on branded search demand. So what is branded search demand? The number of searches for a brand's products. And this is important because it's easier to sell something to someone who's already searching for it. So if someone's already decided on what brand they want and they already know exactly what product, much easier to sell to them than to someone searching for the product type. So like I say, grill versus Napoleon grill. Napoleon grill shows more buying intent, so it's easier to sell, especially, especially if we're listing that brand's products. So 
go to a keyword tool such as Ahrefs, SEMrush, or Moz, and find the highest search term related to the brand in question. So you can really just go to these, type in the brand name. So 800. Obviously you're gonna have everything filled out for all of them, just showing you. I'm not gonna do it all just out of interest of time. 29K for EcoFlow. But sometimes there's terms like infinity. If I type in the word infinity, you can see that there's 176,000 searches per month. But there's a brand called Infinity Massage Chairs. So if the word you're doing is a word outside of the context of what the brand is, then you need to find this, the highest one related to the brand. So here it would be Infinity Massage Chair. In these, I'm just trying to see, like, Tamarack. Like that to me could be a word outside of Tamarack Solar Brand, let's see. So if there's 24,000 searches per month for Tamarack, let's type in Tamarack Solar. 150, so I would put 150 here. So do that for all of them. Um, obviously very important if we're selling stuff to do the brands that people are already searching for. But that's all for this video, and I'll see you in the next one, which is analyzing the competition of a brand. We'll see you then. Welcome to video six, which is analyzing the competition of a brand. So what we wanna do is we wanna take the brand in question, so let's say EcoFlow, which I know is a competitive brand, and we want to type it in on Google Shopping um, go to compare prices or sellers at the bottom and count the number of stores selling that brand's products. So there's two ways to do this. Number one, we can go down here to sellers and we can see how many people are selling it. So obviously there is a ton here. And here's a general guide. There's over store, 30 stores selling it, it's gonna be very competitive. 10 to 30 is pretty good, non-competitive, and under 10 is excellent. So you can see here, I don't even know how many this is, but it's like, I would say close to 50. So what I would do is just put 50 plus competitive. Another way would be go to these compare at prices and you can see there's 20 per page and there's three pages. So there's literally like 60 stores selling this stuff. Another way would be to go just do another brand for you, Blue Yeti. So I would say there's probably about 30. So less competitive than the other one for sure. But yeah, so that's some general guidelines. Um, obviously, less competitive, the better. That's how you check. Uh, you can either go to compare stores or you can just count down here. I would recommend counting down here. It's probably the best way to do it. That's all for this video on analyzing the competition of a brand. Next up, we will be discussing how to check the margins of a brand. We'll see you in that video. Welcome to video seven on analyzing the margins of a brand. So obviously, margins are very important because we make more money per sale if we do it but also has an effect on how much we're able to spend on advertising. So if you have 20% margin, um, I wouldn't say you can spend more than 10% of the product cost on ads. So you're gonna be able to be difficult to scale. If you have 40% margin, you can spend like 15 to 20% on ads and still have 20% left over. So you can scale much easier. So to check the margins of a brand, you don't need to do this for every brand. Like if you have hundreds of them, you don't need to do it for every one. This is just a way that you can check if you want to. Um, you would essentially just go to four to six stores for selling out products. So if it was EcoFlow, just go to Google Shopping, find four to six stores selling the product, say store three, send store one an email, hey, store two offered me a discount on this, can you match it? Offered me a 10% discount on this, can you match it? And do that for a few different stores. Just try and get them to price match each other. And if you can get a 20% discount, that's excellent. That will usually signify they have at least like 35, 40. If it's 10 to 20, they still probably have at least 30% discount. 10% is solid, they usually have 20 or above. And if they will not give you anything over 5%, that's usually not very promising. It usually would indicate they have like 15% or something like that. So there's just some tiers. Again, you don't need to do this for everyone. Um, this is kind of like the least important out of them all, but it's just something you can check if you'd like to. Uh, it will help you kind of get an idea where you're gonna have the most op, uh, profitable brands. But that's how you check. Hope you found the video valuable. Next up, we will be finalizing our supplier research section before we move on to part four, which is going to be building your demo store. So we'll see you in the next video. That's all for now. Welcome to the video, everybody. This is video eight on sourcing contact information for your supplier list. So I would recommend at this point, you wanna add five columns to your sheet. Phone one, phone two, email one, 
email to link. So then what you want to do is you want to find the decision maker. So there's going to be a general line for every brand, but ideally we want to find the decision maker. And there's two ways to do this. So first way would be if I'm trying to find Echo Power's decision maker, I want to go to Echo Power, take their link. And if you go to a tool, is you, you can type in the URL on a, on a website like Apollo, and it will tell you all the emails that it has for that website. So ideally you wanna find someone called like marketing director, sales director, even founder or CEO can work. And same thing on LinkedIn. You can go to LinkedIn and you can go to, if you go to LinkedIn and you go to companies at the top, if you type in the company name and you go to people that work there, you can sometimes find a decision maker, you can contact them directly. If that doesn't work, the other way to do this is to go to their website and try and find partner or like become a dealer, dropship program, for example, and you can apply right on their website. Obviously, the easier it is, the more people are going to be selling the stuff likely. So um, <clears throat> you can find this, you can the decision maker. It really depends. There's just various ways to get in contact with them, but you want to fill out um, the phone. So um, if it was me, I would probably fill this out, but then I would call them and say, Hey, I've, um, or I would text them, I guess, and say, Hey, I submitted the form. Can you please let me know next steps? Just like be following up them. You really want to, we, we'll get to that in the closing suppliers portion. We just put as much contact information that you can find for a brand here that you can, that you can find as much as you can. Um, I, if you have hundreds of brands, you don't need to do up every single one, but I would find uh, at least 25 at this stage. That will be enough to get started when we get to module five on closing suppliers. I recommend doing it in tranches of like 25, 20 or so. So find contact information for 20, 25, so you can get used to it. If they have something like this where you can sign up for the link, you can then just put the link to that in the, uh, the column. But also find the contact information as well because you're going to be wanting to, likely if you submit this, you're not going to hear anything, so you're going to have to follow up. So that's where this will come in handy. So find the contact information for the brands. Um, you don't spend forever on this. And um, we'll get to this in the last video. But that's all for now. And I'll see you in the final video, which is finalizing your supplier research sheet. Welcome to this video, everybody. This is video eight, I believe, on finalizing your supplier list. So by this stage, you should have done all the research on the various components, uh, map, brand demand, price point, everything like this. And you should have put it in the sheet and you should have sourced contact information for each brand. So <clears throat> at this point, you're going to have essentially all this information about the brands and you're gonna have a gut feeling about each based on the factors. So there's gonna be like the price point, the margin, the map, uh, brand and demand. And essentially think of um, a tiered system. So your very, very best suppliers, you don't want to contact them first. You usually want to start with probably, um, if, if they don't, you, you want to start with low end suppliers that begin to get some products on your website and then you want to reach out to your higher end ones just because you reach out to the highest end ones right away when you have zero products in your store, they're unlikely to say yes to working with you. So you'd want to at least um, get a couple on the store first. So classify them as like your A, your best suppliers, B suppliers, C suppliers. On your sheet, you can just add a column and put what you think they are. And I would start your outreach down here. And once you get some stuff on your store, like one or two brands, slowly start working your way up. So don't, we're not even in module, I think it's gonna be five, which is gonna be your supplier outreach, but don't start with your best suppliers. So create a little system just so you know who you, the best suppliers in your niche are, who you're really gunning for. But just also have in mind that you don't wanna actually start with those. So. By the end of module three, you should have created a full competitor list of all the competing sites in your niche, a comprehensive supplier list of all the suppliers in your niche, analyze each supplier based on the factors in the module, and then also source contact information for about 25 suppliers, which should be sufficient to get you started at that point. But that's the end of module three on supplier research. Uh, next up is going to be setting up your demo store. So I'll see you in that video. That's all for this, but make sure you have all this stuff done. And if you have any outstanding items in module one and two, make sure you take those off as well. That's all for this video. And I'll see you in the next section on building your demo store. Okay. So this module is going to be a little bit different. I'm just going to walk you through very briefly a slideshow like this should only be a few minutes long. And then 
what I'll do is I'll actually go in and do a live walkthrough of me doing it on the screen, everything that we discuss here. So maybe just make some notes. Uh, I'll put them below the lessons just so you have them. But just keep in mind, like there will be a video of me actually doing this stuff uh, the next the next video after this. So to start choosing a store name. So when we're choosing a name, we want it to be related to the high level niche that you chose. So in my cooking example, I would not want to choose grillsparadise.com or like pizza oven pizzaovenhaven.com. Like I wouldn't want to do that because then if pizza ovens don't work out, I can't pivot as I need to, to, to a different product type. So I would want to do something related to the high level niche. So something related to cooking, something related to being a chef, something like this. We want it to be short and catchy. So the store name that I have now with my main store is hard to say. And every single time I talk to someone, to someone about it, I have to explain to them how to say it. It's just, it's a huge pain. So just pick something short, catchy, easy to remember, easy to say, unique. So in the video walkthrough that I do, I end up choosing Logical Chef. So Logical Chef would shop at this store is like the, the thought I'm going for. So it's short, easy, easy to say, somewhat unique. So just kind of go for that with whatever you choose. And you can go to Shopify Name Generator. And if you put in a term so if I put in chef here it'll give you all these potential store names so I think I saw superb chef or something and I thought hmm no maybe I saw logical chef right away I'm not sure Either way, it'll give you all sorts of different ideas when you put in a term up there. So keep that in mind when you're choosing your store name. You'll see when exactly you do that in, in the last video, but just keep that in mind. Next is Shopify Stings. So it will ask you when you create your store. So when you put in your version, so when I put in Logical Chef, it will say, ask you if you're dropshipping. Do not put that you're dropshipping. Choose furniture or other. Enter in your address and information and make sure you select registered business. This, this is actually cut out of the video because I was entering my address and stuff. I just didn't want that to, to be there at the time, but it will ask you register business. And this is why we had the corporation set up in module one. So this should already be done um, by this point. And you can just click register business and cruise right by. Next, when you buy your domain, you need to get a .com domain. Very important. Um, if .com is taken for, so let's say logicalchef.com wasn't available, it was. But if it wasn't, then I could put a word before or after it, such as the logicalchef.com or um, logical. Hmm. You could also just go back and pick a different store name if you want one that's .com. It, like you don't want to make it something ridiculous like logicalchefcooking.com. You don't want that. So try Logical Chef. The Logical Try is good. Try logicalchef.com. The logicalchef.com. But just make sure you're getting one with .com. That's very important for your SEO rankings. Set up your workspace. So again, this will be in the walkthrough, but you're going to create two. You'll create sales at yourstorename.com and your name at yourstorename.com. Set up a signature using Google, HubSpot signature making tool. It's free. Uh, we'll create two logos on Canva. One will be a circle for like profile pictures and stuff like that. Other one, another one will be longer for um, banners and, and the logo you put on your website and stuff. Again, this will be in the walkthrough. Store logo, we'll create two. One is a circle for like profile pictures on email. One is your actual logo. Uh, you can use like pictures if you want. Lots of stores just use text. I just use text with a cool font. If you type in free logo maker on Google, there'll be plenty of options or alternatively, you can just use Canva. Action items. So we're dividing this module into sub modules. So there's module four and then this is sub module one preliminary store setup. So at the end of this module, you should have your store name, your Shopify account created, your domain bought, your workspace account created, 
um, hooked up your Shopify domain to Google, which I'll show you in the walkthrough. You'll have two emails set up. You'll have two logos designed on Canva, and you'll have created your email signatures using the HubSpot tool. Uh, if you do all of those, we should be ready to move on to the next step, which will be actually getting a theme and starting to put together uh, the settings on your store and actually creating the, the structure of it itself. But that's it for now. Everyone, so this video is going to be about your store setup. So before we actually start setting up the store, we need to actually create the store and we need to also create our Google Workspace account. So when you're picking a store name, like I've kind of discussed before, we want to keep it um, We want to keep it at the uh, at your higher level niche uh, level. So we don't want to name this. Um, for me, like I'm doing the barbecue example throughout the the course, I don't want to name this like barbecues um, paradise.com. Like I want it to be the higher level niche I, I chose. So something to do with cooking. One thing you can do is you can just go to Shopify store generator and just put in cooking, and it will spit out different names to you. Some of them are good, some of them aren't. The main thing we want is we want it to be, one, easy to remember, two, short, just short to the point, easy to remember. And with, with my store that I own now, I didn't do that. And it's, it's been a pain. Like every single person I speak to about it, they, they have to ask me how to say it and it's a mess. So just pick something simple, easy to remember something that will convey the brand of your store. Like in here, if we're doing cooking, like we want to know it's a cooking store, but um, not anything specific that's gonna corner you in should you decide to pivot to different areas within the cooking niche. So you should have in the first module picked like a generic email just to put your work stuff on. So that's what you will actually go into Shopify. You can log in and it will say like create your first store. So for me, I'm going to name mine in this module Chef's Paradise. And like I said, you've logged in here with your Gmail email. You, you shouldn't have your Google Workspace or anything set up yet. We'll do that here, but just log in with your generic email, create store. Oh, so much for that idea. Because we're going back. Um, That could work. <clears throat> kind of like that. Yeah, logical chef. So this is what we'll put here. Are you already selling? Um, you'll put, I'm not selling products yet. That's fine. Do you want to sell products through dropshipping? Put no, you do not. Where else would you like to sell? Let's put you're not sure yet. Current revenue, just put up to 5,000. Which industry are you operating in? Put retail or furniture. I guess it will depend on exactly what you're doing, but furniture or other, I would say, are both safe. An address.
So just put your business address here. I think it's thinking this because I'm in the my Chrome extensions on. I'm just gonna fill this out and then I'll uh, I'll cut this part out of the video just so you don't see my address. Okay. So now we should be in here. It should look like this. So what we want to do is we want to go to sh settings. We want to go to, I will walk you through all this other stuff, so please don't change any of this right now. That will be the next module. But right now we just want to go to domains, buy a new domain. Logicalchef.com for $15. Perfect. I will also cut this part of the video. Okay. So you'll see after you buy the domain, it should take you to this page here. And you will own this. And the next thing we need to do is we need to buy a, set up our Google Workspace account. So what we'll do is we will go Google Workspace get started business name logical chef you can just put two to nine Canada yes we have one I would say um, here actually, what's going to be best is you're going to put sales at logicalchef.com and then make your password, whatever you want to make it. We will go in and we'll create you one, but it just won't be yet. So here I would say you don't actually need this one. There's a cheaper one, it's like six or seven bucks. But um, it's a free 14 day trial, so I think they just give you that one. And then you actually have to go in and downgrade after. So again, I will blur this out. Okay, so once you have that set up, you should only have sales right now. So once you get to this page, you'll protect it. I'm ready to protect my domain. Go to Google Domains. Hmm. I think we actually have to do this through Shopify. Switch to email hosting, G Suite. So you will take this, copy it, go to Shopify, and put that there like this. Just want to make sure that's set up correctly.
And then when we press protect, it should connect to Shopify. I obviously don't do this a ton. I've only done it a few times, so please just be a bit patient if we have to go back and redo something. So it now has been protected. Create user. So this is where we'll create you. So we will we'll actually need to rename this, but we'll add another one in this one. You can actually put your name. I would just say two is fine for now. Have sales and yourself. So go to manage your account, click these dots and go to admin. And then one thing you're gonna do is go to directory, go to directory settings, press profile picture name like this, save. And then go in your user directory. So I incorrectly named this account Brook It Inc, but just put sales team, something like that. And then what you will do is on your own personal account, you can go into your, well, what we want to do is we want to go to Gmail. Okay. And once you're in here, what I would recommend doing is going to settings and when you get an email, it's not gonna work right away. Like if you send an email and start sending out of this, it won't work right away. So what I would say that you should do is sign up to a couple newsletters, like even just business newsletters. Um, some good SEO ones are Ahrefs blog. And just sign up to these blogs on e-commerce content. So sales at chef. And I would also just sign up your personal one. That's a good SEO one. Um, Brian Dean Backlinko. It's a very good SEO blog. Top zero blogs. Flittesting.com blog. Send to like five or six blogs just so your email gets uh, starts receiving emails and stuff. The next thing you'll do is you go to settings and go to forwarding map, enable pop and enable IMAP like this. Save changes. So do this for both your email and the sales email. So we're on the sales one now. In your email, like here, I would just say, um, well, that's another thing. We'll, we'll have to create your store logo in the next module, but once you do that, you can put that there, but on your personal one, you can just upload a profile picture. So then when you send it, it actually shows, it shows you, which is like that, which is really good. Uh, next, we want to create our HubSpot email signature.
Actually, I'm just gonna create the logo now, just because we need that for the signature as well. So I use Canva. There's many free logo makers or something that if you want to use, you can. I'm actually just gonna switch to my account because I have a, a, a Canva account here. Elements. Logos, you don't like, you can actually pick um, something fancy, but as you'll see, like most stores, logo is literally just uh, a letter or just the name itself. And I usually go with it. I think a red would do good on a cooking store. So that will pretty much be what I use for my email logo. So then usually I'll download that and then just go to a tool background remover. And then you can literally just pop that there. Download. Hmm. I would say probably get the free one, but just for purposes of this, it's probably fine. And then I would also do a second one that's like,
and I would space out the the letters a bit somehow. Okay, so now we have both of those downloaded. I can go back here. And, okay, so for one, I can put the first one we did. Upload, download, so it'll be this one. Like that. And then the next thing we need to do is go to HubSpot email signature. So again, you'll need to do this for both. I'm just gonna do one. You can pick whatever layout you use, you wanna use. I think I usually go with this one. So. put whatever your phone number was you signed up for. So, and then email address. And then you can put your social links as well if you want to create those. Um, I wouldn't say it's something you need to do right now, but you will want to do it eventually. Even with my store now, I still very, very rarely use it. And I don't think we've ever got one sale because we had social media. Uh, just can help if the customer is like, if they look, just so you have a profile, but I wouldn't say it's anything, like it's not gonna drive sales for you. And then profile picture. Okay, so what you'll do, go to Google Drive. Log in with your account, new file upload. And then just make this shareable to anyone. Just make them a viewer. And then open in new window. Copy. So I think you probably only need one. And then create your signature. I think I 
just don't want your phone number. Um, at the Gmail. And it says, I think all we need to do is just copy this. Copy signature. Let's go to our Gmail. And then we'll scroll down. We see signatures create new. Put in logical chef sales team. So you'll do this for yours and this. Paste. And then I would remove this. Signature defaults. Like that. Save. Now when we compose a message, there it is. And you'll also have your phone number in there ideally as well. Sorry, I got a bunch of tabs open. And then what you'll do is you'll go in your Shopify settings and you'll see contact information. We, we want to edit this to the ones we just created. Yours though, don't do the, actually sorry, I did that incorrectly. So this is what Shopify uses to contact us, so put that as yours. Here, put that one, so customer sees this if you email them. I'll go through these other settings in the next module, but I just want to make sure that all this is set up correctly. Before we move on. Yeah, I think we're all good. So do those steps. Uh, go to Shopify, create your store. Um, you can use the name generator, but just make sure you pick something higher level that can isn't going to box you in. Then once you've created your store, we will buy the domain that you want. We will then create a Google Workspace account, which we'll create two of, one for sales, one for you. Then we'll create two logos, one longer um, width based logo and one just simple for your email. We'll create both of those accounts. We'll set up the IMAP and the GPOP in the email, which is done here. And then we will create signatures for both. And I believe that's it for now. Welcome to the Shopify settings video. This one is just going to be very brief. So this is just a slideshow version of the next video, which is actually a live walkthrough. So I just put this together to show you the various sections that we'll be going through. And I made some notes on some things that you should have set in those settings when we go through it. So store details, um, there's really not much use of me going through these in depth. Like when you go to your Shopify, you'll see in the next video, that there's these, when you go to settings, there'll be these sections. There'll be store details, Shopify plan, billing, users and permissions, payments, banking information, checkout, shipping and delivery, taxes and duties, locations, and your policies. So we will go through each of those in depth in the next video. So what I would recommend is if you have two screens or if you, if you can split your screen, I would recommend following through here on while you watch the other video. So kind of like, having this up while we actually go through the live walkthrough. And you'll find like a lot of the stuff that you need to remember from that video will be noted here. So you don't have to take notes during it. So that's how I would think of, of this slideshow. And the policies will be linked below this video, but they will also be linked below the next video. So hopefully that makes sense. I would just use this as a guide as you're going through the next video. We'll see you then. 
So this video is going to be a live walkthrough of setting up your Shopify settings. I'm going to go through it one by one. So basic information, so this should be your store name, your industry should be furniture or other. This should not say dropshipping. If you have registered your company and, and got a corporation, you can put the legal name of your company there, whether that's a numbered corp, your initials, whatever that is, you can put that there. This here will be, I would not put your actual business address here, put um, your, your virtual mailbox here. Just because most of the time with our style of business, your, your business address will be your home address a lot of the time, or, uh, or your parents' home address or something like this. So we do not want that going on your customer's bill. So that's why we register the Anytime Mailbox virtual address that has like a suite or, or uh, room number, like we don't want it to be a PO box, but that's the address that should be going here. Contact information, you'll put your store phone number here. Shopify uses this contact to you, so this should be your email. This should be what you want to send the customers from, so sales is fine for now. Store currency. So this will depend where you are. So I am from Canada, but I actually prefer to just deal in US dollars because we're selling in the US. So if you, if you can have a US dollar store currency, you will not have to pay exchange fees until you transfer it back to Canadian. So rather than, just to give you an example, if a customer paid in US dollars and then my store currency was Canadian, I would pay an exchange fee when Shopify sent that to me in Canadian and then I would have to pay the supplier in US. So I'd have to pay another exchange fee to get it back, send it back to the supplier. So it's easier to just receive US dollars on my store, pay the suppliers in US dollars and then keep what I want left over and then switch that back to Canadian. So always a good idea if possible to, to have your store currency as the currency that you are selling into your customers. Make sure you don't do any draft orders or test orders until you change that because it will not allow you to change this after you have your first order. Time zone, um, pick whatever you want. These aren't really that important, but again, you can pick what you want there. So plan to start I think I'm on a trial, yeah. So to start, this basic Shopify is fine. You can have two staff numbers, so two VAs. One thing to watch is this. So eventually, like as you get your order volume up, even though this is far more expensive, it will actually save you money on the fees. And eventually, like I'm on a Shopify Plus on my main store, it's 2000 a month but these are significantly less. Like I think this is 2.1 as is this. So just always run the numbers and calculate based upon your sales what's the cheapest. You probably will have to upgrade to this just in terms of like the amount of staff you can have. But um, this one to start is, is more than sufficient. If you wanna get 50% off, you can do yearly Monthly, it's $29, which, which isn't bad at all. So that is plan, billing. So this is very important that you set this up correctly. So this here will ideally be your corporate credit card once you get it. We have our billing currency. Sorry, this is not the very important section. That's next. This is how you pay Shopify. So if you sign up for apps, this is the card. Like there's no, you don't pay each app individually. You just get a bill at the end of the month for all of the apps that you use. And then this is the charge. This is the card that's charged. And then your bills will go down here to the bottom. As well your, is your domain and stuff. So it's all in one place. It's very, very convenient. Users and permissions. So when the time hums that you wanna hire a VA, you will add staff and you can give them varying permissions. So you can let them see your home, your orders, your products. 
um, but not the payment stuff if you prefer. Or you can give them access, like when you have apps down here, you'll be able to give them access to certain apps but not other ones. Uh, all you need to do is add their name and email. Usually what I would do for a VA just starting is I would do home, products, orders. They don't really need to see any of this stuff to be honest with you. That's really it. And then external tools that um, we'll set up in the next module. But that's all they would really need to, to start anyway. As you hire managers and stuff, they'll need more and more access. But the first hire, then that's really all you'll need. Payments. This is the important one. So what you'll do is you'll press Complete Account Setup. You'll put, it's, it's very important that you have your corporation set up at this stage. You'll put in your business number. So I'm from Canada. So we have business numbers here. If you're from somewhere else, it will, it will probably be asking you for something different. You'll have your personal details. And then you can just put like whatever you're selling. So it doesn't need to be long. This is um, somewhat important. So you've probably got a credit card charge before and you had no idea what it what it is. This is like what will go on your customer's credit card. So just to avoid chargebacks and stuff, just make it clear. Just put your store name. like that and then put your business phone number here banking information this is very important I would recommend that you set up a wise account and no matter where you are in the world if you have a wise account you can set up whatever your native currency is so for me my native currency is Canada but you can have two. You can have a wise Canada and a wise US that you can transfer between for the same business. You can have like 50 accounts with varying currencies for the same business. So here I would put the US account because my store is accepting US dollars from customers. My currency is US, so my customers pay in US dollars. And then the, those US dollars that they pay get sent to a US bank account. So I'm not paying any exchange fees which is very important. And then when you get this money in your US bank account, you can send it to your Canadian WISE account. And WISE has a very low exchange rate. So that's how you get the lowest exchange rates. If you put your Canadian bank account here, then you pay the Shopify exchange rate, which is higher than the WISE one. So I would recommend no matter where you are in the world, put your store currency, assuming you're selling in the US, put your store currency to US dollars, sign up at WISE, for a corporate account for your business. You'll need to be incorporated to do that. But once you are incorporated, get a corporate business account and then enter that information here and put your payout currency US dollars and you'll press complete account setup. You can also do the same for PayPal. Um, You, you should just be able to click complete setup and go through the process there. It's it's very simple. They are finicky, so make sure whatever information you're putting, like don't try and open a personal one before your corporation exists. Get your corporation set up and then enter the corporate info you need here. They are very finicky, like they'll ban your account, they'll shut it down, um, but, but like it's all just automated. Like I've had three or four shut down on my store and then I just create a new one with a different email and then it works and I've had the same one now for like seven or eight months so they're a bit of a mess and they charge very very high fees like I think Shopify is around 2.5 percent for credit cards like it was on the plans section it showed the, the varying credit card rates depending on plan but PayPal will be like four 4.5 and if you have an international so for me I'm Canada since my business address is Canada, it won't let me set up a US dollar PayPal account. So that it ends up being like a six or 7% fee, which is crazy. But uh, most it's really easy for customers and a lot of customers like using PayPal and it does increase the trust on your website. Like if you have a PayPal logo at checkout, it can, it can help increase conversion rate just by trust. So I would recommend setting that up, but just go through that process there. 
Um, eventually, you will want to get a Klarna or a Firm account. You might be able to have a Shopify Pay. Uh, essentially, what we want is a Buy Now Pay Later. So you can go to Klarna or a Firm. Uh, you don't need to do those right now. Like I would focus on getting your store up and running, get a couple sales, and then like that can just be like a longer term thing you add. It's not like a make or break right away. And it does take a time, some time to apply and get a hold of them. So I wouldn't let that be that be the reason you you're delaying starting and getting moving. This is very important. So payment capture, we want to do manual. So what that means is when a customer goes and orders from your store, if you had automatic on, your store will just capture the payment right away. With manual, if it's like a, a risky order or fraudulent order, you actually go in and you manually accept the payment. And this is important, not only for the fraud situation. So like if someone fraudulently placed an order, it would come up as fraudulent and then you could just cancel it without accepting the payment. So you never actually took the money and the person can't issue a chargeback. Secondly, is if a customer goes to your store and orders, um, turns out the product's not in stock, you can still, you can tell them, like we haven't accepted your payment yet. It'll just be showed up as authorized on their credit card. It won't have actually gone through. And then you can say the lead time is two to three weeks for this product, is that okay? And then they'll say yes, and then you can actually go capture the payment rather than, um, the issue is if you capture it automatically and then it turns that they wanna cancel the order, you pay like a 2.5% fee to send the money back. So if it was a $10,000 order and you captured it automatically and you're gonna refund them, you have to pay $250 just because you didn't do it manually. Like if you just hadn't accepted it yet, you could just cancel the order without even accepting the payment and save yourself that. So. Very important that you have manual capture on. Checkout, so we will put accounts are optional. So essentially this is a way for customers to log in to your store, to see their orders, to change their address, whatever else. Customer contact method, we will do email. Um, show link to download app, yes customer information require first and last name company name put optional in case it's a business order address line two optional shipping address phone number we need to require this because oftentimes our suppliers when they're delivering or when the carriers are delivering the order the big items we sell they will need to call the customer to set up a delivery appointment so we need a shipping address phone number that's very important you can show tipping at checkout, I guess, if you want. Um, I don't do it, but they can add add a tip, I guess. Order processing, so use the shipping address as the billing address by default, yes. Use address auto completion, yes. After an order has been paid, automatically fulfill orders. No, don't fulfill any automatically, this. And after an order has been fulfilled and paid, yes, automatically archive the order. Consent for marketing, let customers subscribe to marketing methods at checkout, pre-select this, and mm, I would say don't do this for now because we'll set this up later through a different app, like we don't use the Shopify one and it will tell us how to do that order status page and checkout language. So I believe that is all done correctly now. Save. Shipping and delivery. So this is very important as well. So this, this is the way to think of it. Every product on your store will by default go here. General shipping rates. Any Thing you put custom if you manually put a, a custom shipping rate and enter a product in that profile it will be removed from the general so I'm just looking down okay so what you'll do is you go in here and this is just going to assume you're selling to the US so we will delete this
and I would recommend putting So here you can put locations. So this is your default, like this is likely your business address. I would put one as your virtual address that you signed up for. So put like, just name it warehouse or something, wherever state your virtual address is, state warehouse. Fulfill online orders from this location and then put the info down there. And then, so I'm just gonna use my virtual address to show you what I mean. So you'll have like the actual state name there. And don't worry about this. Like what this is means is like if you have a physical location in a state, like you have an office, you have a warehouse, you have employees there, you have to charge tax. But it's just saying this because it's assuming we, we have like a warehouse location there, but our this is just our virtual address, which does not qualify um, and does not subject us to tax just because it's virtual. But under shipping and delivery, we will now create a, go into the general profile and thought we deleted all this, but delete all these ones they have pre-selected, did them all. I would remove the one with your actual business address, create shipping zone, put in United States free shipping. In our industry, almost everyone offers free shipping. The only situation that I would say you shouldn't as if you have like a super, super low margin product um, that you aren't advertising and every other store is also charging shipping for, then you can charge shipping. But um, for the most part, the default should be free. So United States free standard shipping. And what you'll do is just go through and select, we won't ship to Alaska or Hawaii. Most suppliers won't if you need to go um, manually fulfill an order there you can but don't offer it at checkout and also there's a bunch of other weird ones so Micronesia, Guam, Hawaii I think it should be at 49. So I think I'm missing one, Paulo. Yeah, looks good. So then press save and then add rate and you'll put custom rate, just name it free standard shipping like that. save and then all your orders will ship ship from that warehouse and it will be free by default any products that you add will automatically go in here but let's say for example you had a super low margin product that you wanted to charge $500 shipping for you could name this profile $500 shipping you can add products, so like I said, they default go in the other one, but then you can go in here and pick out products that you want to be in this one, and then they will be taken out of the default one. So what we'll do is we will put shipping from our warehouse, create shipping zone, do the same thing as before, 
United States, $500 shipping. And then go in and remove any of the any of the states that aren't on the US mainland. And I believe there should be forty nine if you've done it right. Alaska, there we go. And then add rate, and here we would put custom flat rate $500, and then just name it standard shipping, something like that. Not free standard shipping, standard shipping. Save. So just want to reiterate, default, any products you add to your store will go here, and the default is free. You can create various shipping profiles here and charge whatever you want for them. And you can add products into these and they will be taken out of this. But this is the default. And make sure that you have this set to the US. Taxes and duties. So this will depend on your specific situation. But for me, I'm in Canada. I'm only selling to the US, so I do not have to charge sales tax on my store until I establish an economic nexus in a state. And that is, it varies by state, but it's between $100,000 and $500,000 in sales per month. No, $100,000 and $500,000 over the previous 12 months. If you hit that in a very, any state, I, even though I'm not in the US, have to charge sales tax to my customers in those states. If I was selling in Canada, I would have to charge sales tax in Canada, but I'm not even selling here. So like I can set it up, but like it's useless because no one from Canada will be even ordering stuff on my store. If you are in the US and your business address is in a certain state, you need to collect sales tax in that state because you have a physical location there. Um, so if you were from California, you have to charge sales tax in California. Um, I wouldn't worry about it really too much to start. It's only relevant if you get asked by the supplier. But what you want to do is type in whatever the state name is. So here, California, resale certificate. And this is what you need to get for the state that you have to charge tax in. Again, I'm not an accountant or like a legal advisor. This is just my experience and how I understand this. Um, but in terms of charging tax, there's two situations you have to charge it. One is a physical location in a state. So an office, you live there, your business address is there, or two, you have an economic nexus. So economic nexus thresholds tax jar. And this will tell you how many sales in a state over the previous 12 months you will hit until you have to charge tax there. So in the previous calendar year, 100,000 in Florida, Connecticut is 100,000. Um, lots of seem to be 100,000, but some are different. Or it's usually sales volume, so 100,000 or number of sales transactions, but being high ticket, like our order value is over 1,000. So this would be like, this is the one we're gonna hit first most of the time. I swear more were higher than, than 100,000, but it looks like they're, yeah, so California is 500,000. Alabama's 250. So it varies, but usually it's around 100,000 per year until in, in, of sales in that state. So it's not total. It's like 100,000 in sales to customers in Idaho. And Shopify actually tracks this all for you. So when you get close, Shopify will, will warn you. Like it will say, um, you've almost established a nexus threshold in this state, keep an eye on it. And it just, because it can do that because it knows where your customers are. Like it, it knows where the shipping addresses are 
and it can calculate it on it keeps an eye on it for you I would just leave that how it is locations we already did this so we want to have your actual address but then also your virtual address there I don't know why my other one's not showing up given that it's used here it's kind of weird there we go there it is so I would change my default to actually that one gift cards not really important for you markets also not really important for you uh, unless you're selling in a bunch of different countries which I doubt because your suppliers likely don't have warehouses sometimes your suppliers will have a Canadian warehouse but the market is just so much smaller it's it's usually not like a super high priority thing apps we'll do that in the next lesson domains we've already done this brand a lot of this stuff is actually new so you can add your logos here that we did I've never seen this before as well as your brand colors that's kind of cool not even sure where that would be used but that's new notifications so by default Shopify will send your order confirmations and stuff like that these are all the things it's going to send by default so you can choose like what color you want your button to be you can change around a few things here you can put a logo your logo that you made I would keep all of these we will take some of them out later like abandoned cart I believe is set up on abandoned, abandoned checkout but we will eventually go do that through a different app so you can just take a look through here. I would leave everything. When new order comes in, see, so I would put your store email here when a new order comes in, not like whatever one you had previously. Everything else, yeah, pretty straightforward. Meta fields. I would not worry about that files so anytime you upload images they'll just be here for you to use um, language English by default you can add more in policies so what I would do is for your refund policy I would put something along the lines of here So you can enter your email there. What I'm going to do is I'll just put in, uh, I'll put a link to a, a Google Doc with a sample for this, but essentially the important thing to keep in mind is we do not have like a a standard refund policy like it will vary by your suppliers so our goal with any refund or shipping policy is to simply mirror our suppliers so if we have 15 suppliers we will have 15 different policies for each one and I'll show you how to set that up easily on the product pages to, so it like the products from each supplier have the recent refund policy for that supplier but here essentially we just want to put 
something along the lines of refer to our product pages for refund policies because it varies by brand. But I will attach a Google document below this video that has samples that you'll be able to use there. And you can change them around as you see fit, but I will, I will provide a sample below the video. For privacy policy, I would use the Shopify privacy policy generator. I'll also link this below. It will, you'll have to fill in your business address, your business name in various locations. Same with terms of service. You can also do the generator, so Shopify terms of service generator. And you'll just have to enter in your business name and stuff in various locations. Shipping policy will be much like the refund policy, so I will also include a template for that in the Google document. And here I would put like your store phone number, your store email, so sales, not your personal, and then your store address, virtual address. Put that information there. So refund, I will conclude a template privacy in terms of service, you can use the Shopify generator. I will include a template for shipping and contact. We want phone number, virtual address, and your sales email. I believe that's it. And one other thing while I remember is you can go here and go to manage account and you can change your, um, your email to the one that you've created. So now instead of, you can use your store one. Change email. I don't know, I can't remember my password, but anyway, that's what you'll want to change that to your store email there. And I think that's it for this video. So I will include below a link to the refund and shipping policies that you can change around as you see fit. But um, make all the changes here and then also Then also here. Hi everyone. So this video is going to be just a brief overview of choosing your Shopify theme. So the way to think of a theme is Shopify tries to make things as easy as possible for you when you're setting up your website. So you're not supposed to, you're, you shouldn't have to code anything on your own. Um, everything's just kind of templated and there's different templates that you can buy that will have different looks and feels to them. Um, there's lower cost ones, there's higher cost ones, and there's different advantages of each. So the lower cost ones, uh, they can still look very nice, but you'll have quite limited functionality in terms of what you can, what you can do, what you can move around, um, which might not be a big deal right away, but it may become one as you go. Then there's obviously uh, mid tier options. And then there's, um, high tier options as well. So this is just three recommendations that um, I've found. Don't think of this as the be all end all. Like these are just some that I'm familiar with that I know. Uh, I use the out of the sandbox on, on both of my stores. 
but um, I know lots of stores that are doing great with these other ones and I've provided some examples. So I'm just gonna show you briefly um, some examples of each. So for the lower cost one, I know this store, this is it. And if you get this little tool called Koala Inspector, you can actually see what theme a store uses. So if they're a Shopify store. So if you see a store that you really like, if you buy this, it's actually free, this little extension, it will tell you what they have. So this is just an example of this store. It's very clean looking, um, big banner. Not a huge fan of how they have their product pages set up, but I'm not sure if that's a function of the theme or um, it just how they've done it. So I don't really like like these vertical columns because like I don't even know the reviews are here and they're way down here. So I th that just might be how they have it set up. But if you think the website overall looks good, that's the Gecko one, which I think is like ninety bucks. Um, one thing is like if <laughs> if you're gonna invest like this is probably a good thing to invest in just because it's your, it's your store. And if you say, let's say you pay 500 bucks for out of the sandbox over the next year, if you make one sale that you wouldn't have otherwise made with a less theme, it's paid for itself. And likely if you buy something cheaper now, you'll probably wish that you bought something later and you'll end up buying both. So if you do have the capital to just buy a nice one now, I would recommend that. Shoptimize is very good. It's a mid tier option. I believe it's around 250. So you can just type in shop. This is the Gecko one, Shoptimize theme. And it's here. And it has some really good conversion rate features and stuff like that, which may be worth looking into. And this is a website that uses that one. So one thing I really like is here on the product pages, like you see how they have um, this kind of stays. So there's like these little blocks that look nice in the product pages that you can kind of like keep some things in focus, which is pretty cool. Uh, very clean option. And then the highest end is always gonna be out of the sandbox. So I recommend Turbo. I have one store that's Turbo and I have one that's Flex. I believe Flex is the newest one and most expensive. But um, it actually does some cool things. Online Store 2.0 allows some additional customization. Um, but I use Turbo on my store, and they're they're awesome. These these things, so you can actually see a demo if you go here. And it's kind of confusing. So with the Flex theme, there's like you get all of these. So there's like 15 different Flex sub themes that you get depending on what you want. So if you're selling like jewelry, you might want the Lux and you can see like, looks very, very impressive, uh, very clean. So they are expensive for sure. And you don't need to do this to start by any means. You can buy something cheaper, um, 99 bucks, I think shop is 250. But uh, eventually, whether you do this now or, or down the road, we'll eventually want to buy something that's, that's super nice like this here. Uh, those would be my recommendations for the lower, mid, and premium. I'm just going to actually, I'll link those below the video afterwards to the actual themes themselves so you can check. But that just gives you an overview of the different options and some recommendations on my end. Hi, this is going to be a very brief video. So at this point, you should have purchased your theme, uh, one of the, the cost effective one, mid tier or higher end. And once you got your theme, they would have gave you a link to either download the theme right from where you purchased it, or they likely sent you an email with a zip file containing the theme. So whichever those you chose, what we wanna do is we wanna go to the sidebar here. We wanna go to online store themes. We wanna add theme from zip file. And then you will paste your zip file there for whatever one that you purchased and then it will upload here and you can play around with it. So right now, if I'm, I'm just gonna do a free one just for the purposes of our examples, just to show you. So if I add this, 
you can see that it's here now, and I can actually customize the theme here. And the way that we'll do all of our store design, our product um, pages, our home page, our about us, everything like that, that will be in this customize button. So if you, this is the default that just comes with it. If we go in here, you can see all of this stuff here that we can actually go around and play with. Don't worry about this right now. Um, there will be a, this will be covered in a separate module. Uh, I just want you to get your actual theme that you just purchased uploaded so you can actually <clears throat> go in and edit it on the back end of your store here like this. So that's it for this video. Just one, make sure you purchase the theme. Two, upload it to your store in your theme library. Um, like if I was going to make this live, I'd press publish. I can do all sorts of, of other things here as well. But just make sure that you have it uploaded. In the next video, we're actually going to do our pages. So that's it for now. Um, if you have any questions, just comment them below the video, but very straightforward and quick module here. Hi, so this will be a two-part video. Just we're going to discuss pages on your Shopify store as well as creating your footer menu, both of which are very, very important to do and do correctly. If you don't have your footer menu, menu set up right, uh, your ad accounts will likely get banned. So make sure that you follow the steps here outlined and um, do each of these three things. So we want to create an About Us page, a Contact Us page, and your footer menu. So for About Us and Contact Us page, I recommend you just go look online, just Google something like um, example of About Us page, and then just go and, and kind of emulate what you see. What you want to do is you want to um, communicate your brand. So have something about your some core values. So think about what you want your brand to stand for. Something could be uh, fast response times, excellent customer service, um, how you treat your employees, how you treat the global community at large, um, pictures of yourself, pictures of your, your history, pictures of um, different products that you like, just kind of an about us section on you, what led to you creating your store. Um, people buy from people, and it's very important that you have a, a brand communicated to your customers. Not every person will check, but when someone goes to your About Us page, you want to have something there that has them feeling like they know you and they know your brand. So think of some core values, um, put some stuff about you on there, and just kind of look up on Google examples of good About Us pages, and you'll get all sorts of, of helpful information. Your Contact Us page, you want to just have a way that users can submit a form directly on your website to you that will be redirected to your email. So, um, and you also want to have your your store address, your your phone number, your your contact email, everything like that. So I'm just going to show you in here. Um, so on your dashboard to create these, you'll go pages, and you will go. So your contact us is actually already created by default. And when you go here, you'll see there's default page contact. So a contact page will have a box already built in that people can contact you, where a default page will not. So you want to put here, contact us, and you'll put your name. So something like contact logical chef management, phone, email, address, submit inquiries below. And you can always just like go to different um, contact us pages. So I know this is like a big store just to get ideas as to what exactly you should include on these. So if we go to contact us, yeah, so something like this, our goal is to reach you for customers and easy enjoyable experience online. And then they have the form, uh, very much like you will as well. So you can kind of just copy this, have, have all of this information, have your hours of operation on your contact us page. Um, so I would recommend, I would, rec I would recommend just putting like, hmm, I guess when you're starting, if you won't necessarily have a VA, uh, you could just do like your regular business hours. So eight till six and maybe like 10 till four on Saturday or something like that. It's really up to you, but I would include that on this page. So create your contact us page. Then after you're done that, you will create a about us page and you'll go add page, except now we wanna make sure this is default and you'll just name it about us and examples of nice about us pages and then yeah we just want to create something 
that has your face, that talks about your brand, who we are, um, everything like that. And, and you can do that all in here. All of this is very self-explanatory. You can add images, you can change your font around, you can um, add videos, you can insert tables, you can do all sorts of stuff to make it look nice there. So I won't go into all the specifics. Um, you'll be able to figure it out pretty easily. But we wanna create those two pages. We want a contact us page and an about us page. Once we've done that, we want to go to navigation here and you'll have your main menu and your footer menu. So your main menu, we don't need to worry about right now. Your footer menu is going to contain a bunch of things. So one, you'll have a search. Two, we want to include the pages you just made. So what you can do is you go search and you should see it pop up. So add and you also have your About Us page that you created. So it might not work for me right now, but you'll have your About Us page that you'll link there. And then this is the important part. So you should have done all of your policies already. We need to link our policies here because if our policies aren't linked in our footer, um, you can get your account banned whenever you go to set up ad accounts, which we'll be doing in module five. So it's very important that you have these. So if you just type in, it should pop up. Maybe I did not do them. I'm pretty sure I did. But yeah, okay. So I didn't actually do them in that module, but you will have these. Like, I just. So you'll have all these done by now. And then what you'll do is in navigation, we'll put our refund policy and we wanna change this. I've seen people get banned for not having return in the words. So we wanna put return and refund policy like that. We want our privacy policy for sure. We want our terms of service. We want our contact us page. So you don't need to put this because you'll have an actual, actual page for it. We want our shipping policy. I believe that's it. In addition to your about us and your contact us. So make sure you have all those in. And you will add to this over time as you go. But once you have that menu created, when you go to your theme, you can go to the bottom to footer. And you'll see here that quick links is, so if we were to put this to our change menu to our main menu, it would just be like that. But we'll click quick links. That's what the heading will be. So I'll probably change that to be honest with you too. It actually doesn't look like it lets me change it because this is a free theme, but usually you can change the word here to something else. Um, info, so here I would actually change to remove menu. So I would do two text blocks and actually just remove this completely. So now you have this, you have your links, your menu, your footer menu, and then you'll put contact information. And it's very important you have your contact information because that can also lead to bans if it's not set up. So you'll have your store name, your number, like that. Your address, your virtual address that you send up for in any time mailbox or whatever service. customer service email, sales at. So 
something like this. And then here you can put a, just a brief um, summary of your your mission statement. So like our goal is to provide the fastest customer service online or our brand is um, dedicated to providing the best home cooking products for your nutrition needs or something like that there. Um, I would actually switch the order of these. So I'd put mission first and your menu like that. So the things we need here are our phone number, virtual address, email, business hours, return and refund policy, privacy policy, terms of service, shipping policy, about us, and contact us page. That should all be linked in your footer menu. Uh, that's it for this module. I'll actually put that under the video so you can actually check off and make sure that you have everything. But next will actually be Actually, first we'll be going through the Shopify apps that you need to actually do the designs on your store to make it look nice. Um, and after that, we'll actually be going through and creating your store and your demo products. But just make sure you have this set up first. Hello, everyone. So this video is going to be about Shopify apps. So these are what I recommend. There are variations of each of these. And I've also put some optional ones down here. But um, yeah, this is just what I've I've done quite a bit of research on this myself and I've played around with um, pretty much every option in the book and this is kind of what I've found to be what's best. But if you want to use something else, it's totally fine. Um, yeah, like there's different, different ones will have different features. You don't have to use all of these. This is just what I kind of recommend. So before we actually start building your store, I think it's important to have these downloaded so we're not like going back and forth. Um, having to install apps every module. So this is what I would recommend that you start with. Um, and one thing to be mindful of now, and I made the mistake is don't, um, you wanna minimize the number of apps on your store. So if you have apps that you're not using on your store, it actually, it actually slows the store down, which is a huge factor in conversion rate. So we wanna have a fast store, which means we wanna have as little apps as possible. So, I'm going to go through each one of these and then I'll show you, I might as well just do it simultaneously. <clears throat> so I will put this over here, put those closed off. Hmm. Okay, whatever. All right, so add apps. And we want to go to the Shopify App Store. Most of these will have a free version to start anyway, so it's not like you're going to be paying for it until. So Clavio, the first one on there, is an email software. It's the best one I've found by quite a large margin. Um, there's a lot more functionality. It's every email marketer you talk to will, will recommend you use Clavio. So I would recommend getting that. It's um, so when you are creating email flows, like to send abandoned checkout emails and, and welcome emails to your customers, everything can be automated through Clavio and it will store your list. Um, it's really a great app. So I recommend that. I will actually run through this setup in a later module, but for now, just put your your sales email. Don't put your personal. So grow audience. It's not good.
admin. I should be able to reset my own password here. Manage, reset password. Thanks. Confirm Clavio. There we go. So now we're in. Again, we'll go actually go through the setup with this in a later module. I just want you to get the apps on your store now. Okay, so Clavio is done. Matrixify, that one is very important if you are um, adding suppliers that have a high volume of products. So some of them we've got have literally had like 30,000 products, like crazy. Um, and Matrixify is essentially a streamlined way to upload products that makes your life way, way easier. So rather than having to go in one by one and do them on the Shopify backend, you can actually do like a large portion of the information in a spreadsheet, upload it, such as price, shipping, um, product information, product name, product title, um, compare at price, all of this different stuff. That you can do right in here and it's also very helpful for updating inventory if you have large catalogs that inventory is always changing so i definitely recommend you get matrixify um, lucky orange so this is actually an external tool that you will have to install on your website um, is it maybe they have an app it's essentially a heat map and so you can watch your customers on your store. So when someone goes on your store, you can watch them actually scroll around the screen. You can see like, if there's any errors on your page, like you will see their screen. So you can see like mistakes, you can see what buttons they're clicking on. It will become less important as you grow when there's like hundreds of people on your store uh, at a time, at a day. But when you're starting, it's super good to have just so you can kind of like watch people and see how they're interacting with your website, just to get ideas. So I definitely recommend getting that. A review app is going to be very, very important from the start. Okay, so that's good. I recommend, so I use Yapo now. It is expensive. Um, lots of people use Judge Me. I think to start Judge Me is probably good and if you decide you want to switch to Yapo at a later date, you can actually export your Judge Me reviews and put them to Yapo. So Yapo, the reason why I like it is they have this additional feature that, so see how in, see how here there's this, they will include this in the ads when you have rate reviews which is unique. Lots of uh, review review um, moderators don't have that, but you can see like Judge Me reviews that are exceptional. So I would recommend you start with this. And again, we will go into the setup at a later module, but just for now, get it downloaded. Bold options or infinite options. So on product pages, oftentimes you will see, so just skip for now. On, um, who would have it? So like when I go to the product, like it's one product, but it has like these different options. Like I'm trying, hmm. So see here how there's all these different options of the same product. We have size, we have ignition type, we have color, um, but it's it's one product. So it's the Unity Fire Pit, but there's all these different variations. So what some people do is they create a different product page for every single one of these, which I think is insane. Like you have like 150 product pages for one product where you could literally just get an app like this and do it all on the same page. So. I recommend getting one. Bold, I think, is the name. It's expensive. It's like 40 or 50 bucks a month. So to start, I would recommend getting Infinite Options, I think is a good one that's free. Let's see. Yeah, Infinite Options. So 14 day trial, 10 bucks a month after, so it's not nothing too crazy. 
I recommend you get that for those product options. Tabs by station. So on product pages, you'll see how like there's a tab here. Who would have it? So when I go to this product page, you will see Maybe they don't have it anymore. Maybe it's just uh, hmm. anyway. Um, so see here how they have these little tabs. So these, this app will let you do that. So rather than have like one super long scrolling page, sometimes it's better to kind of like divide your info up in these, in these tabs, I find. Um, so that's kind of optional to be honest. You don't have to do this. If you think it looks nice and a good way to organize it, I recommend getting this app called Tabs by Station. So this one's good too. I use that on another store and then there's this one which I recommend actually. Tabs by station for that. Um, again, this one, the slide cart is also optional. So when you go to, so see how when I click add to cart, it just says like this, it's just up here. A slide cart is essentially, or, or another option is like what it will do is Let's see what these guys have. See when I press add to cart, it brings me to the cart page. So if you want that, um, it's fine, works. But what we do is when I press add to cart, there's this thing. So I don't have a cart page. This essentially takes the place of the cart page. Um, so rather than clicking it and it bringing me to like a page like this, it just goes here and I can exit off. And then if I want, I can just click this button and it's, it's there still. And you can put these like dynamic checkout buttons and stuff. So if you think that that looks good and you want to do that, um, and I have both. So that's if I click add to cart, but if I just press buy now, it'll just bring me right to the checkout. Like I won't even go to the product page. It won't even go here. It'll just go right here so they can pay. So those are two options I use. Um, but kind of up to you, what you think looks best. If you do decide to do that and you think it looks good, then I recommend you get this app called SlideCart. This one right here by HQPTE LTD. Um, Zapier, so this is going to be very important. Uh, we won't set anything up now, but I create your account. It's essentially an automation software, so you can if you get an abandoned checkout and a customer goes and starts checking out and then they leave, you can actually send a notification to your Slack that says like, hey, so-and-so just abandoned checkout with this product, here's their phone number. Or um, when you get orders, it will come in your Slack channel so your team knows that, hey, new order came in, this is the customer, this is the product, and then they know to go submit it. So very important automation software. Uh, I recommend you create your account. Zurex is optional. Um, It's a tough one. It's essentially like a way that you can do upsells on a product page. So I'm just trying to think what one of mine would have it or who would have it. So see here how like there's this. That, that is through an app like Zurex. So if you think that you're gonna have products that this, like some products this won't make sense, like it just don't need to do it. But other ones it might. So this one's a bike and there's a trailer. So that kind of makes sense. So if you have options that make sense to have this, then get Zurex. Uh, your live chat is very important. So the best free one that I've found is called talk.io. So if we go to the app store. I, I don't use this, but I know a lot of people do and they say it's good for free. So this, um, 
I use this one, Chatra. It's like 27 bucks a user a month. So it's a little bit pricey, but it has some cool features. So you can see like, you can see everyone on your website at the same time. And you can also see what is in their cart. You can see where their IP address is from. You can, so when they're typing a message, you can see the message before they send it. So it can allow you to respond really fast. Um, you can see what page they're on. You can do all sorts of automation. So like if a customer is on X product page that has this product, I can send them like a discount just on that page. Or if they're on a page that has product in the URL, I can send them a message. Um, like if they've been on the page for over a minute, I can, it can ask a timer. So if they're there for over a minute, once the minute hits, I can then say, Hey, do you need any help? Stuff like that. That's really, really good. Another good one that a lot of people use is called Tidio. It might be a little bit cheaper than Chatra, but I um, I don't know, I didn't have a great experience with it. I think they have like, Chatra, when you pay for it, there's unlimited text, a limited amount of, of chats you can use. Tidio, like they have an expensive plan that, like that's similar price to Chatra that there's no limit. But some of their cheaper plans, there will be a limit, like 100 a month or something. So if you're just starting, it might make sense to use Tidio. Um, save some money and then switch to Chatra. But um, yeah, either of those work. Tidio, Chatra are the two most popular paid and then talk.io is a good free option. Um, trust.me is a good way to get trust badges. So you can put them, ultimate trust badges is also very good. You can get that one and this one. So essentially these are like things you can put underneath your, your checkout, like with these cards. that can help users feel comfortable buying to trust your website. One that I highly, highly recommend is called Sales Boost. So this is a way, a big issue is Shopify, you can't put your expected shipping time on an individual product basis. There's no real way to do that. So Sales Boost, what's it called? Um, I'll know when I see it. It might be called SEO boost actually. One second, I need to go on my cell phone to see what the app's called. Ah. This guy, right here, by Sunflower 88. So that's the one you want. It's excellent for showing like, individual product ETAs and uh, very good, very good. Highly recommend. Um, and then lastly, so Shopify has a blog, so you can make your own blog posts here. It is not great. So it's pretty much just like this. You can add images and stuff, but it's super limited functionality wise. You can't really, so if you were, if you were writing a blog and you wanted to include products in your blog, there's no way to really do that other than to just pay, take a, a, a screenshot of a picture, put it in the blog and hyperlink it to your product page. That's the only, or create like a button, like use like one of these, like a button creator app or something. That's the only real way to like, so screenshot a picture of a product, put this button underneath and hyperlink the button to your product page. So it's all very manual with Shopify, unfortunately. So if you want something else, you can use this. This is what we use. It's expensive. I think it's like 60 bucks a month, but you can actually link products right into your blog page. It just looks super clean. The blog itself. So you can put authors and stuff, schedule posts. So 
they didn't have this option when I signed up actually, it was only this, so like maybe this would make sense, but only do this if you know you're actually gonna be writing blogs yourself or you're gonna hire someone to write blogs. I would recommend doing that just because it's really good for SEO to start, but um, don't be paying for this if you're not going to do that if you think you won't have time or you won't be willing to invest in someone else to write your blogs or you're just wasting money. And lastly, Buddha Mega Menu. So Shopify's menu is usually through here, navigation. So we covered the footer menu, but main menu will be here. So you can have like home and you can make like sub. So if I had like cooking or I had like indoor kitchen and then I could have like stoves, um, fridges, um, sinks is a subcategory and it would look like, I'm just gonna show you. So as you can see, I've made these subcategories under home. So now when I view my online store, if I press home, there's these, I wonder if I make it wider for all. Yeah, like they're the subcategories. So it's fine, it works, but you can get much nicer menus that have pictures and stuff in them. So I just wanna show you an example. So see how they have like the images and stuff in the menu? So if you wanna do something like that and you like how that looks, I think there's something for like $9 a month called Buddha Mega Menu, yeah. That's what we use on all our stores and it's it's great. I really like it. There are some other ones that I haven't tried, but that's what we use. I really like it. I think that's pretty much it for now. So like I said, just get those installed so they're on the store and the next module will actually be going in and creating the store itself. But um, there'll be certain points where we want to reference back to these and do the setup in that video. So I just want you to have them all set up, uh, ready to go. So when we go do that, it's um, it's super simple and we don't have to go download it then. So hopefully that makes sense. If you have any questions, let me know. But um, download all of these. These are both optional, depending if you wanna do blog and a menu. Um, slide carts optional, tabs are optional. Uh, bold options are optional, depending on what kind of products you have, but everything else, uh, Zero X is optional, but everything else is, I would say, mandatory. Or, a version of it is mandatory. So if you don't want to use Clavio, you can use MailChimp or you can use, there's different ones, but get some sort of email software. And Trixify is very good for updating products and uploading inventory. Lucky Orange is very good to start to track your customers. You need a review for sure. Um, Zapier will save you a ton of time. You'd be crazy if you didn't get that. Chatra, you need a live chat. Um, trust me, I'd say like, I don't know why you wouldn't. It's free, the, the apps are free. They really help. Sales Boost. Um, super helpful as well. So go with that and we'll chat in the next video. Hi everyone. So this video is going to be about actually building and designing your store. So I just want to go through a few points and then I'll actually get into it. I've actually purchased a out of the sandbox theme to make this module. Um, I guess partly because I might actually use the store uh, just depending on how much time I have. But um, so I wanted to have nice nice theme, not the cheap one we're using in the previous modules uh, to show you how to build it and um, potentially to use in the future. So when we build the store um, with high ticket items, these are just a couple key, key points. We want to have trust. So you can do things like you can sometimes actually pay a little bit of money to be featured in like a magazine, like 50 bucks and you can be featured on like Market Watch or something. So that's something we can look into um, in the later sections. but. Um, what we want to do is we want to put all the brands that we work with. So as you acquire brands, we want to have them on our homepage. So like partnered with XYZ brand and their logo on our homepage to start. I'll show you different ways we can, we can build trust. Um, we want to have simplicity, clean design, consistent. So we want to have two fonts max. Ideally, like you could even use one if it fits, but at most we want to have one for headers and one for the actual body of the text throughout. Um, colors, same thing. So we want to have two colors mainly, um, max, so like blue, like a white background with blue and uh, blue and, and green or, or something like that. It just needs to be simple and consistent. And we want to have nice logos around the website and we want to have nice clear pictures. So I think I have different slides for the yeah for each kind of page, but that's just generic, um, and that's what I'm actually going to start with when I'm doing uh, the store builds. So we're going to start with the homepage. This this order here is is proven in like many conversion rate tests to be the highest converting 
order of a homepage. So we're going to have a hero section as seen on a descriptive element explaining your brand, featured products, views, social proof, carousel, and content bucket. What we're going to do is actually get into this. And I do not do this every day. So if I'm back and forth and like making mistakes on things and redoing things, um, please be patient just because obviously I only have a few stores but I've only really done this a couple times. So I bought this theme. So see they, they'll email you a, a box like this. And there's a, the out of the sandbox one, the box ones are a little bit different. Like they're, you get many themes within a theme. Like I can use any of these. So I'm just trying to think like what one's gonna fit my brand the best. Looks like this one or this one. So when I click download, it will give me the zip. And when I click, you can see there's all these different ones. And that one was, this. the one I was just looking at is called uh, Fresh. So I should need to find one here called Fresh, yeah. So what I'll do is you go to your homepage to the part that says online store. And you go to add theme, upload zip file, and then go to what, so I would use the, the one I wanted was fresh. So then just press that and wait. If you, if there's little clips cut out of this video, it's because I'm exhausted today and I went to get a coffee. So I'm going to be having an absurd amount of coffee throughout the video. Okay. So now that it is up, we will customize it. And this here is the homepage. So you, this is how Shopify works. Like I'm sure you figured this out a bit, but there's all these pages here. And then these are like the sub this is how you edit the homepage, but if I go to like products and I click here, I guess there is no, because we have no products in the store yet. But um, we'll do that. So for the homepage, we want to follow the, the order that I outlined here. So a hero section is, is this. Um, and we have one have an announcement bar for sure. So. I would put something like this, fast and free shipping. Mm, we can actually do this later. I wanna get our color and stuff sorted out first. So what you'll do to start to get the colors right is we wanna to go to theme settings, colors, And you can type in like Berlin, Burgundy hex codes Shopify or something. Theme color palette Shopify Burgundy. Something like that. And then you want to find like what you're going for. So that's kind of what I'm going for. And this is. And then you'll get like, remember how I said two or three colors? So then what we want to do is go to our 
so background will always be white. Borders, it's kind of up to you. You can leave gray, sometimes I just do them white as well. You might not notice a difference. Body text, we always want to be black. Links, you can do, let me see. Gray is fine for now. And don't take everything I'm saying as like the gospel here. Like it can, it can change uh, if you'd like. I'm just trying to give you like general recommendations. So I would do this top bar here. So find announcement bar. that to be maybe I actually have to go in the announcement bar itself yeah I even might want that a little bit darker to be honest with you yeah like that and sticky on scroll yeah, we usually do want it to be sticky on so which means like it stays like that. Fast and free shipping. Halloween sale starting now. We always want to put some element of scarcity, so like you can put something like Halloween sale ending in 48 hours. So then like no matter, usually, usually most people on your website will be first time people, 90 plus percent. And the ones that are returning, like they're not necessarily gonna remember. And this just works better than you having to go in and say if I put Halloween sale ending September 25th, then I have to go in and change it every day. So just put like ending in 48 hours or something like that. Um, I'm just trying to think what else we need to have up here. Fast right now. So you just have your phone number. So I need to actually I'm just gonna pause the video for a second and look what my phone number is. Just one second. Okay, we're back. So I would always put your phone number up here. Mm, not necessarily actually because we can put this in the second bar I'm just wondering what this button is we can use that in the future potentially it's not sure about right now home page only So that's fine for now. I guess Halloween sale wouldn't be ending in 40 hours, but fall sale ending in 48 hours. Or you could do like, once it hits October, you could do Halloween sale ending, Halloween sale this month or something like that. Limited stock remaining, something like that. It's just better to have some element of scarcity if you can. So for the top menu, I recommend putting this top bar, and this is where you'll put your contact info. I've found Libra Baskerville is a good font for headings, personally. It's, um, it's very good to build trust, it looks professional. Okay, 
So once we go in here. Sorry, I'm just looking at my other stores as well. Yeah, I think that's good. Eventually we can have our social media links up here, but not a priority right now. And I would make this a little bit off. Like, I don't want this to, hmm. Let's see how it looks if I... I'm not a design person, so, which I'm sure you're probably realizing right now. There's got to be a middle between those two. That's huge. I guess that's fine for now. And you could put like a phone emoji or something. We don't want it. We want it to look professional, so don't put like the this one, but. Something like that can look fine. In menu. This is weird, I, I don't think we should have the menu there. I think the menu should go here. Yeah. And then our logo. I think we created one on Canva, if I'm not mistaken. I think it was on a different account, though.
was it here? Projects. So I think I mentioned this before, but we want to use a tool like a, <clears throat> a background remover tool and then upload our image there. It's, it's important that it is high quality, so some of these things will only give you... So they want your email to get the, the free one, I guess. Whatever. And then download. And then I don't know why it's done that because the background should It's not even working at all. So I would say we need to make this a white background. You can see it's kind of blurry, and that's what I'm. It's not too bad. I just don't like the huge white space with both. Hmm. Maybe it's not a big deal. Maybe it just looks empty because we don't have our menu in there yet. search icons and text so it's always good to have that overlay no we do want to have a sticky header on scroll just like that And we want our links to be black. Links on hover to be
Yeah, so see how they turn red now? Cart icon. Mm, I don't like that. Not sure why it's red. So footer. I kind of like this darker red, to be honest with you. Just whatever you're, whatever color you're using, just make sure you're consistent across the store, so you don't have like different shades. If that makes sense. this yet. I don't, your, your theme might, might not even have this, but essentially what it is is a way that we can have multiple menus like segmented and stuff, which won't be really a thing for you to start. I think I'd probably just remove these for now. Maybe it's just not even showing because they're not even there. Okay, so here I would not do a video. I would do a hero image. So remember from here, this is the section, this is the order we're gonna go. So remove, the way you do is you go down here and remove section. And I would put like, slideshow. Like that. And then you can drag them around. And what we want to do is, I don't know, if you want to put two, you can. I don't really think you need to when you're starting. Now I just have one. So we want this to be, I'm just trying to figure out a way if I can make this any smaller, but I think it will depend on the image. So what you can do is when you go to Canva, so open a few sites at this point, go to Canva, go to pixabay.com and go to pexels.com. And what you want to do, Shopify Hero, search yeah and then you can just actually remove everything here and I would probably gonna resize it to height 900 
Yeah, I would say that's probably a good height for your your image. And then what we want to do is find like nice lifestyle images related to our store. So <clears throat> and these are all free on these two websites, which is perfect. That could be good. And you can update this over time. Like if you get your brand's products and you close some brands, uh, you can use those. So that might actually be like, let's just assume that I've closed Somerset Grills or something. And like since I'm also selling appliances, right? Like it's indoor cooking as well. I want to like include maybe something there, and it would be actually cool if I can slice the photo instead of having it like this. Slice. Mm. kitchen Maybe something like just this will work. Mm. Now let's assume I've closed Z-Line. 
appliances. So what what you should do is just do ones that you've um, just use like basic ones that we you find in website like that, or you can go to like another thing you can do is go to shop appliances in Australia, like some country where um, you can just use the pictures for now, and then once you get your own brands, replace them. It's I don't want to tell you to do something illegal, illegal but it's um, like the reality is they probably will just uh, not notice and if you have it up there for a week and you're not even advertising. Lifestyle luxury appliances, but the, like them, they may just tell you to take it down or something. It's free stock. There's got to be better images than this, man. That's cool. And then here you can make this the same color as your I'm just trying to think of ways I can make this thing thicker. I don't know. It's not great, but it's fine for now. And then we obviously want this to be very high quality. And then this will be our background image. One thing to be careful of is the higher quality you make the image, the slower it's going to load. So I would actually probably redo that. Compress file into, I think.
SVG is the fastest loading, actually. I'm not sure if Shopify has functionality for that yet, but if they do, that would be perfect. Uh, okay. So, mm, yeah, I would just do PNG with a little bit lower quality just to, so when your site loads, like it's not super slow. And we also want to be mindful when we're building our store is you can click this and see what it looks like on mobile. So here, like that doesn't look great, to be honest. Um, it, it will need to be like a taller image. So what I would do is I would recommend making one for each. So you have this and I would say we just want to click resize and then Ideally, like 1,000. So, roughly twice as tall as this is high. So, let's see what this looks like. And then we just want to like re. No, that's too much, to be honest. still yeah that should be good So then we'll select, but then on mobile, we want to use that one we just created. I'm not a huge fan of that, to be honest, but I actually might even prefer the other one, just because we want these buttons above the fold. I wonder if I just make it like...
I hired someone to do this on my stores, so this is why I'm so bad at it. I'm sure yours will be far better than mine. Are we still on mobile? And one thing to watch is I don't know why this announcement bar is hidden here. It's kind of weird. That's better for mobile. That's fine for now. And then what we want to do is, so you can go a couple of different ways here. So these need, for SEO purposes, these should be primary keywords of your stores. I'm just understanding why it's putting this black background over on mobile. I would just do this, but then we're just gonna need to adjust the font size. <clears throat> 
So when we go to So I usually make my my buttons, my headings, everything um, Libra Baskersville, but my body Helvetica. So main menu. Maybe we do need a bigger... One of these on mobile. Yeah, I guess that kind of fixes it. So now we need to change the buttons, so... I'm just trying to find the buttons in the heading, like these ones, why they're black. I think that will work. We just need to make the 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 blur white instead of black.
text itself. Once we have our collections built out, we'll actually link those to here. And then with buttons, we want the background hover to be like a lighter version of what we have. So like, let show you an example, like that. So that will be our good that will be the first section, the hero image, and then as seen on as featured in. So that's kind of like a trust building section. Um, I'm, just, I'm just gonna be right back. Okay. So as we discussed, that's the hero element. Not sure. So as seen on as featured in, that's like a if you were in a magazine or something, like this, you, can, you can pay like $50 to have like an article featured on your store. I would honestly just leave these banners here, but I would change up the, the wording that they have. will depend upon who your supplier is, but there usually is restocking you, but I would not mention that right in your homepage. Just put like if you want. Don't don't be like dishonest, obviously, but don't, uh, I don't know, maybe just like products in stock and ready to ship, something like that. And then choose your delivery date. I like that one.
So instead of the as seen on feature in, we'll just do those. Just like essentially what we're trying to do is it's a trust building element right under the fold. So when someone's on the page, they like without having to scroll, there's something here building trust. That's the idea. Obviously, if we're in a magazine, that's going to do that. But here, obviously, we're not yet. So this works fine um, as kind of a substitute for now. Um, and then we want to have a descriptive element describing your brand. So you could put like your logo here. Um, probably best to actually just use one of those images we had. Yeah, something like this. And then just describe your brand. So. We don't need to have three. And then you can include a button label, shop, outdoor, kitchen, something like that. So buttons, primary buttons are background white, no. It is good to have yeah, a few different hex codes, and this is why. So have your descriptive on explaining your brand, then you're going to have your collections. So we go to sections, this is done, this is done, this is done. Um, you can just blur it out if you don't want it, or you can actually just go in and remove it. It's up to you. Future product, I would remove. Remove. You could have like eventually when you have a bunch of products, you could have your best sellers here. I wouldn't yet.
Um, so what we want to do is go in here, and these are all the different section types you can add. So we just want to do a collection list. And we should probably actually create our collections. So your collections will be like, okay, this is what I would recommend making, which is actually a good thing I should include here. What to make collections for. Every brand, every high level product type, every product type. So I'm just going to do this quickly for you. So under collections, my store is an outdoor cooking and an indoor cooking store. So I will have outdoor cooking as a collection. And you can do it by tags or so you can tag products. And then I'll have under outdoor cooking, I'll have outdoor grills. And that will be a product type, outdoor grill. I'll have outdoor fridge. Sometimes there's gas ranges and electric ranges in kitchens, so just put, it contains the word range. So when you're doing your product types, you can put gas range or electric range and then they will go on both. I'm not gonna do them all right now, but you get the idea. So then we'll have our menu. We wanna go to our main menu. And I'll have like that, and then I'll have and then you can make it a sub actually. If you can do it this way, if you want, or you can use Buddha. It's up to you. Buddha is very easy to use. I swear I made a. So you have all your different product types here. Make a collection for each of them. And then, so I'm also going to upload a product shop grills in Australia. Or you can just go to, this honestly works fine.
You just need a picture of a barbecue. I don't know why this is so hard to find right now. I wonder if this app depending on your niche this app actually has free high ticket products that you can, not not free I mean um, you can just close the supply they'll they'll let you use Fires on their store automatically. There you go, that one could be a demo. And there's also other apps like this. but that will be fine for now. So when we go to make products, what we'll do is you'll name, like your products will all have names. So usually I recommend following this format. Brand name, product type, actually brand name, descriptive element, product type, so Ford, F-150, like the specific product name, pickup truck, like that. Here it will be, like I'm just doing a demo product, so I'll put like, logical chef, master cooking grill. And then your suppliers will give you the descriptions and stuff. Like that's usually not an issue. They'll also give you the pricing. So cost per item is your cost. So if I have a thousand dollar product with a forty percent margin, my pro my cost would be six hundred. I would charge one thousand, and the compare price is like what it will show it's on sale as. So like this, I would I would recommend putting it like ten to twenty percent up. SKU is essentially a product identifier. Your supplier will usually give you that. And you always want to just put that you have inventory in stock. You don't really need to fill any of this other stuff out. So this is what I mean. So vendor, you would put your supplier's name here. Collections, you would put, you would tag it as outdoor cooking. And you would also tag, you would put the product type as, I think we put grill. So when we go into our collections now, product type, we should just put contains grill. And now, see it populates there. 
and outdoor cooking. It is also populated here from the tag that I used when I tagged it as outdoor cooking. So now when I go back into the theme I bought, you can see there's the stuff we put up top there. So I would just put your best selling collections here, but for this we'll have and you don't need to use the same images on all these obviously. So we're done that. Um, this is some good social proof stuff. Obviously, put what's applicable to you. So, we don't need this. You can go through these icons, I guess, and pick. ones that are relevant for you, so. If you want, or you, you can just avoid having this all together, it's not really required. That's pretty much it. We just want a super simple homepage. Um, we could have a second carousel section, so we could have something like indoor outdoor cooking, and then um, like all of our product types, like grills, apply like gas ranges, kind of thing. Like, let me see. You could put like a, you could tag a bunch of products as, as best sellers as a tag and then create a collection called best sellers and put, oops, not featured products, right? 
and then create a featured collection with all of your best sellers and do it as a carousel slider. And do two products per row on mobile slider. Do not like that ugly green sale button. Yeah, you just want, you want to be careful, you don't have too many colors going on, but we also want to make sales stand out. And I also want to make our buttons a little bit more rounded. I guess these it doesn't matter. I'm more so referring to the add to cart, but I would also I think I forgot to put this, but in your header, in your top bar, we want to put your email as well. So just put something like something like that. It's coming together. So now that we've done that, we just got to put our Have these pop ups. There's got to be a way to turn them off. There we go. So go there, turn those off. Your theme might be different. Footer. Show Powered by Shopify, do not show Powered by Shopify. Show Theme Designer credits, no. Show Payment Methods, yes. Show Language and Country, yes. You can put in your, I would make Facebook profiles for Facebook, LinkedIn, Pinterest, and I guess it will depend like on your brand, but Facebook, LinkedIn, Pinterest, and then you can link them there. So if I put in like Facebook, usually like a, an icon will show. Maybe because this is just fake, but.
but yeah, you, you could link your pages there. And we want our menu to be our, f we, we already created that in a previous module. And then I think it was we discuss contact us. So do that, so put contact information. addresses that you signed up for. So just put address obviously, not virtual address, but and then I don't love that I can't rename this, it's kind of annoying. And then you can do a logo in text. So here you could put your logo, or you could make a white version of it if you wanted. And then just put about us. Something like that. And lots of people actually will make their footer menu a different color. It's up to you. If you want to keep it the red, that works. Footer. So that will be it for this video. I know it was very long, um, but 
we've got a nice looking home page now and so this will be just the home page video and then we'll do I'll do separate videos for both the collection and the product pages uh, shortly and I will see you in those hey what's going on guys so this video is going to be a module on collection pages for your Shopify store and um, so we've done the home page in the previous module uh, this video now is just going to be kind of rounding up the store uh, getting everything else good to go so just a couple preliminary notes on this um, on the collection pages that's like the product display page essentially so when you type in um, if you're on the store and you hit the menu and you hit grills and you bring brings it to the page with all the grills that would be the collection page um, there's a couple notes we want to have three rows on desktop two on mobile if you don't have two on mobile it's not even really clear it's a collection page so it's important to have two we want to have good filtering mechanisms so you can do that through tagging your products, which I'll show you. And we want to make collections in our Shopify store for every brand, every product type, and every sub product type. So the more collections we have, the more nuanced keyword targeting we can do on our collection pages, um, which is good for SEO. And the better menu we can make. So just keep that in mind. I'm just going to show you how to do it. I can get out of this thing. Yeah. Okay. So to make a collection, you have products, collections, and you'll have all of your products here. So I have, I've just done one as an example. So when you get all your products, you can filter them. You, you'll have product type. So this is a grill. But then you can tag them with different things. So my broad category on my menu is outdoor cooking. So I would want a collection for outdoor cooking. So when I click outdoor cooking, it goes to all the outdoor cooking stuff. When I click indoor cooking, it goes all the indoor cooking stuff. But then I can have a collection, a sub collection for grills based on the product type grills. Sub collection for product type outdoor refrigerators. I could have a sub sub collection for like charcoal grills. We just want to get as subdivided as possible when we're doing our products to give the user a better experience. And how you can do that is you can tag this. So if, I don't even know what this is. Like I just found this picture randomly. But if I wanted to tag this thing, if, if I want to create a charcoal grill collection, I could tag it as that. Or if I wanted to take a black grill collection, color. You can add these tags, and then when you're making your collections, you can filter the collection by what you tag them as. So and then there it is. And then this is where you can put your collection page content. We'll do that in the SEO lesson. Just leave that blank for now. Don't worry about it. But when you're creating your collection, subdivide them by product type, sub product type. So if we're going to use, we'll have an outdoor cooking collection. We'll have an outdoor grill collection. We'll have a charcoal grill collection. We'll subdivide them by all these different product types, if that makes sense. We'll have an indoor cooking section, then we'll have like appliances, fridges, dishwashers. So just subdivide it as much as you can, have collections for all of them. Be careful to not make collection pages for product types you don't want, and to be careful not to spell them incorrectly. So if I spell charcoal grills incorrectly, what happens with SEO is the URL is defaulted to what you named the collection the first time. Just make sure you spell it right. Once we make our collections, you can go in your online store just to make sure everything's set up correctly. So you can have different collection structures in this theme. So you can change around how it's set up. I won't get too much into that. Um, I don't normally do that. So show breadcrumbs, what that means is like this. So it shows where you've been, home to here. By filter tag you can but just make sure that you make sure that you've 
tagged them right and spelled them right. Like if you have black girl and then like black girl with a missing C, they'll both show. Like just make sure that you keep it clean when you're tagging your stuff. Um, show sidebar, yes. Left. Promotional banner. No, definitely not. Um, thumbnails. So, yes, we want to align to height. So that means if we have a bunch of products here, they will all show up as the same height. Like one's not going to be this, and then the next one's like extra tall. We want to align to height, and we can want to make them reasonably big. Like that, I would say, is good. Products per row on desktop, we want to have three. Products per row on mobile, we have two. So if we're on mobile, and we only have one product per row, uh, sometimes it can get confusing, and the user might not know that they can even scroll. So we just want to have two to show that it's like a collection. Pagination, we'll have page links. So that means like, if there's 50 products on this page, once it gets to 39, so three per row, so 13 rows. No, oh, can't do that, I'm lucky. Um, once we get to 12 rows, it'll say like page two, and we can click it. Or you gotta have infinite scroll. So we'll just keep loading them if these are keep scrolling, which can get annoying if you have thousands of products on in like an all products collection. So I'll just do page links. Wide. Quick Shop essentially allows the user to shop from the collection page. I don't think I have it turned on right now, to be honest with you. It might be. Is this, is Quick Shop. I can see some details. That's really it for collection pages. Just gonna see what else here. It's a collection list. So this is when you have all your collections. I'm not even sure where this page would go. But um, you could put like all collections in your menu, like under home or something maybe. I'm not sure, I don't do that. But if I was, I would do, yeah. Page links, line to height. Wait, what? Yeah, there we go. You can do a little bit of an overlay, just so like the button stands out more. Pages, so these are like, you can have different structures. So these can be useful, like, you have like a brand story page, you can like, you can have a nice background image, your values, your products, um, which is cool. And the way that you, okay, so this is kind of uh, something I should mention. You see all these different page types. So it's like FAQ, contact. These are all just built into the theme I bought. Your theme may have different options. Um, but how you use these is when I go to pages, if I wanted to build a page that is about us, our brand story. If you see in the bottom here, there's default page. You see this? Um, it might be because this theme is not live. One minute. Yeah, so if I wanted to, to look a certain way, our story, and then I've actually never really done this much before, but So 
where'd the test test I put go? Okay, so it looks like you actually fill in the information here, which is a bit different because like, which is fine, but you would just have to do it here. And there's all these different options for you under pages. So like if you wanted to show off some images, it would be here. If you wanted to put like FAQ, they've got a built-in FAQ for you. You can change these, obviously. You can use different ones. But that's like a, a useful thing about uh, this theme. It comes with being a higher-end theme. So that's pages. So as we discussed, I think we said before we want to build um, an About Us page, a... Let's see. About us, contact us. About us, contact us. Maybe your brand story. Um, most of your policies and things like that are going to be in the policy section. So what you'll do is you'll go add page about us and a lot of what you include here can be what um, so I want you to put like from a message from the founder like why you founded the company so for example just to give you some ideas message from the founder our core values what we sell and what we our goal as a company And then just fill those in. Like I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna tell you what to put here. Like this is kind of you. Um, I would recommend going to other stores and and looking at what they've put here to get ideas. Eventually, we want to have a page for testimonials as well. So something like this. And most of the time when you get a review widget, you can just paste the code from the review widget here and um, it will give you a full review page. Kind of like, oh, these are expert reviews. like this. But like, obviously you're not gonna have that right away, but that will be something you wanna build eventually. Um, so reviews about us, about us and brand story can kind of do the same thing. Contact us, what we'll wanna do here is put the, assign the contact us page to contact. So when we're in the back end of our theme, pages, contact and see how it says assign to one page and then here need to get in touch um, here's our contact info phone email address and then you can have this form here and this will be hooked up to your Shopify email that you put in the back end and this will actually just send right to you I think that's good for now. 
says pages, blogs. Um, again, blogs are done here. We'll do some blogs in the SEO section later, but ideally we want to have like, it's kind of up to you. Um, best case scenario, we'll have two or three on your main categories to start. The thing with blogs is they will help you rank for SEO. So if you think of Google, what Google is looking for is for you to be knowledgeable about your topic. So it does not want you to just land based your store with what you're selling and not know anything about it. So a blog is a good way to show that you're knowledgeable about a specific product type, which will help you rank for SEO. And you can target keywords and stuff. People are not with uh, our kind of store. They're not going to go to your blog and buy. Don't think of it as that like blog is not directly going to buy sales, but draw blog can build authority for your store. And when you build black backlinks to your blogs, so what a backlink is, is we'll cover it more in depth in the SEO lesson, but a, a, a backlink is a, like in Google, every website has authority. So Google would have high authority, google.com blog expert medical reviewed research posts would have high authority and the more high authority websites within your niche that you can get linking to your website. Think of it as a big web. The more, your website is like a big web of the internet and the more high authority websites in your niche linking to you, the more authority you have, which will rank you higher, which will get you more organic search. So building blogs is a good way to do that. If you have a great blog, people will link to your blog. Um, Again, I'm not going to cover this now just because it's its own topic and I don't want to, I don't want to skim through something that is, is important, but like, I don't think you need anything to start, but, um, get your store up and going. And then once we get to the SEO lesson in module six or seven, I'll show you what to do there. But for now, don't, um, don't worry about this too much. Okay, so we don't want to have the shipping rate calculator because we're going to offer free shipping. And honestly, if ideally, if we can hide the footer, that will be even better for SC for uh, conversion rate purposes. Just when people get on this cart page, we would just want them to get off the page to the checkout as quickly as we can. You that looks bad. Okay, so what we want to do is go to, we want to go to theme settings and go to checkout. And we, we background image is like the whole thing. I would just, I usually just put a logo. Oops. It's not very clear. Like I would have a clear image there. That would be important. And accents, I would just do the color of your store. Um, like that. You just want this to be consistent colors for the rest of your store or the user will like think it's weird. Even subconsciously, like if I have a dark red store and like a green checkout, they'll think like, hmm, like that's weird and maybe think they're getting scammed or something. So just be careful that you use the same colors here. Um, pick your font. So I like Helvetica. All our terms are linked here that we made previously.
So I would wanna hyperlink these once I had built up those collections, obviously. But for now, I think that's good. Um, that will be it for this video. So the goal is just to go over the collection page structure, show you the different types of pages you can create in your backend here and how these should be set up. Um, I think that's it for now. Next module, we're gonna do a practice product upload. So how I would upload a test product. But for this, everything seems to be um, A-OK -okay for now. So I will see you in the next module and thank you for watching. Hi guys, so this is going to be a module on uploading a test product. One thing that I actually forgot to cover in the last last lesson that I'd like to do quickly is under favicon, um, see here how there's this like globe thing, it, it doesn't look very good. So what we wanna do is in Canva, Okay, so just pick a square image, like just do custom design. So, like that. And then what we wanna do is just pick like, this is the thing we wanna pick. So, I would just probably do a, probably just do like burgundy. into the right account real quick. Verification. I'm not sure if I like that at all, to be honest with you. Now the challenge of just somehow working a grill into this thing. Good work. Don't want to make it too complicated, though. No, 
I would honestly just rather the L. And then what you'll do is in that little favicon thing, just select image and then just drag the one. Looks like the one I just had did not download yet. Oh, it's because there's like a bunch of, that's why. See now, take that. Um, so that was just from the previous module, a little add-on portion, but um, now we're gonna do a product upload. So I did this previously as, okay, so you can A, take the hard route and you can go to these websites and try and find stock images of grills. This is the the legal way, grill. You'll see there is not much here. So I am not telling you to do this at all, but if it were me doing this, if it were me and you just were watching me on my screen do this, I would do this. Buy grill in Australia. I'd find a grill store in Australia. And this is actually a good way to see like how you can subdivide your stuff if you find a good store here. So barbecues. Okay, so I would take this image. So up, add product. Like this. <clears throat> and then I use this tool. You don't have to use it. I think you get a free trial. It's called Jasper AI. I guess it doesn't like me. <laughs> yeah, just brain, brain fur. Again, I already have an account of this, so I don't need to pay again. Let's go free AI writing tool, I guess, if that one's not going to cooperate with us. Product description. 
product name. So usually I would just say like, I, th I find city names is very easy when you're just doing demo products. So like the Chicago Grill, the Logical Chef Chicago. You can just actually put Grill, Chicago Grill. The Chicago Grill, just start it is a luxury grill backyard. It will have your guests. So always put brand names, just act like it's your brand. Chicago Grill. Don't have, you what you want to avoid is having big fat blocks of text because users will not read it. Um, one thing you can do is you can put images. This one does not have a ton of images available, but if you have a bunch, like what you can do to make your description look a little bit better is you can put images here, so you can go like... One thing to be careful with images is you always want to, you're going to thank me for this later, but you want to put alt text, so... Luxury cooking grill. Backyard, or even just barbecue. That's like an SEO thing, and just center it. And you can always see like how your product's going to look when you go preview. Um, I'm going to change this setup actually. So, and this is going to be like, you might have to contact whoever you buy your theme from to do this. And this is just a personal preference, but I do not like my product pages laid out like how it is right now. So what I prefer is, um, media position left show arrows yes so they can scroll magnify and hover yeah that can be good gallery is down here show thumbnails below enable thumbnail slider yes theme settings So this is if you have out of stock. Call us for availability at whatever your number is. So title, price, and then I think the form should go next. And this is just not a good example because we have inventory set to zero. So I'm going to fix that quick and then show you how it should actually look. So here we want to make our, so our price is what the user is going to buy for us. So let's just say 2999 Compare price is what would be crossed out next to it. So it's 3499 And we always want to have this. It gives the illusion of a sale. And our price, let's say it's 1500 Stock keeping unit. 
um, is a way to identify products and you have to get these right for them to show in Google Shopping. Um, so your supplier will give you this, but just because this is a demo product and just making it up. Chef Chicago Grill. Track quantity, yes. Um, you don't need to do any of this, honestly. If you had, okay, so let's say if there's one product, but there's multiple variants of the product. Say there's a grill, but it comes in black, red, gray, or there's a grill and it comes in 32 inches, 36 inches, 42 inches, whatever. This is where you do this. So option name, you would put size, and then values, you would put 32 inches, 36 inches, 42 inches. And let's say like it came in different sizes and different colors, you can add an option color, black, gray, red, etc. Now, every single variant, like every cross, every option will have its own skew. So it's put like your supplier will give you this. Here, let's just put one through 10, whatever we set it. We want to have inventory of these. So Usually I just set everything to in stock and list the shipping time on the product page, regardless of whether it's in stock or not, and do not capture the customer's payment until they are aware of when it's going to ship. So one, if a product is not in stock, let's say it's shipping in two months, the product page will say shipping in two months and the customer will, if they ordered the product that's shipping in two months, you would then before capturing their payment, you would call them and say, Hey, Product X is shipping in two months. Did you see this on the product page? And if they said yes, then you're good to go. You can process the order. If they said no, you would then just not capture their payment so the money would never leave their cart. Um, and if you have different colors of each option, you can attach it here. So when the user picks on the product page, it will scroll to that image, which is good. Do that for sure if, if um, you have the pictures of them. So just to give you So we would want to put all this stuff on the page. So usually how I like to form the thing is like this, a brief description and then um, product futures. Just do futures. And that's where you would put this kind of stuff. So like, unique burner system. Specifications where we'd want to put like all this. So make it look nice. We want to give the customer as much info as possible. So you'd like fill these all in. I'm not going to do it all now just for time, but you would fill everything in there under specifications and features. I would actually put these into the same one. So features and specs is like a heading three. And then I would do specs is heading four and then features is another heading four. So, um, and then you would go through and put all the, the features that it has with like images and stuff if you wanted um, there. Type. So we would put 
grill and we would tag this as like a freestanding grill, gas grill, whatever other subcategories you were doing. And I can now show you how to better set up the product page. I don't like our green sale logo, first of all. So colors, sale, that looks much better. So he, this is the price I put. This is the compare out price. Again, I don't like how it's so dark. They're so light. Like, hmm. And then these are our variant selectors that I created. So I can pick the size, the color. And uh, <laughs> I hate the heart on my add to cart button. Proceed to check out from cart, sure. Oh, that's the cart. I'm looking for the I would always do it bigger. And I would actually prefer to have these, you have to hire someone on Fiverr or something, but I would prefer to have these higher. Um, I would not want an icon. And I would not want the background to be You want it to be a, well, like a, obvious that they're actually putting their mouse over it. I don't know why this thing's not working right now. I don't honestly don't like how the this is white. A way to fix that is well buy it now, like essentially if I was logged into PayPal or Google Pay or something, this would be that button, which is really good. So um, you might have to hire someone on Fiverr to get custom code done or something if you want it to be different if, if that's how your default theme is set up. Um 
and within my form I would want to also move the add to cart button up here but that's kind of nuanced in the description we're hiding so the reason why I'm doing that is because I don't want it to be in one column like this And there's a way to fix this, actually. And your theme might not be default set up like that. Like, it might not be. It might not matter. Um, recommended products is always a good idea. And footer we want to show on our page for sure. I'm just going in my store to get the little piece of code that will allow us Computer's loading very slow. Oh man, time to get some faster internet. I actually can't even find what I'm looking for. I think I must have contacted the theme developer to do it. But ideally, like what we want is I would want to put the description. So like you can show it for now, but I would want it to be like below. Let's see if I can figure it out. Shopify product description liquid code. Not, do not count on this working, but we'll see. This is the name of my theme, move description to bottom.
There we go. It's there. So then what we could do is we would hide this one. And there's a description at the bottom. And it looks really bad because I do not have a header. Um, so usually with the app I use, it will just do it for you. You can make tabs. So you notice when I was doing the product description, I put features and specs as a heading three. So you can really do it however you want, but And see how it's put the things that I put as heading three as new tabs at the bottom here. So every time you want to start a new tab in the product description, you would put heading three. So if I wanted to make a new heading called like warranty or FAQ or something like that, whatever it would be these would now show up as new tabs in my thing like this. And you can design these however you want. You can put a red background, you can leave them like this, it's really up to you. And any info you have underneath will then show up there. I don't like how this is showing up actually, I don't know why my bullets didn't seem to work. I if I saved or fix it. That's where the bolts aren't showing up. But that is pretty much all for this module, I think. So what you want to do is you want to upload three to five products, test products of your main categories, and then put them in the collections and have them um, here. So when whatever your main collections are, you want to do three to five. I'm not going to do them for this video because that would take forever. But you want to do three to five, put them in your video, and then when you reach out to suppliers, you can be like, this is my demo store, and you can see how they look. And I put, this is just done automatically, which is kind of cool. But um, it will just help them get an idea of how you envision your store looking. Um, you're not going to ever use these products, but it just gives the supplier, um, they can visualize their products on your website when you do this which is good. And it's nice to have a good clean homepage and a nice about us page linked in the footer menu. Um, a nice brand story, like that kind of thing. You could put some element of that on your homepage. So here, like you put a bit about your brand down here, you'd put a bit about your brand. Um, you just want it to look like a somewhat built out website when you're contacting the suppliers. But that is all for this video. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it for this module actually. So next module will be contacting suppliers. So just, um, I haven't done this thorough enough because just for time, it's already been a super long module with long videos. So I don't want to go do this forever, but just have your website looking nice, clean, um, and happy to review it on a call with you or something before you reach out to suppliers and have three to five demo products with your collection set up uh, before you actually start doing that just for, um, 
just to look professional as possible when you're reaching out to these people and so they can envision their products doing well on your website. Uh, I hope that video is helpful and we'll see you in the next module. Hi, so this is going to be <clears throat> the last module in the store setup section. So just before we start, um, before we start the supplier reach out, we just want to review these points. So number one, we want to have a clean looking homepage. So we want to have the sections that I described. We have a nice hero section, um, the collections, a brand story section, and we want to have all of that done. A nice clean looking homepage with images and all the buttons working properly and your menu working right with your subcategories. We want that all to be done before we reach out to suppliers. We want to have a nice about us brand story page. So when they click about us, it's not just an empty page. You want to see your brand, your story, your values, everything like that. You want to have three to five demo products, um, like we discussed, with images um, look, linked in the proper categories, the collection pages on the menu, um, with just fake descriptions using uh, an AI writing tool of some sort, um, and using images, either just free stock images online or um, images from, you know what I mean. Not uh, recommended, but it's just easier, and that's what I would do. Um, collection set up properly in the menu and we wanted the last thing we need to do before we start reaching out is take our store password off so what that means is like if I were to go to an incognito browser right now it says this like opening soon but the, the password is on so we need to remove this and the way we do that is we go to preferences and you'll see there's this password so you could get in like I could get into the store with this password now but then we'll just take it off so now when I go to it's actually there So that's pretty much it. So we just want to have a nice clean looking homepage, nice about us brand story page, three to five demo products, collection set up in the menu properly, um, and store passwords taken off. So this should be the bare minimum. Um, nothing like blank or looking incomplete, but um, bare bones store just so they can see how you envision it set up um, and they can envision their products on your store when you, when you reach out to them. But that's all for setting up your store. If you have any questions, let me know. And I'll see you in the next module, which will be closing suppliers. Hi, so this this um, this module is going to be managing supplier relationships. So just want to make a couple points for you here. Um, don't just be another retailer. So what I mean by that is like, these people are inundated with requests to sell their stuff every day. Um, hundreds of kids, many just literally high school kids in their parents' basements wanting to make a quick buck. And they get annoyed with, they get annoyed with that. And that's honestly why you'll get denied most of the time is they think you're just another retailer. So that's kind of why this module, I'm going to structure things a little bit different and you're gonna to have to do maybe more work than most people would recommend you. I'm gonna have you make like a pitch deck and introduce yourself and call them and, and just do this right. And it's important that we do it this way. Um, we wanna have a good reputation with our retailers and we want them to be references for us. If we need, we want them to give us, if there's a big sale going on, you wanna be the first person they're letting know. Um, it's just important to build good relationships with these people. And this is something that I didn't do necessarily from the start. And it was because I was just trying to get as many suppliers as possible, but um, it's worth it. So first point, just don't be another retailer. Like have in your mind that you want to create relationships with these people. They're good people. Um, they're people. They're not just a retailer who you're going to make money off of. Like they're people with families and kids and experiences and can teach you stuff and have friendships with them. Um, keep that in mind for sure. Like I said, it's not only gonna benefit you from like just being a good person, but it will also help you business-wise. Like if, if there's a big sale, they'll be the first person on your list. If there's a product that is out of stock and it gets back in stock, you'll be the first person that they're letting know. I text many of my retailers. I, um, I'm kind of out of the business a, a, a bit now and that has affected this. But when I was really building up at the start, I would have um, weekly check-in calls with my top retailers. Um, just see how business was, check in on orders, make sure everything was going smoothly. 
and that really benefited me. So I'd recommend that you do the same. Uh, maybe it doesn't have to be maybe monthly. If you only have 10 suppliers who are really doing a ton of your sales, just schedule a check-in call once a month for like, what will happen is you'll have like a sales rep who's your point of contact with the retailer, with the brand. And once a month, just check in with these people, give them a call for 10 minutes, ask how business is. Um, if you have any order issues with your orders, just discuss with them. Um, Ask if they have any big sales coming up. If they ever see any inventory issues, just any any information that you can get that you wouldn't have gotten otherwise will benefit your business. So create relationships. Um, it's worth it. That's not only in, in, in this, but any business. Relationships are the foundation of everything. So um, take them seriously, do them right, treat people well, and you'll be treated well. Um, in re re recipro <laughs> reciprocity. Um, trade shows. So if you just literally Google trade shows of your industry, trade shows of girls, girl trade shows. I'll show you. This is a great way to meet suppliers. Um, if you want to get away for a weekend and there's one in a cool city, go to this. Go do something like this. Meet these people in person. Find your top brands on your supplier list and go meet them in person. It would be so easy to close them, to say that you're like, show up, be a professional, wear, wear a dress shirt, look nice, introduce yourself, you'll be able to close whoever you want in person. I've done that, or I haven't done that, sorry. I know people have done that, where like they've been denied and they've, that, they've been denied, 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 went to a trade show, met the supplier in person, closed right away. Um, I never did this, but I know people who have, and it's, they've, They've highly, highly rated about it. So just find them in your industry. Um, go meet these people. So this one's in Louisville, Kentucky. Looks like it may have, oh, 2023. Yeah, so whatever your industry is, go uh, meet people there. And even if you have retailers on board, you can go actually meet them in person and go for coffee and uh, grab a drink or whatever with them. Um, highly recommend. I haven't done it. I plan to do it um, in the future for sure when I'm building a new store, but something to keep in mind. So that's it for this module. Super short, uh, quick, just don't be another retailer, create strong relationships with your suppliers. Um, go to trade shows if possible and schedule check-ins with your retailers. Um, this is kind of just preliminary in nature. Like I'm going to go in to different modules on how to actually reach out to them, how to close them, what they're going to ask you, everything like that. But I just wanted, I thought this would be a good, uh, lesson to preface the module with just so you have the right frame of mind when you're going through the remainder of the videos. So that's it for now. Thank you for watching and we will talk soon. Okay, so this example, <laughs> this slideshow is going to be about um, creating your pitch deck. So like I said before, our goal here is to not just be another retailer. We want to separate ourselves and di differentiate ourselves and go above and beyond in the, in, the, in the supplier relationship process. And that starts right from the beginning. So when we go reach out to work with these people, we want to... Um, go above and beyond. Like what most people do is they're just sending email, hey, like I own so-and-so store, uh, can we sell your shit? Essentially, is what they say. So we don't want to do that. Um, we want to go above and beyond. We want to show that we're professionals, that we're high-end retailers, that we're serious about this, and that we are going to make their lives better. Because if think about it, if you're, if you're a brand and you have products, would you want someone who's not professional, who's just looking to make a quick buck sell your stuff? Of course not. Um, you would want people who are serious, who want bring value to the table, who are going to make your life better. Um, and sales is only one aspect of that. Of course, they want you to make a lot of sales, but they want to have a relationship with you. They want you to respect their product. They want you to respect the customers who use their product, etc. So, do not just um, do not just like prioritize the relationship aspect of this. And one way to do this is we'll create a pitch deck. So. What you're gonna do is you're gonna, the goal of the pitch deck is when we email them, um, we'll follow a sequence of, of how to reach out, how to close them, using the information we did for module two or three, the all the contact info and stuff. So what we're gonna do is we will have a pitch deck that will introduce yourself, it will introduce your brand, it will clearly state your core values of your brand, it will state your value proposition, and it will outline the benefits of working with you. And what you want is you want them, when they go through this pitch deck, to think that they would be absolutely stupid not to work with you. Um, like you want to only bring benefits to the table and you want them to have no concerns at all that anything bad's going to happen. 
Um, cause like, think about it. Like I said before, if you're not serious about this and customer has their product and they're not happy with it and say something's broken and, and you're the, and you're a bad retailer, maybe you're not answering the customer and the customer's calling them. And then all of a sudden, like their, your job is to, to take care of customer service. And then they're having to deal with customer service. Um, so this is why they're hesitant to work with people sometimes. So we just want to nullify any concerns they have and show them how uh, great of experience we're going to give them. So. I made an example pitch deck for you, and I do it in Canva. Uh, you can do it anywhere you really want, but you can actually do your recording studio here. So back to editing. Um, can I like look at this thing? Um, PDF. So you want to like essentially make one of these first. So this is, this is just a very, I made this in like 10 minutes. So, um, keep that in mind. Like you, you can make, I've had students already make theirs and they're way better than this. So don't think this is the be all end all. It's just an idea of what we want. So founder and backstory, who I am, some background on me. Why did I choose the luxury home cooking niche? Why does that make sense? Um, our marketing plans, we don't have cold traffic, we're on advertisements, cold traffic on these channels, which most people won't be doing. We'll have remarketing, we'll have a focus on reviews and word of mouth, and I should have actually put SEO here as well. Because SEO is the real winner for them. Because if you can get a bunch of organic traffic to your website, that's people that wouldn't have saw their stuff otherwise. Why lost on your Google Ads? So essentially what we're doing here is we're just trying to show like how much money is actually being spent on this stuff. And if they don't prioritize this and get every dollar on these channels they can, that other people will pass them. So just like kind of highlighting a pain point for them. Our core values, top trick service, luxurious style, enthusiasm, entrepreneurialism. These are kind of like personalized to me, what I would like to do. Yours will be to you. Um, don't copy mine, just use what you think works best for you. Maybe there, maybe some are the same, maybe some aren't. Um, do what works for you. So our value proposition. So we give them free advertising dollars for their stuff to help grow their brand. We completely outsource their customer service, never have to deal with the customer again. We will look after them. Obviously, we'll be a go-between and we'll have questions for them with warranties and, and arranging shipping and, and repairs and stuff like that. But largely, like we will be the one interacting with the customer. Um, we will gain access to e-com experts. Um, they will. So in, in this program with me, with uh, other people in the mastermind that we're creating right now, you will have access to some of the top minds in all these areas that they're that will be marketing their brand and that they would not have ad, had access to otherwise. These people that you will have access to in trainings would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars for this brand to hire, and they won't be able to do that. So you you will be giving them access, their brand access to experts that they would not have access to. Make sure you highlight that. The best CRO, the best SEO, the best uh, like they can't afford to hire all these people. All these people work as entrepreneurs because they do not want to be employees. So the only way that they will get access to the people is by hiring themselves or for free through us. So that is big, big value prop as well as this and this. Um, why I work with us? I don't like how I did this page. This looks horrible. But um, essentially we're just going a little bit deeper into the previous points. Um, just want to like include a slide about that. Scale your brand. Um, so you don't want to put this. You want to put like, let's partner and scale your brand. I don't know why I did brand name because you don't want to do this, redo this every brand, just put your brand. Um, thank you for listening. Have your contact info, whatever else. And what you should do is create a, so I'm gonna attach this in the, in the lecture, in the lesson below. But you want to create, you want to put on a dress shirt, and you want to have a video much like I have right now with your face right here, and you want to introduce yourself, look at right at the camera, and speak to them, and tell them, present your, your pitch deck to them, and tell them why they should work with you. Um, don't say, like, can we work with you at the end? Like, just say hi in an email, and I'll give you the template, um, and you'll just attach this and say, hey, can you please watch this? Um, I'd love to work with you. If you have a chance to chat, let me know kind of thing. You don't want to say like in the video, let us work with you. Like, no, just, um, thank you for listening. Introduce yourself, introduce your brand, introduce your values, explain your value proposition. And, um, yeah. And then 
can just ask them to hop on a call or um, say that you'd love to be a retailer of their products in the email, which I'll give you a template for. But that's it for this module. Uh, make this template. I use Canva. You can use Google Slides. Uh, Canva's just got some nice templates. Um, and it even has a recording studio, which I wasn't aware of. But it doesn't really matter. You get the idea. Um, thank you for watching, and I will see you in the next lesson. Welcome to this module. So full disclosure, this is not something that I did when I was building my store. Um, it's a good example of, I've tweeted about this a couple times, this concept, but the cross application of skills. So lots of people know e-commerce and lots of people have e-commerce stores. Um, lots of people have agencies, lots of people um, know how to build those. But this is a concept that I learned from building my agency that now I can apply to e-commerce. So like I said, this is not something I did when I was building my store, but this will make your life a thousand times easier and it will make you so much more organized and to be able to close more suppliers. Because with an agency, a lot of what, the way you get clients is outreach and closing people through outbound methods, which most e-commerce people wouldn't be familiar with. So a lot of those skills end up being very valuable here. Um, I'm just gonna show you a quick example of how to do this. So you can use Trello, you can use Pipedrive, you can use Monday.com, it doesn't really matter. This is free, so I just wanted to use this for now. So you have your big list of suppliers for module two and three. And I would recommend when you're reaching out, don't reach out to your top suppliers right away. Reach out to ones that you that are lower on your list, that you don't care if you close, like that don't have a ton of demand, that maybe even don't enforce map, just so you can get some reps in when you're doing the pitch deck and you can adjust. Um, if, if they're not, if the pitch deck isn't working, you can adjust it. If you can adjust your presentation, um, you can adjust your follow-up call structure kind of thing. But um, whenever you're reaching out to people, so qualified will mean that you're reaching out to them because they met the criteria that we outlined in the module, in modules two and three. So let's say I'm doing Napoleon Grills. Think of the lead as when I say lead, think company. And when I say contact, think person. So you can have multiple contacts at the same lead multiple contacts at the same company. So when I go in this, um, what you'll do is you'll put in the contact name, CEO name, whatever his name was, CEO phone, CEO email. Many of the CRMs will actually have a thing that you can like a, a section for this exactly. But just because this is the free trial, there's not one. But anyway, you'll have all the information there that you're reaching out to. And then like once they're qualified, like they meet the criteria, you wouldn't have had them on the list if not. When you send them the pitch deck, you'll move them here. And let's say you send it today. Um, so to remind yourself to check up, what you'll do is schedule a set due date reminder. So due date, you could say due date, like technically means follow up four days from now or something. And then it will remind you on October 4th that you need to follow up with them if you haven't heard. So then when you, if, if you haven't heard by then and you need to follow up with the CEO and give them a call, I will outline this, this sequence I recommend for like reach outs um, in another module, but I just want to show you how you see your CRM. So when it was time to follow up, then you would move the follow up call and then follow up call two. And then if you haven't been rejected, there's no such thing as rejected. There's future follow up. Close means we got them on board. If you haven't been told yes or no by this point after two follow-up calls, you can't get a hold of someone, then just go back to the beginning and start at the second person, so the head of e-commerce or the CMO or whoever it is, and work your way back through the pipeline again. Um, but it's just a very good way to track your progress with suppliers and not um, forget to follow up, because some will say follow up in two months, so you could just schedule, um, like if some said to follow up with me in the spring of next year, I would just go, no worries, gladly. And then my, I would just move them to like future follow-up. And it would just be nice and organized there. And it has the date that I'm supposed to follow up there. So this would be very, very good for tracking your suppliers and closing as many as possible over time. Um, very, very important. And I think that it, uh, it will add a ton of value for you. And like I said, not every supplier is going to want to work with you right away. Some will for sure. But um, over time, like over a year, you should be able to close well over half of the ones on your list using this process by continually following up every couple months and just staying consistent, um, not being pushy, but being professional, following up um, kind of thing. Just uh, stay on top of it and stay organized using something like this. And yeah, you can use Trello. This is a free version. 
one thing I would recommend is if you think that you're going to use a paid version eventually, like on my, I use money.com for my stuff. Um, pipe drive is very good. Close is a great CRM. Um, whatever you're using, it would probably, I think they can, like a lot of them can, you can integrate with each other. So you could like import this drive to another one, but it's probably easier if you just pick what you think that you actually use long-term, if you're familiar with one from the start. But hopefully that help. that's helpful, and I'll see you in the next module. Hey, everyone. So this video is going to be on supplier outreach, so the script in sequence that I recommend you follow. So I think the first thing that I want to make clear is there's not a right way to do this. There's just what I've done, what I've had success with, and um, what I've seen other people do and have success with. So the most important thing is to just keep an open mind to be willing to experiment and try different things and see what works best for you in your industry. Um, so don't take this as the be all end all. Um, keep a flexible, adaptive approach. If, if your gut's telling you to do something a certain way, um, try it out. But um, I guess the one caution I would have is if you're just thinking, oh, I'll just email them, I'm not going to call them. Don't do that. That's kind of just avoiding doing the hard part that will get you the best results. Um, but just be flexible, try everything, and see what works best. So what I would recommend is that you go on, like the previous module we got, everyone's contact permission. So I would recommend you just call the CEO first and just say your name, um, where, what company you work with, and just ask, um, say that you're interested in becoming a retailer of their products and just see what they say. So for example, um, hi, I'm Brooke. I'm calling from Brooke's store. I'm the owner and CEO here. Um, we're really interested in becoming an online retailer of your products. Can you please explain the process uh, to me of how to, how to do that? And just kind of see what they say. Um, so I would recommend doing that first. And then when you say that, just say that you've also prepared a pitch deck, um, just kind of introducing yourself and your brand and, and some of your core, core values. And um, just ask if he minds, just, or he or she minds, if you send it over, um, if they could watch through it for a few minutes. You just ask for your few minutes of their time and and um i don't think they'll mind doing that like it's not really a big ask if you just ask them to to watch through a a, a brand powerpoint so you call him or her first and ask to send them the powerpoint if you send it if you can't get a hold of them then i would just wait and just try back a day or two later if you can't get a hold of them and they said that they'll watch um send it to them obviously so that would be kind of the first contact and then i would wait two or three days later um, three if it's like over a weekend and, and two if it's in the middle of the week like Tuesday or Thursday and I know it says three I'll change it but then just kind of follow up and say hey uh, wondering I have a script for this that you can follow I'm wondering if you had a chance to watch my video and I would follow up with the same person twice and then if they're not answering for whatever reason or they're not giving you a yes or no then go to the next person so if it was the CEO then we go to the head of e-commerce or the CMO or the director of marketing or something like that and do the same thing and you want to just keep reaching out to a company until they tell you yes no or call us later in two months or something like that we want an answer we want a definite answer we don't want to just leave it on us being ignored so I'm just gonna kind of show you the sequence I put together so this kind of assumes that so I guess related to this point, if you, if you try and call them, you can't get a hold of them, wait a couple days, try again, you can't get a hold of them. Eventually you could just send an email that looks something like this, like hi, name, so CEO name. I'm the owner and CEO of your store. We are in your commerce brand that in the whatever niche you are. We're in the process of partnering uh, with new suppliers in the blank niche to build out this section of our store. My team has been doing research for the last month and we believe that your brand would be a high potential partner to add to our collection, to our grow collection. We are confident that we can play a large role in growing their brand name with our established customer base, email list. Okay, so I guess this is kind of what I would use now, um, but you can just change this around to what you would do. So with our, going the brand, with our omni-channel marketing strategy, Plan for customer success and strong branding. Something like that. Just a few things that, just a few strong points, a few points of value. Could you please connect me with the person to speak with about opening up an online retail account? I've attached a video introducing myself and my brand for your review, which is where you'll attach your PowerPoint pitch deck. If they have any 
if you have. If you have any further questions for me, please have a look. Please book a call with me. I would say something like that. Um, if you do get a hold of them on the phone, so if you do speak to them, you just say you're going to sit over the pitch deck, assuming did not speak with on the phone. If you did speak with them on the phone, just say hi, name, CEO name. chatting with you as discussed I've attached our brand PowerPoint I've attached our And then you want to have like a strong CTA, so please advise me next steps and how we can get set up as an online retailer. Thank you for your help. Just something super simple like that. So this is if you did not speak them on the phone. This is if you did. And then after this, if they do not answer, email to, hi name, did you get a chance to review my video? We don't want to never say following up or bumping this to your top of your inbox or something. Don't use those terms. It sounds needy. We don't want to sound needy. Like we want to, we want to have the frame of mind that they are lucky to be working with us. Like we're giving them free advertising dollars. We're giving them outsourced customer service. We're doing all this stuff for them. So don't have the frame of neediness. Like just, they are lucky to be on your store. So hi, name. Did you have the chance to review my video? We've recently partnered. If you have, so if you've partnered with one of their brands, another brand in the space, and like you've made a couple quick sales or something like that. You can say like we partner with one of their competitors and we've had a ton of really success in the blank niche. Can you please let me know how to open up an online retail account? If you didn't do this, then you could just say, hey, did you have a chance to review my video? Can you please, and then you could just take this line out. So optional. Or even if you haven't made a sale, you could say partner with one of their competitors and like then when you when they go on your website, they'll see their competitor on your store. Like that could help. Um, and then lastly, if they don't answer this, hi name, I'm very confident we can add to invite your brand, help grow your sales unit, or omnichannel marketing strategy, and customer retention based approach. Is there someone else that I should contact about opening up an online retailer account? Let me just actually just leave it at that. Just put your name. So that would be the sequence I would follow. Obviously, this is just sorry, no sees. Bless me. Um, so that would be the approach I would follow on email. And then like, if they don't answer this, then you could just start, go to the next person. And obviously we want to be using the CRM as I discussed in the earlier video throughout this process and just tracking, um, setting reminders to follow up and setting, um, just staying on top of everything. And if they say like, reach out in two months, then you can schedule a reach out in two months. We just want to make sure we're organized um, and on top of all this stuff. So I will attach this below the video so anyone can access. Um, but that should be kind of like the basics of how I'm just in the sequence going. The most important thing is to just be flexible. Um, keep an open mind. Don't uh, take this as be all end all. Try different things. See what works. You'll probably find like what, like this I just made up myself. Like this has not been like this is what I was doing from day one. This is just what has evolved for me to work the best over time. But um, Maybe something else will work different for you. I'm not sure. It probably depends on your store, on your niche, and on your personality. So, um, like I said, just stay flexible, have a dynamic approach, and uh, be open to testing new things. And kind of whatever is working, just try and do more of, of whatever is working and try and constantly just refine your approach and improve your close rate over time. But I hope that helps, and I will see you in the next video. Hey, everyone. So this is a video on common supplier questions. Um, just going to run through them and, and kind of give sample responses is what I might say. 
So one thing they might ask is, are you an online retailer? In that, you will say yes, but do not say that you drop ship. Um, never mention drop shipping. So if they ask like what your model is, if you have a showroom or a warehouse or something like that, say no that you're an online only retailer. But you could say something like sometimes I've said like things like, oh, yeah, we're an online only retailer, but we're open to warehousing products um, if things go well, which is the truth. Because let's say you have a bestseller and um, like a really good selling product. And let's say there's the supplier warns you like you're selling really well for them and they warn you in advance of Q4. We only have 50 of these products left. They're probably going to go to stock. What you could do is you could buy 30 of them go put them in a 3PL warehouse and then you just reserve them so you don't go out of stock for your customers. I've heard of lots of, I've never really done that myself, but I've heard of, um, I've heard of lots of people doing things like that and, and I have considered it. I think with the one brand I wanted to do it for, they, they wouldn't let me, but I considered it at one point. But the main thing here is don't mention that you drop ship and just say that you're open. Like even if you don't now, just say that you're open to warehousing in the future if things go well. Like say that, um, it's a possibility, like don't close it off. And also same for showroom. Say like, yeah, you're open to having an in-person showroom down the road. Uh, you don't right now, you just wanna focus on online retail because your expertise is in online marketing and e-commerce. So you wanna focus on what you're strong at since you're just starting. Say something like that. Um, what's your marketing plan? So you can kind of go through what I put in the example pitch deck. So we wanna say that we have an omni-channel approach on all platforms. So Google, Bing, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok, like you want to say everything um, and say that you plan to remarket to everyone on all of these channels, Pinterest. Um, it, but the big thing you want to mention that will kind of differentiate you from other people is say that we're going to have a big, big focus on SEO. So what, the reason for that is because in the paid ad space, there's only so much real estate at the top of the screen. So if all of their products are already there when someone searches their product, then you're not providing any more value, even though those are the most profitable ads. So the way that they will get more value from you is if one of two things, you, you can have an effective advertising strategy on high funnel terms. So let's say there's a grill brand called Napoleon Grills. If, you, if, if someone types in Napoleon Grills, the whole top of the screen will be Napoleon Grills. So if you are also there, it's not like you're making extra sales from them. You're just taking sales from someone else, taking money from one supplier or one store and going to you. But if someone types in grill and there's 50 different grill brands at the top of the screen and you are betting on the term grill and putting their brand there, you are putting their brand somewhere where it wouldn't have been if it wasn't for you. So that's valuable to them. And the other way to, so that's one way is having a high funnel marketing strategy that works. And the other way is through SEO. So ranking high on page one of Google for these generic terms such as grill, such as 32 inch grill. And when you rank for those terms and you get customers on your website for those kind of terms, then you are exposing their brand to customers that they would not have been exposed to otherwise, unless you were a retailer of their stuff. So that's what they want. They want you really emphasize the fact that you will be bringing them new customers through high funnel ads and SEO that they would not have had exposure to otherwise. Because then if you frame it like that, they would be stupid not to work with you. Um, if they ask how long you've been in business, you can list any previous business experience you've had. So if I was starting a store tomorrow, I would say, oh, I have an e-commerce store for the last year and a half and we've built it up to this much, but this is a brand new project and we're passionate about this niche, whatever. Um, so if you have any previous experience doing this or if your job sounds like it could be somewhat relevant or that they would be impressed by it, make sure you highlight it for sure. Like when I was in law school, I would say that I was studying corporate law and this was just kind of a side project to make income. Just you kind of like want to paint yourself in the best light possible especially as a new business. So make sure you do that. If they ask how many sales you have, just say that you're pre-launch, you've prepared a demo store, uh, you have your marketing plan in place, team in place, everything's in place, but you're actually just pre-launched and you wanna partner with um, a bunch of high-end suppliers before you actually launch your store. Just like, never just say zero or how long have you been in business? Uh, never, how many sales you have? None, like don't do it like that. You wanna like paint yourself in a good light. And you don't want to lie, but you want to like at least frame yourself in the best light possible. So how long have you been doing this? Um, this business is just starting, but I have X, Y, Z experience and we're confident in our plan because of X, Y, Z. How many sales do you have? Um, we're actually just looking to partner with premium suppliers before we launch our store. At this point, we're pre-launch. Both completely true and paint you in such a better light than just zero. How many employees do you have? Um, 
right now, like if you have a VA, you could say we have a, a small team right now on the back end, customer service, but we'll be planning to build out a team of close to 10 over the next six months. This frame it in the best light possible. So rather than saying how many employees do you have zero, say um, we have a small team right now or we're pre-launch right now, but we're planning on building out this in the future. So you paint the better outcome in the future in any type of question. What else do you sell? So you could say, if you're reaching out to a grill brand, you could say, um, we want to, we're specializing in grills, but in the future we see we could also list other things like cooking appliances and pizza ovens and ex whatever else is related to your store. What's your advertising budget? Say, uh, we're planning on starting with um, three to five thousand a month. We're investing in X, Y, Z, and SEO, and over time this will increase, and we plan to increase our budget as much as we can while staying profitable to scale. Um, credit terms. So oftentimes when a supplier, so in traditional business, like if you were warehousing, they would give you credit terms. So they would ship the items to your warehouse and you would have 30 days, like it's called net 30. So you have 30 days from when they arrive to pay for the items, um, which means that you have to have good credit or they will not want to work with you. But in drop shipping, we do not need credit terms because we just pay on a credit card upon order. So you can just say, oh, we do not want, we don't need credit, say we prepay for our items because that eliminates any risk essentially on their part. So say you have, uh, you, 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 you prepay and you do not need credit terms. Um, so that's kind of the majority of the main questions I can think of that they'll answer, ask you. But overall, I think the most important thing here is to just use that principle I said is don't, when they ask you a question, don't just answer it with a one word answer. Like you wanna be honest, be truthful, but then also paint yourself in the best light possible and finish on a positive. So rather than how many sales do you have, um, like think of, think of how much different this sounds when you end on a positive compared to a negative. How many sales do you have? Oh, we plan on launching in the next six months, but right now we have zero. It sounds horrible versus how many sales do you have? We plan on growing this, or right now we don't have any, we're pre-launch, but in the next six months we plan on growing over six figures. Sounds way better. So just always answer your questions that way. Um, that should be all for this video. There's a couple more in this module on suppliers, but those are the main questions. And if you have, um, there's no way that we can tell in advance everything that's going to be asked. So if you ever have questions, of, like a unique question that someone's asked you or something, just put it in the, the channel on Slack and we can address it then on how we could have responded to it. But um, that's pretty much it for this lesson and we'll see you in the next one. Hi everyone. So this module is on what happens after a supplier agrees to work with you. So it's really simple. Um, it won't take, won't be a long lesson. Essentially, I send you an application form that should say order submission process, and I'm just going to go over what you should ask for. So they'll usually send you a dealer application sheet, which is just like it'll ask for your name, your address, your business name, your business address, um, just basic, basic info like that. There will usually be, for I guess a lot of the time, there will be a portion that says credit terms in banking information or bank references or even other supplier references. And the purpose of that section is because, as I mentioned in the previous module, a lot of the time if you're warehousing, you'll need credit terms to work with them. So what that form is is just assessing your credit worthiness. But you can literally, what I do is I just exit off a big line through it and just put at the top prepay payment terms. And they they won't ask twice if you just put prepay payment terms. So that means that before the item leaves their warehouse, you're paying for it on credit cards. So there's no risk for them. Like they don't need bank references. They don't need supplier references. They don't need any of that stuff. So don't worry about it. Um, the dealer application sheet is all just very simple, like your name, business, where you're located. Um, if you're not located in the US, just make sure you emphasize that you are your company is in the US and make sure you, you put your EIN number um, they often, sometimes, not always, I would say like one would probably be four or five lost for a resale certificate. So I would say just pick a state. If you go on taxjar.com, I'm not an accountant or a lawyer, so I can't give you like hard and firm tax advice. But what you want to do is just go on taxjar and it takes 10 minutes to register. You just got to get a resale certificate in any state. Some of them work for all states. So that's the one I would pick, assuming you don't have a, a you don't live in the U.S. If you live in the U.S., then just do the one where you live in because you have a nexus there anyways and you have to pay tax in that state anyways. But assuming you're not in the U.S., then you just want to pick one state that works for all. And there, I think there's 10 of them that do. 
and that is kind of the state where you would be registered in. Don't do this until you get asked. Like I don't think I got asked until my 15th supplier or something. Um, and I, I, okay, I'm not a lawyer, not accountant, but you don't need, legally need one. Like when they ask for a resale certificate from a store that is not based in the US, they're confused because most stores in the US have, obviously the person lives in the US, so they need this. But you do not need one as an international store. Technically, if you ask an accountant, that's what they'll tell you, you just need an EIN. So the first thing you can do is say you are an international corporation and you do not need one because you have an EIN and you file taxes to your own government. That's what you would say. And if they disagree with you and tell you that you still need one, then you can still register in a state that will give you one for all. And you can just file taxes in that state um, once a year, I believe it is. Summer once a year, summer monthly. I'm not sure. But get just type in state resale certificate and pick one of the 10 that work for all of them. And if you go on tax chart, it will tell you which ones that is. I think uh, Wyoming is one, Nevada might be one. I'm not sure. But that's kind of the main thing is... If they ask you for a resale certificate, if you're from the U.S., you should have a resale certificate in the state you live in. If you're not from the U.S., you don't technically need one, but you need an EIN, um, which I think we went over in one of the first modules. So you give them that and say that you're an international corporation and you do not need one because you file taxes to your own government. Um, that said, you can establish a nexus. So there's two ways to establish a nexus. One is you live in a state, you have a warehouse in a state, you have employees in a state, which if you're international, you likely won't. The second way is an economic nexus, where once you pass a certain, certain threshold of sales in the trailing 12 months, you have established an economic nexus. So in most states, that is $100,000 of sales in that state in the previous 12 months. So once you pass that, you're required to register regardless. But obviously, that's a, uh, a good problem to have, and hopefully one you have down the road. Don't worry about that now. Um, but that's pretty much it. So if they ask you for it, say that you either give it to them if you live in the U.S., or B, if you're not from the U.S., tell them that you're an international corporation, give them your EIN, and say you file taxes to your own government. If they press on it, then you can get one. Um, so credit terms, you're just going to X off and put prepaid terms. And what you should ask for. So on your end, you should ask for a pricing sheet with MSRP, which manufactured manufacturer suggested retail price. So what they recommend selling the item for, MAP. So usually MSRP will be the highest price. And then it will be crossed off on your store with the MAP price, like the lowest one you can sell for. And then there should also be your price. Um, ask them how shipping works. I forgot to put this on the list, but I'll put it in below the module. Just make a note before I forget. Um, Ask them how shipping works. So I would say out of the 50 suppliers I have now, I would say roughly 40 of them give me like landed shipping costs to the user in advance. So that means like when I sell an item to the customer, I already know what it's gonna cost me to get it to them in advance. Like it's, it's just a set amount, like $500 shipping or some of them just include it in the item price. Like if I sell an item for $2,000, it's just $1,500 landed to the user regardless of where they are. But there will be some that they have variable shipping. So they will send you a quote for shipping. And then you have to pay it depending on what it is. So then the item would be, let's say, $1,200. You sell it, make a $2,000 sale. The item costs you $1,200. But the shipping could either be $150 or $600, depending where the customer is. So variable shipping. Ask them which one of those they use and get clear on it before. If they use variable shipping, you need to make sure that they will send you a quote for the shipping before they process the order. Because if not, you could get stuck with a loss because the shipping is insane, insanely priced or something like that. So make sure if they have variable shipping, say that you would like to be notified of the shipping cost before they ship it and confirm the order because otherwise you just refund the customer and say it's out of stock and give them their money back if um, the shipping is gonna be too high. Um, so you want an inventory list of the items that are in stock. And ideally, most of the time, they'll just tell you for like product information, sizing, pictures, they'll just tell you to look on their website. But you could just ask like if you have any creative assets or pictures or info that is, or even guides, like product guides, seasonal product guides or something that is not on their website, if they could send that to you. If there is, so if, if, there, if they have like 50 to 100 products, it's not a big deal. You just list them all. But let's say if a brand has like 5,000 products or something like that, you could ask them for a list of their best sellers, especially when you're starting like a product uploading is, is time consuming. And if you don't have a VA to do it or other people to help you, it's very time consuming. So um, 
you would just ask them for a list of their best sellers. What I would do is probably take like the 50 best sellers and 50 highest priced items and list them on my store to start. Um, that would be kind of like an approach if they have a ton, ton of products, then you can just slowly add the rest over time as you build out your team and hire and stuff. And there is a way you can actually figure this out on your own. So let's say I'm selling fire pits and I'm on this store. So essentially you just wanna find another store that sells the brand you have. So to give you, give you an example, let's say I closed Outdoor Great Room Company. I would just go to this, find a store that sells Outdoor Great Room, and then I would just filter by best sellers for whatever product I'm doing. So I wonder if I can just go Outdoor Great Room here. So this would be all 552 of their products. Fire tables. Brand. Outdoor great room. And then these would be the best sellers. So these is this is where I would like start uploading. But overall, um, yeah. So application sheet, credit terms you do not need to put. You prepay. You can ask them their order submission process. So sometimes they'll give you a portal where you can just go on and place the order yourself. Other times they'll just ask for an email. So you'll just send them an email with. Um, I'll actually make a sequence or a script for this as well. So usually it would work like this. Hi, brand name, orders team, please submit the following order. Product name, product variant, so like color, size, whatever else, however many, there could be like five of these variants, SKU, customer shipping address, so you'll put your customer name, customer shipping, delivery address, Customer phone number, they will need a phone number. Customer, to call the customer when it arrives. Customer name, delivery address. Get this on the main page. Phone number. Um, And then you can do sometimes, oftentimes in the application form, they will ask you for, um, they'll have the application sheet and then they'll do a, a credit card form where they sense that they're asking for you to put a credit card on file that they can just charge every order you put so you don't have to submit it every time. So billing info, you could just put, once if they have that, you would just put charge the card ending in whatever four digits is on your card that they have on file. If not, you can just tell them your billing address, billing phone, and then just put like a picture of your credit card or something. Um, if you don't feel comfortable doing that on email, you can just call them and give it to them. Um, but usually like I would just do a picture of the card info and then just say, please keep this card on file for future orders.
And then I always say at the end, please confirm with me that you have received this order. If you have any questions, please let me know. So just like that. So that will just be in the same template as the other one. But I think that's all for this video. If you have any questions, let me know. And we have one more in this module, so I'll see you in the next section. Hi everyone, so this is the last video in the supplier relationships module. Um, just gonna go through these things. So with your best suppliers, you obviously wanna prioritize those relationships over the ones you are making any sales with. And that will be something that takes some time to figure out. So with your best suppliers, I recommend having check-in calls. So every like two weeks, every month, just send them a, an email or text and just say like, how's business going and check in with them about any sales or like upcoming inventory issues they see, just like a general check-in, how's it going chat. Um, once you get like 50 suppliers, it's, it becomes impossible to do that with everyone. But if you're starting, and even if you're not making a ton of sales, you might as well just get in the habit of doing that with your suppliers. Um, you can, if you really want to impress them, you can send them like a holiday gift basket or something like that. You can um, get their phone number and like text them and, um, ask about any sales or deals, whatever they have going on. Like just, I guess, have like genuine relationships with them as much as you can. Um, if you do, they can make your life easier. Like if something goes wrong with an order, they can have your back. And, and um, like maybe if, if something would be your, something you're responsible for, maybe they'll help cover it for, for one if you're like on really good terms with them and you have a close relationship to them. So it's just obviously never going to hurt you treating people well and having good relationships with them. So just do that, have check-in calls. Um, you can go to trade shows. So if you just look up US trade show, if you're located in the US, you can just look up like US trade show for whatever niche you sell in and just see if there's any by you or if you want to take a trip to one for a weekend, you can actually go meet them there in person. I haven't really done that, but um, something that I would be open to doing in the future. And yeah, just kind of overall just form genuine relationships I would remember having. I recommend having a board with all of your suppliers in like a list with all of their like your main contacts. So usually you'll have a main contact, like the head of e-commerce or whatever it will be, have like the main contact, their phone number, their email, and you can just schedule like check-in calls with them or whatever and, and just stay on top of things. But overall, um, this is pretty much just genuine, genuine relationships, being a good person. Um, nothing else really to say here other than that. Um, very much common sense that I'm sure you'll all do fine with. But that's it for this module, managing suppliers. The next module is setting up your ads. So I will see you in that. Welcome to this video. So this is going to be in the supplier onboarding module. So supplier sheets is essentially after you get a supplier to agree to work with you, they will send you over a number of different sheets that you need to fill out before you can start selling their products. So I've just listed out the various ones that you often see, and I'm just gonna go through some examples with you. So a dealer agreement is essentially um, just your agreement to work together. It's like a contract, essentially, that says your roles, who's responsible for what. Um, it just kind of lays out the terms of your agreement. Um, I don't know why I have pricing sheet on here twice. But pricing sheet will have all the products that you can list with their prices. Sometimes they'll give you a product information sheet that has the dimension, specification, shipping, everything like that on it. But sometimes that will be included on the product sheet itself. Uh, dropship agreement, sometimes they'll send you that. Sometimes that's included in the dealer agreement. Map agreement is essentially just saying that you agree to abide by their map policy. And sometimes they'll also send you an inventory sheet um, as well. So I'm just going to try and actually pull up some examples for you. And we'll fix this one here. So here is an example of a map agreement. So essentially just saying that I agree to abide by their map policy. I have to just fill in my company name, my signature, and the date. It's very simple. 
This is what a price list may look like. So we'll have this, this, the model is usually what you will use as the SKU in Shopify. Um, the cost is your cost tariff. I'm not sure what that means. It's usually just an additional cost either for expensive freight at this time or something like that. But um, overall, your cost with both of these. So, and then this is what you list at. And then this is the model. So this is one model. These are various sub product types of this model. So I'll show you how that I would recommend uploading that. There's not a right or a wrong way. But essentially you can make this one product in Shopify with various variants underneath it. Um, so that would be an example of a price sheet. Sorry, my computer's freezing. This is a product information sheet. Sorry, it's just loading, taking forever right now. So they'll give you the SKU, the product title, and then they'll also put this information in there somewhere. I don't know why my laptop's not working. So it'll have the info, images even, that you can use from Dropbox, everything like that. And lastly, this is a dropship agreement. So usually you'll have to see if this company is asking for a copy of your sales tax. Um, so if you were not from the US, you could say that you don't need one because you pay your government tax. Um, and oftentimes they'll keep a card on file. So you'd have to fill this out and then every time they send an order to them, you simply, they just simply will confirm with you and they'll already have the card so you don't have to resend it from scratch uh, every single time or anything like that. It's much easier. So how do we cover them all? So you do sell you a dealer agreement, pricing sheet, product information, dropship agreement, map agreement, and sometimes, which I haven't shown you, they'll show you like a sheet that looks very much like the pricing and profit info sheet. We'll just have their inventory that they have available right now. Um, but again, very much the same. So that's usually what they'll send you. So usually you just need to send it back to them. Um, and then I would also recommend you create a Google Drive folder that is called dealer agreements and just make a copy of all of them and make a different folder for every brand that you work with and put all the agreements and stuff for each brand in those folders. You probably won't ever look at them again, but it's just nice to have um, and convenient to have should you ever need them. They're all in one place and organized. So I'd recommend doing that when you do start bringing on suppliers um, just to make your life easier. But those are the overview of the agreements. Just uh, provide them what they need, send them back, communicate with them. It's usually super easy. Uh, that's all for this video, and I'll show you how to up onboard suppliers in the next. Welcome to this video. So this video, we're just briefly going to touch on creating a supplier database. We briefly mentioned it last video, but we just want to create a Google Drive uh, with different folders for every supplier in all of their agreements. And then I also recommend creating a table on your CRM or project management tool with just some quick information that will make your life far, far easier. So I'm just gonna show you examples of both. So for your drive, it should look something like this. You'll have your main drive, you'll have one called supplier agreements, you know, supplier one, supplier two, with all the different information and sheets that you've submitted to them under each. And then on Notion, I've made this. So you should have each dealer that you work with, they should have their own row. 
And within each row, you'll have a link to their current inventory sheet, which will either be on their website or in your Google Drive, a link to their current pricing sheet, a link to the product info sheet. They'll usually give you a main contact, so that would be the person that you would go to for any questions. It's usually like the head of e-commerce or something like that. That's sometimes who you submit your order to, so you would have their name there, their order submission method. So sometimes they'll have you send it on email, sometimes they'll have it um, send it on like a dealer portal or something. If it is email, put the email there and have their main contact phone number. And usually also I'll put dealer portal website with Applicable. That's usually all that you need. Um, but just have like a simple table like this that you can just have easy access to hyperlinks to access everything that you need um, quickly and efficiently. Um, you and your team will be grateful that you have something like that. Um, but again, this is just a quick video, so just wanted to kind of make a point on being organized with this stuff. It might not be a big deal when you have three or four suppliers, but when you have 50 down the road, you'll be glad that you did this from the start. So make a Google Drive with folders for each dealer and all their agreements, and then make a table that has clean, clear links on pricing, inventory, product information, main contact, um, order submission method, uh, phone number, dealer portal, everything that you could need on a daily basis to submit orders or ask questions or get inventory updates or pricing updates just all in one harmonized place with easy access. You'll be grateful great that you did that. Uh, that's all for this video, and I'll see you in the next one. Welcome to this video. So this video is going to be on product uploads. So before we get into it, there's two ways to do this. There's manual and there's, I guess, semi-automated. So what we want to include is the SKU, shipping, collections, tags, product info, product photos, um, all in the back end. And I know this is kind of abstract in a lesson, so I'm just going to do a live demonstration as to what this would look like. So this store is my fake grill store that I've made, but I'm going to show you an example of this. So this is Holland Map Safe. So this is like a safe company. So I'm just going to do it on the store, but this would obviously not be in, in uh, this would not go in the store. So this is, this company is called Holland Safe. So what I would do is if I was doing this manually, I would type in Holland TL30 rated, if I was doing these, TL30 rated series on Google. And then I would look for their website right here. And then see they have all these different subtypes. These should correspond with the ones on the sheet I just showed you. So MJ1014, MJ1014, MJ1014C. So I'm assuming that means the color. Another thing you can do is you can just look online at other stores I'm in Canada right now, but So they, they have all these different ones here. So this company has done it all on different pages. What I would say would make sense here is, so first you would have to create a collection and you can do this. So I would recommend having one parent collection. So let's say for in this example, home safes, and then any, product that matches the condition that is a safe will be entered in this collection. And then we could also have sub collections, so different types of home safes. And then you can tag the product, which I'll show you how. 
to enter them in those collections. So to do this manually, what I would do is as follows. I would take, so it's, I do, what I, the format I follow is brand name, product name, product type. And it's important that you do this right from the beginning because whatever you make this title is what will be your default SEO description here. So if you do this wrong now, it will be wrong forever unless you change this manually on every one. And um, usually your authority will build up over time and if you change the URL, it can mess with it. So I'd recommend you just do this right from the start. So I'll do Holland Safe TL30 rated TL30. I wouldn't, like you have to make it make sense. So Holland Safe TL30 rated, so Home Safe doesn't make sense to do Holly. Holland TL30 rated home safe would probably be what I put. And then each of these can be a variant of the product. So see how there's only one price. We want to go down. This product has options. So what I would put is the option name is the model number. And then I would put each of these as their own model number. Like this. I think the 10 is related to size and I'm not sure what the E is related to. I'm trying to figure that out. Well, let me see. Oh, it looks like this one has a key and this one is electric or pad, keypad. So then what I would do is on my store, I would just have the model number like that. And then this here would be the keypad type. Key lock. So then, hope that this makes sense. Every one of these will have a both key and a lock. Key, keypad. And then 1814 and 2618. MJ 1814. MJ 2618. Like that. And now what it will give us is see it has all these variations. It has the six variations. So what I would then do is you would take the skew. I just want to make sure I did it the right one. So the one with E is the keypad. The one with C is the lock. E is keypad. And then you take, so E is keypad. And you can also just Google this model to make sure it is. And it looks like even other stores have the same thing. Keypad. Keypad which is a good sign that we're right. So you can do it like these other stores and just do a different product for every single one of these, but it will just be more work. So this is why I do it this way. So MJ14 so is the keypad, so then you'll take cost. So cost, usually I just set my, where my inventory to a thousand in every one. So every product is available in my store, but I just, Put accurate shipping times so if something is not in stock I will just have a note that says available shipment in four weeks and if the customer then orders that product I have the customer service team call the customer and say hey did you see the shipping timeline on the page and we have manual payment capture on so if they didn't see it we haven't taken their payment yet they say no they don't want it we just cancel the transaction if they do want the order then we process it afterwards but after speaking with them and informing them it just makes your life easier rather than having to go in and update inventory. It 
it gets very cumbersome quickly, especially if you're doing it on your own. So cost per item, this will go here. Price will be what you sell for, will go here. And you can add in your shipping if you want. So 13.73 plus 260, 15, 16.33 roughly. So 20% margin is what they give us, which isn't great, but it's fine. Then once I go in here, yeah, I should have a compare price. So usually I just set this like a few hundred dollars higher. Then we just need to do the same thing for the other one. So C is the block skew. Shipping. It's better if you can make your costs with shipping. It'll just make your life way easier. You could just put these in a Google Sheet and add them together. 210. 2010. And you don't need to put anything here. If you have it, you can, but not required. And then another thing why you can do while you're doing this is you can take the skew and put it so this is the one we're selling and they have both under the same so what we want to do is we want to take these photos Great. Maybe they. I don't remember actually if they gave me better ones in the Dropbox. Let's see. Yeah, they did actually. Anyway, so once you get your. Okay, yeah, these are far better. So you'll get your pictures, they, they have provided me a Dropbox, but um, I just don't want to go searching through the whole thing right now, just for time. But what you do is once you get the photos of the models, so this one here is with the keypad, so I'll go in here and then you can upload that exact photo to that variant. Then this is the one with the lock, so we want to save. This is the one with the lock. Save.
this is the one with lock and key. So the last one I'll put up. Oops. This one is And the last one is so two seven three two seven two five. And then down here, um, we want to make sure our inventory is full for all. We can do that usually from this page. Actually, actually, I need to go and do it. So again, I just put it in stock for everyone, and then I just add, update the shipping timeline on the page. It's far easier. Or just confirm with the customer before processing their payment. Ideally both, you'd have accurate shipping time and weight, you don't need to put anything, customs, you don't need to put anything. So then you have all your products here and what the page will look like is rather than having one for each page, they can go and as they select and change the models, it will show like every one we just entered which is nice. And then what we want to do is, so the way I have my tabs by station app set up is every time, so this is kind of the general product description. This is how I would recommend doing this. This here is the general product description. Only take product information copy and pasted from your dealer's website, your supplier's website. You never do that from other people, um, just to be safe. You can put it in a, a tool of some kind and have it reworded if you're stuck, but only copy and paste from your dealer's website. Um, for SEO purposes, we wanna make this the same thing here and make it an H1. There should be only one heading one on every page of yours. Um, and then you'll have your general product description. Usually I would recommend putting a photo of some kind in the middle of this. You just can go like this. Center it. And then usually at the bottom, if there is a video, 
I will include it. So here it looks like there was, yeah, the NJ30 series. So what you can do is take this link, go to the YouTube video, take the link, go to this website called embedresponsively.com, like this, put in the YouTube URL, take this code, go to your sheet, and then where you wanna put it, so if you, I would recommend putting it at the bottom. So first actually, you wanna make your other headings, so product specifications, like that. And then here at the bottom of this part, I would put insert video, you paste your code, there you go. And under specifications, so I would, the way I have mine set on tabs is that every time I do an H, a heading three, it will create a new tab. So here, what we would then do is we would have specs for each one, so like this. And we don't want this to be a heading. We just want this to be plain text. Like that. And then ideally from your Dropbox, you want to include every other nice photo here and you want to put the nice photos first and nice photos in the description. If there's ones like live, live photos, like in a house or something, actually on display. And then it lastly, so for actually this, I'll make that in a different video. So then what you would want to do is you have your vendor. So Holland Safe is the vendor here. Collections, or I guess product type is a, is a safe. So product type, I made the collection equal to safes. So, or sorry, to safe. So I have to make this product type safe and it will automatically be put in that collection. So now when I go back to that collection, the one I just did is there. Um, so it's automated and then you can also tag it. So you could, it's kind of hard to, for me to, to know because I don't know this safe, this safe industry well, but you could tag it like traditional safe or like gun safe or like watch safe or something like different kinds of safes is the tag and then create a collection that every product tagged as X is in this collection so you can then use in your menu. But in terms of everything else, you wanna go, make sure you do this actually, manage and you want to, I'll show you this after when we add Google and Facebook, but you wanna make sure your sales channels are on. Um, tags, collections, vendor. And then usually I recommend also creating a collection for each vendor. So you will make the, ven the title, the vendor name, and then do vendor is equal to haul and safe, just like that. And then you can add information there about them if you'd like. This is obviously their website. Let me welcome you to haul and safe. long 
about us page. I would just pick an interesting tidbit from there and put it, but not a big deal. So I think that's it for this module. Um, that's how I mainly upload a product. Like I said, you could then, if you want, and copy and paste this information and just do six different pages um, with different pictures, but I've just found it's far easier to create one parent product page with the different model numbers and variants. So this could be size, this could be color for the main product and having just the customer be able to select the options. It's been what I found easier. Um, and see here how I told you when I made a heading three, we create a tab. So now I can see, um, I'm not sure why there's no spacing. This should be my YouTube video. I'm not sure why it's not working. But there's the vid image I put, the product specs. Oops. Looks like I fixed it off. Okay. Well, that's it for this video. I'll show you the rest in the next. Hello everyone. So this is a follow-up video on the previous module, which was the manual way to upload products. This way is more advanced, so it's a little more complex, but it's very useful if you have hundreds or thousands of products to upload at the same time. Um, for a while, what I was doing is I would do this way myself, and then I would have the VAs do the rest of the on-page stuff, just because this part I'm gonna show you is very important because it's the pricing. Um, product names, everything like that, where the, the rest is more just copy paste using images and things like that. So um, if it is, if time is something that you're short on and you want to outsource uh, the product upload process to VAs, I would recommend you do this at least to start and learn, learn it, understand it and make like a bulletproof SOP that you can give to a VA to follow perfectly down the line. But if you're looking to save time, you can do this and then have the VAs do the rest. I'm just going to show you again example. So I use an app called Matrixify to do this. So when you go to your apps, um, Matrixify, they will have a template here for you. I don't like their template. I find it confusing. So I have made my own template that I will give you. These ones that have this info in it, just leave it how it is. Um, but essentially what you want to do is this. So with our Holland safe, so let's just say for this example, I'm doing these four. First thing I would do is I would take all the SKUs, and just plug them in like this. Then I would take the pricing. So it looks like this is our total plus. Actually, I'm not even gonna, I'm gonna restart just because those are not expensive ones. So we'll do these, these six. those six. Now, what I recommend you do is, so, price, see how you have these price here? So variant price, compare price cost. So what I would do is I would actually put, just for two seconds, I would do this so you can have So this is our cost, this is our shipping, since it's flat. And 
we should have the same number as we do SKUs, which we do, which is great. So now what we can do is just add these together to get our total cost like that. And then we can just copy this, paste values only. So then when we delete these two, these numbers don't delete like that. So that is our cost. Um, now for map, so map will go in the column titled price here, Oop. like this. I don't know why I picked that one. Oops. So there's our cost, there's our map price, and our compare it price is the one that's crossed out. So usually I do it about 20% higher, just like this. And usually you can round it, so round. There is a formula for this. Trust me, you can, if you Google it, you'll figure it out, but usually I round it up to like 109, whatever, just so it looks nicer. So in title, that is the product title. So remember the variance from the previous episode? If you give something the same title, it will be under the same parent product. So to give you an example, Holland Republic Gun Safe Series. Gun safe. I would just name it Hall of Public Gun Safe. And you see there's three. So what I would do is I would take those three. And then what I would want to do is figure out what is different between these three models here. So it looks like, see here how they have capacity? 22, 39, 32, 22, 39, 32. So you kind of have to figure out on your own what is the difference amongst these models that are under the same parent model. So then what I would do is under option one name, I would put gun capacity here. I would just put capacity, 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 22, 39, 42, just like that. And then since these all have the same name and capacity, so capacity will be going in the drop down like this. And this will say capacity and then it will be the options. And there's only one size, so I don't know why they have that there, so we're not going to put it. But if we did have more options, we can put the options here, so it could be color, different colors. And then you can have up to three. Usually I just hide these unless I need them, but they're there if you need. <clears throat> Vendor would be haul and safe, and you can just drag and drop. Type gun safe. So then we would make a collection for gun safes in our Shopify store. Tags, if you want to put, well, actually type would be probably safe because we remember in the last video we just made the collection safes. Tag would be gun safe. And then we would make a new collection for every product tagged as gun safes. This is gun safes. These ones were there previously that I entered in advance. This just means your, your product is not going to go live on your store when you upload it. This just means the same thing. So not published not on your store, which is what we want. Um, taxable and shipping, these are both true. Drag these down. Same with these three, just wanna drag them down. Inventory, I always just put a thousand. So then your job is essentially just to go through and figure out the names, the titles. So now the next one is going to be Holland Crescent safe and there's three of them and again we just want to see what is different about these
So what I would do is this in. So it looks like it, it is steel and you can also look on the info sheet that your supplier provides you but your goal is just to figure out like what is the difference amongst these things here okay so this is gun capacity 24 long guns let's see if we can find this one on this website 12 yeah so again capacity so 12 24 36 and then we need to keep the title the same. If one thing is off, it will create a new product. So you just copy paste. I'm not gonna keep doing those. I think you understand the idea. You just need to, so you need to have the, the same parent product will have the same title and then the variants will be different underneath. And you can have one, two or three of them. Um, you will have to kind of learn this as you go for sure. It's not something I think you're gonna be able to fully get from a video. You'll have to practice it and understand it yourself. But that gives you a brief idea. Once this is done, you will download it as a CSV. So I'm just gonna delete the ones we didn't do just so it doesn't cause issues when we're doing upload process. So like this, delete. So you have like, I've had sheets with literally thousands of products we're doing at once. And then what you want to do is go into here and we want to add the CSV we downloaded. Oops, no, that's the matrix supply one. That's not the one I just downloaded. So then take it, drop it. column name is empty. So it'll tell you if something's wrong. So this one seems to be empty. Try again, it will probably work. So see how it says two, total of two products because we did the two parents. In the meantime, while that's loading, you can leave and we'll do gun safes. Product tag is equal to gun safes. Gun safe or contains equal to whatever. And then see the two products I just uploaded are now here. And all the variants and all the pricing are not done correctly somehow. Oh, it doesn't think this is. There was something, yeah, just make sure you do this. I'll actually do this on my template, so if you use this, so this will not be an issue. Um, and the nice thing about Matrixify is if you make a mistake, you can just go and actually re-upload it with the correct version and it will overwrite things for you automatically. It will keep everything else the same except what you've changed. So if you, for example, have 5,000 products in your store, you can export from Matrixify, get a sheet with all of your products information on it. You can go in and change the pricing for products, for example, and then re-upload it and everything else will stay the same except what you changed. So it's a super cool tool to update things. Let's see if it's good now. Yeah, so see, now the pricing is all good. The inventory is good, the SKUs are good. Um, we did the shipping settings, we already have this done, this done, um, everything's good to go, except you just have to upload the product information and the images. And your SEO is good because you made the title right. So this is just a far more efficient way to, to do product uploads in bulk. We have our tag as gun safe, 
which has automatically entered it in our gun safes collection, which we can put on our store. So that's just um, an example of how to use the Trixify. I'm also gonna link, they have a great, I don't know if it's their YouTube channel or what exactly it is, but I know you can access a ton of super helpful videos on how to use the program. Tutorials. Yeah, so I'm just gonna link this page to the course so you have access to it, but there's tons of stuff here that can really help you um, learn how to use it and stuff. But that's all for this video. I hope that helps, and I'll see you in the next module. Welcome to this video. So this is going to be about how to deal with shipping, returns, and warranties. So every one of your suppliers is going to have different policies. And the way we deal with that is we have a parent policy that says, essentially, if you want information on the specific product, you need to look on the product page because we mirror our dealer's policies. So essentially that's what you wanna do. You do not need your own return policy, your own shipping policy, or your own warranty policy. You will just mirror your dealer, your suppliers. So if you can get a refund for something, then you can give your customer a refund for something. If you can't get a refund for something, then you're not gonna give your customer a refund for something. So you're just covering uh, your own ass so that if something does go wrong, you will only ever have to return or cover something for your customer if you yourself are covered by your supplier. And the way we do that is having a parent policy, like a generic one that's for your whole store. And then on the product pages, we'll have ones for each specific brand. So I'm just gonna show you how to set this up. And then I've also will provide templates for my store that we have tried and kind of come to over the year in a bit we've been in business that just seem to make the most sense and provide everyone the least headaches. So here are my templates. So these ones I link in the footer and these ones I link in the policy section of Shopify. So essentially what it's saying is, um, can't see or any time for it ships free of charge. Cause usually, well, exceptions apply to just custom orders. So if there's something that's an, custom made so like the supplier will not even start making it until you send them the order so let's say i order a, a custom made something from you you send it to your supplier they start making it then halfway through making it i cancel my order this is just saying that in that case then no if you can't get refunded then i'm not going to get refunded but most of the time if it's a product that's like in the warehouse and it just hasn't shipped yet um the, the supplier can cancel the order for you no problem and therefore you can refund your customer Please contact us before the order ships. Um, custom or made to order products cannot be refunded as these are put in production specifically for your order. If you need to exchange a product, you may do so, but the customer is responsible for return shipping costs. So we offer free shipping, but if the customer needs to return something, that will cost a couple hundred dollars in shipping and they are responsible for doing that. Um, and they usually have restocking fee and usually your suppliers will charge you restocking fee. So you charge them that. I think we just use 25%. Um, and then we have this. So when you're making a purchase, you are acknowledging that I am to inspect the package upon delivery and take pictures if there is damage. Because you do not want your customer to get the product. We've had this, leave it in the garage for two and a half months, open it, find out it's broken. And then they call you asking for a replacement or a warranty and your supplier says, oh, sorry, um, that passed two months ago. So you have to have this, and I would also recommend having a post-purchase email set up, we'll cover this later, that tells them as soon as they place an order, when they, in their order confirmation email, it says this. So there's no excuse that they're not doing this. I understand the cost of return shipping. I understand the product needs to be returned unopened. I understand if my order has left the warehouse that I'm unable to receive a full refund because they'll have to pay for shipping and any restocking fees at that point. So our default is kind of, this is our default policies. Um, same kind of thing. So you're welcome to copy this. Just obviously do not put my store's name in your thing. Switch it up for yours. Um, remove these. But other than that, you can read through these, change things as you see fit. But this is kind of what I've found has worked the best and caused the least headaches in the long run. Um,
And then usually what I also do is, so for the haul and safe example, if I had brought them on as a dealer, I would then go in their warranty section. And then what you can do is you can literally just copy this whole thing. Well, this is what I would do. You go to the app called Tabs by Station, Manage Tabs, oops, and you will attach, create a pro tab, Holland Safe Warranty and returns. Then what you will do is you'll apply it to some products and you'll apply it to the collection you made just for that brand. That's why it's important to make a brand collection. Now what you will do is you'll literally just copy their policy and put it here. So whatever happens, if you, you can get money back, then your customer can get money back. If you can't get money back, then your customer can't You have all this stuff there. I don't know why it's looking so ugly. And then usually I'd look around and just see if they have a return policy or something as well. Sometimes they do separate, sometimes it's in FAQs. And you can even create, um, So then like if there was nothing here specific, then your parent policy would just be the default. So that's, and then what you would do is you would attach it to some products and it would only be all in safe. Make sure you only do that or it will attach to all of them. And then usually I just put it in like position 10 so it's default the last one. And then if you want, you can do things like you can make other tabs for Holland Safe. So I could create a tab, Holland Safe FAQ. And then you can go in here and you can put stuff that's applicable to the customer. So how can I open my safe with the keypad? And you can put this video using that embed responsibly right here in the tab for the customer. Um, I'm not gonna do that here, but you can do cool things with these tabs that will attach only to certain products in your store. Um, by default, that's applicable to all of them. So like the return policy would be applicable to all or how to set up a keypad if it's the same on all their safes would be applicable to all. Um, so it's it's a, a good way to, so then like for example, when we go to one of these product pages and look at a preview, it will have the warranty that we just put in there. So that is how I would recommend doing warranty returns. So then this here would be the ones I put in the, in the template document. And then the ones um, that say Shopify legal are the ones that go here, policies. But I hope that video is helpful. Um, that should save you a lot of headache because it took us a long time to get where <laughs> our policy is now, just after lots of headaches. Um, and stuff and we've just found this works best so i hope you find that valuable and i think that's it for this lesson but i'll see you in the next one which should be actually getting your ads set up once you are all onboarded with your suppliers and you're good to go so thank you for watching and i'll see you soon
Welcome to Smart Drill, everyone. So this is going to be a video on your account setup for Google. So there's a bunch of different things we're going to do here. We're going to do Search Console, Merchant Center, Ads, Analytics, and Symprosis, which links your Shopify to your Merchant Center, which allows you to run shopping ads, which are the most profitable type of ads. So to start, go to Search Console. This will be hyperlinked. You're just going to put in your domain. So mine is... Um, Ownership verified since this is already done through our um, account. So it will say processing takes some time. Go to sitemap. Yeah, so that's what you want. Just put in your domain and then dash sitemap.xml like this. And then go here. <coughs> Actually, you don't even need to put it. You just need to put this. And that's all you need to do there. Otherwise, it will just update automatically as you wait. That's it for Search Console. So this Search Console will show you all of your SEO traffic information from Google. So just to show you kind of like what one looks like when it's matured a bit. Oop. So this is for my store. So it has like all the organic search results that we've gotten that are not from ads. And you can actually go to results and you can see like what terms are ranking for. So obviously our brand name is the most. Um, and then the other stuff that we've ranked for the last few months, as well as which pages people are landing on, um, which, so I see blogs doing well, countries, devices, um, so you get all sorts of information there. And if there's anything problem, anything problematic with your store, like the vitals, the usability, things like that, it will usually show up here, um, just so you can kind of see if there's anything wrong with your website, this is where you would want to do it. So that's that, very easy, Merchant Center. So just get um, started here. So do you products sell, do you sell products online? Yes, you do. Again, just put in your website. Oh, no, sorry. Take that away. Show your products for free. Create a Google Merchant Center account. So this one is called Logical Chef. And no, you do not want to do this. Continue to Merchant Center. Um, so add business details. This is where we'll put your, your real business address. Do not put your fake one here. Um, do not do that. That will get you banned if you do that.
I still haven't received it. It's all good. Save this. So that should be your real business address. Verify and claim website. It's already verified. Claim. Good to go. Set up shipping. So this put free standard shipping. We sell in the US. So we will go to the United States. Delivery is at the customer's address. Set a range of delivery times, um, order cutoff times. So, this is just don't listen to this, just put your time zone, put handling time, just leave those blank. Transit time, let's do Monday to Sunday, holiday. It's, ship for free. And this is um, because we don't have handling time, it will never show the shipping ETA in Google, which is what we want. So you can just put, I don't know, like seven here or something. It's not going to show regardless. Free shipping. Add products. Do not do this yet. This is what Merchant Center is for. Google policies, um, and final review. So we have to add products first. Okay. So next, we'll go to set up our Google Ads. Press start now. It will take you to this screen here. We want to switch to expert mode at the bottom. Business name. So put in your business phone number here, whatever one you got. What are your goals? Just actually do skip. We do not want to put up a campaign right now. Leave campaign creation. So billing country will be Canada for me. I would rather just be for build in USD because that is what my store is in. But it's kind of up to you. I don't know. So that's now created. Um, <clears throat> Now lastly, analytics, so start measuring. Put your So do this, put it on. Create both. That's when we want.
So now we have to install our tag. to get out of this thing to be honest with you. So now what we want to do is we want to link our accounts. So link Google Ads account. We just want to check the number so 961-337-0341-0341. So all of our accounts need to be linked. Linked. Um, so now go to Merchant Center. We want to link this. Search Console, that's the other one we did. So select your website, submit. So now we should have those, and just to make sure, it should also be showing up here under linked accounts. It is. And now we need to link our ads to our Search Console as well. And we need to link our ads to our Merchant Center. So we sent the request, now we go back. Just like this. So now that's all done. So ads is linked to analytics, console, and merchant center. Um, and analytics is linked to all three, and search calls the console is as well. So we're good to go on that front, I believe. We just need to install the tag on Shopify. So go to your um, Link preferences, Google Analytics, setting up Google Analytics in Shopify. Um, So from analytics, we need to go to, I believe it is, we need to go to the one that says UA here, all website data. And then once we're in that, so we should be in the one that says all website data, go to property settings, use
this is what we need. And we want to turn on enhanced e-commerce. And then send test traffic. So now we see one active user, so we're good to go. And then lastly, what we want to do is you want to go to this app in the App Store called Simprosis Google Shopping Feed. You want to download it, <clears throat> install, Google. Do the one that you created. So you should use the same email for all those accounts you just did. Merchant Center ID should just be there. Confirm account. Um, I would recommend that you watch through these videos. Um, so in your account, manage programs. So we can't do free product listings until we hook up Merchant Center. Shopping ads, get started. Continue. We'll need to add products, so. Um, you have enabled them. product ID sync and just to be clear you'll be doing this after you've already uploaded your products and you have no more demo products on the store you link your Google Ads account and then I recommend you do this turn on all these things. Okay, no. Um, and then, so don't actually create a campaign. Then go to Google Dynamic Remarketing and Conversion Tracking at the top. recommend you do that. I actually haven't done it through this app yet, so I'm just curious to see what it looks like. This uh, enable enhanced 100%. So we have to go back to the Google Ads account, go to conversions, and there should now be conversions set up here. So you see here how there's, um, I don't know why there's two for each. That will probably double count, so. I would just make sure, I would just take one, and then you wanna go down to the bottom and turn on enhanced conversions. And then when we go back to the app, it should now allow us to do this. Yep, so now we're good to go. For conversion tracking and um, is it the other one I did before?
So I think the, there's two of those because we have two. Um, so just to be sure, you can actually go in and, and name these. Add to cart. Yeah. The main thing is we just don't want to double count purchases. The other ones are fine. So just leave those how they are, but just see how they say secondary. That's all that really matters. We can only have one primary. That's the most important thing. But um, yeah, that's pretty much it for this video. Um, make sure you watch the next one on avoiding merchant center suspensions. But um, yeah, that's, that's it for now. I'll see you in the next video. Welcome to this video, everyone. So this is going to be a very um, important video, not the flashiest topic, but um, extremely important nonetheless. So what, um, a lot of people when they're signing up for their Google account and stuff like that, they'll go through Merchant Center account suspensions just as they're going through getting their account approved. And it can be very frustrating, it can be very time consuming, um, unfortunate process. I was lucky, um, I didn't have to, I think I did have to go through it, but it was just like a, a simple fix or something like that, it, it, it didn't go too long. So I'm just going to go through and show you everything um, that you'll need to know to kind of minimize your chances of having this happen and having to go through this yourself. So the first thing is the policies you're going to need in the footer. So as you can see here, we have all these quick links policies. So the ones we're going to need for sure are terms of service, privacy policy, return and refund policy, shipping policy, contact us, and I would recommend putting about us. So you want to have all of those in your footer. Um, the next thing is in your menu. So up here, we want to have a phone number clearly visible in the menu. And then somewhere in the main menu, we want to have contact us and returns. It doesn't matter. Um, I would also just probably put here as well, like shipping policy, those other ones. I, I just didn't have... Um, I've had to go through a suspension. I didn't know this. So once you get approved, it's usually you're usually in the clear, and you're not usually going to get it suspended after the original approval. But I would also just put those other links. Um, you don't need to put terms of service or privacy policy, but um, the shipping policy about us and contact us. I would all put in a menu up here. As well, in the footer, we want to put contact information. So we want to have phone, email, and address. We want to have two of the three. I would recommend just putting all three. Um, so phone, email, address. I would recommend putting all three, but you need a, a minimum of two of the three. In addition to that, um, so we covered the. So in the menu, we want phone number and then links to contact us about us, refund, return, and shipping. Then on the actual product pages themselves, I would recommend you have somewhere that says warranty shipping returns, like this. Just because Google wants, this shows legitimate uh, shows that you're a legitimate business. So the, Google does not want people buying stuff and then being unaware of the return policy and the shipping policies, which is why we need to do this. So if, it's clear, if Google can like read that it's clear on the product page, then that's a very good sign. So I would recommend putting those there and we still want to have all this other stuff like the phone number um, and the title. And another thing is also put these payment badges in your footer. Every theme will be different. I know in my theme, if I go into footer, and I go into the settings, it says show payment method icons, like this. So we just want to make sure we have that as well. That also builds trust if the user can see like Amex, PayPal, um, whatever else. That will also help build trust and it also helps Google. So I think that's pretty much it in terms of on website stuff. The other aspect is going to be the Merchant Center. So when we go to business information, it should, this is actually incorrect because I moved. This is my old house. Um, if 
but whenever you're signing up, you'll go through this information here and you want to make sure you're providing it all accurate information. So your URL, email, everything like that, you'll just want to be accurate and I'll put some pictures in of what it should look like. So it should look like this on the side. You should have all this stuff um, checked off, good to go. And whatever information you put in here in the Merchant Center, make sure you've put the same information on Shopify here. So just make sure when you're putting in your address, your phone number like this, Make sure that this is the same information that you're putting in the Merchant Center as well. Um, one thing that I will also recommend is in your product images, make sure you never have uh, words and like banners and stuff in these. That won't lead to a full account suspension, but it will lead to like that particular product that has that being suspended. So um, yeah, don't do don't put like crazy text and, and things here. You can put those elsewhere, like on the product page, or but I wouldn't include them actually in your product descriptions or in your, in your main product images here. I hope that makes sense. If you have any questions, let me know. But if you follow those steps, you should be good, good and in the clear and you won't, uh, you won't go through any suspensions or anything like that. But hopefully that's helpful and I will speak with you soon. Hi everyone, this video is going to be a quick video on Bing advertising setup. So the nice thing about Bing is you actually don't need to, when we get to the campaign creation stage, we don't need to create our campaigns from scratch. Um, we can just import them from Google. So we obviously don't have a, Bing, a Microsoft account yet, so we might need to make one, create account. Sign up for a new Microsoft advertising account. What's your goal? Is this to my website? So at this stage, you would just put in I want to target, for me it would just be the United States. How do you want your customers to find you? I think what they're trying to do is make us set up a campaign here. like.
I think we can do start live chat and then just say like, I want to set up my account without starting a campaign. Obviously, so this here you'd want to put in your China. Switch tax promote. There we go. Skip campaign creation. So here we go. This is what we want. This number there. I always just do USD, so have your advertising account in the same dollar that you use on your store, just to keep things consistent. I agree. Credit. Prepay, postpay. Set up payment later. Okay, so then once we're in, um, you'll have to add a payment method, but pretty much, I guess I'll show you how to do the ads in the next account. We just want to have a, the campaign creation now, and we should also have our feed for Google Shopping by Sim Process. We should be able to hook this up to our, so this is your Bing ads account. Um, you will also have to create a Bing Merchant Center account. So if you click up top here, create store. Okay, I forgot. So we're gonna have to go to Bing Webmaster Tools, which is essentially the Bing version of Google Search Console. just import it from Google Search Console, it looks like. Okay, so we have to go into our Shopify again, into domains, or into whatever your provider is.
we want to add a text record, it looks like. Now it's verified, and now it should be up here like this. So now when we go back to Bing Webmaster Tools, if we do import, it should now be there. Good to go. So now when we go to our advertising account, we should be able to validate through Big Web Whipping Webmaster Tools. And we're good to go. But now we have to also set up our We go to settings, go to Bing shopping settings. So those are the two accounts we just created, the ads account and the merchant center account. this as well. Skew is product ID. And I believe we're good to go. Yeah. <clears throat> so when you have your products, they will now show the Bing logo as well, like this. Obviously mine are even real products, so that's why it's showing errors, but you should have all three and they shall be checked off once you do that. But that's it for Bing setup. So you want to have those three things. You want to have the Bing Webmaster Tools imported from your search console. You want to have the Bing Ads account and the Bing Merchant Center account. But that's it for this video and I'll see you in the next one. Hi everyone. So this is going to be on your Facebook setup. Um, I can't really make a new one from scratch because I've maxed up my account limits. I'm going to try and make this as straightforward as possible given that. Um, so you want to make your, excuse me, you want to make your Facebook, there's, okay, how can I explain this best? There's three levels within Facebook. There's a Facebook business manager, which is essentially a Facebook business account, but you can have multiple advertising accounts within your Facebook business manager. And then within each advertising account, you can have multiple assets such as Facebook pages, Instagram pages, things like that, which you actually need to run the ads from. So the first step is you're going to go to facebook.business.facebook.com. You're going to log into your personal Facebook account. And that, the reason that's important is because if you start a new one from scratch, a new Facebook profile from scratch, Facebook, you have no data to show that you're legit. So if you have like a history of Facebook, if you have a Facebook account that's been around for like 10 years and you can show and like, you can use that, um, then you're much more likely to get approved and not have any issues. So I would recommend doing that. Create a Facebook business manager account um, here. And then once you're in there, um, you also want to go into your Facebook and you want to create a page for your business. And how you do this is you just simply go to menu, page, like this. And you make your page, you put in your information. You can probably just put like stuff from your about us section that you've already done put your page name, um, your address, your business hours, everything that you normally would. So you'll have your page. I also recommend you create an Instagram account for your business. And whenever you make a blog post or anything like that, you can post it on here. Have your friends, your family like the page. It's really not a big deal. Um, friends, family like it. Um, post your blog post whenever you make something, but I wouldn't go crazy trying to like make your Facebook page um, thousands of followers or anything like that. You'll do the same thing for your an Instagram account. Um, make an Instagram account for your business. 
Um, so you should have a Facebook business manager account, a Facebook page, and a face, uh, an Instagram account for your business. Once you have those three things, you can then go in and in, so this is my business account here. And within the business account, I have assets. So an asset is an ad account, a page, everything about it. So you will go in and you will add your assets. So you'll add your Instagram account and you'll add, um, so you'll add your page here and you'll also add your Instagram account like this within your business account. And then you will go in here and you will create a ad account. So ad accounts. Ad accounts. Add assets. No, I want to do that. I think you will be given an ad account by default. Ad accounts. So go into business settings and then here you can go add an ad account. Yeah, okay, there's the process. So you'll, you'll be on your business manager page. You'll go to business settings. And then in business settings, you go down to add accounts and you can connect your other ones here as well, make sure they're connected and you'll go add ad account. Um, create new ad account, sorry. And you would just go through and do that. Enter your payment info, make sure you're using consistent address and contact info across your website, your Shopify, everything. Um, and we'll get into the actual campaign setup in the next module, but um, and just that's it for really now. We just want to make sure you have your page hooked up, your Instagram hooked up um, to your ad account or to your business, your business manager account. And you want to have an ad account created. Um, and you may have to give yourself access to it. So like you can see here, I have a business account, but then also like my personal one, I believe is within this. Maybe not. Um, it is very confusing their setup, but those are the main things. You wanna have a business manager, Facebook page, Instagram page hooked up to your business manager, and then it adds account. And that should be good for this module. Um, and then once those things are done, we wanna go back into the feed for Google Shopping by some process. And you can go into settings, go into Facebook catalog settings, Log in with Facebook, you'll put in your info. Um, let me see if I can do it on the new one here to show you what it should look like. Is that Shopify account? What's the login? Okay. Well, <clears throat> anyways, when you go into Simprosis like this, it will allow you to. hook up your Facebook account that you just created to your Shopify.
you can create a new catalog, so you will want to do this. Follow this help video. So this is what, do this for sure. And this video will explain it better than I can, just because I, I haven't done this in, in well over a year. And you'll just have to do it once and that will be it. So go follow um, this video. I'll also link it in the module below. But create a catalog in your Facebook Business Manager account that you've already created, and then hook that catalog up to your Simprosis, and you'll be able to run the ads that we need to it. Um, but yeah, that's the main things for Facebook. Um, and the next one is Pinterest, which should be the final advertising account set up for now. And I'll see you in the next video for that. Hey everyone, so this is going to be your initial advertising campaign setup. So the first thing I want you to do is go in Simprosis for Google Shopping Feed. And I want you to go into Automated Rules for Feed here. And then what I want you to do is I want you to create a custom label like this. And we're going to attach a label to our products so we can bid differently depending on the price. So what we want to do is go price is greater than zero and price is less than 500. It's like that. Okay. And then put here zero to 500. And then add another rule. Price is greater than 500 and price is less than 1,000. 500 to 1,000, like this. And we want to just do these for every 1,000 from here on up. So it's greater than 1,000 and price is less than, I'll actually do 999. Price is greater than and price is less than So I'll do this, this up to like seven or 8,000 and then And if you're wondering what this store is, um, without going into too much detail, I owned it with someone who I am, um, I owned it with my ex-girlfriend, so that's why I do not run it anymore. But if you're looking at it and you're wondering why that's the case, that's why. And then once you get up to 8,000, you can just do price is greater than 8,000, like this. And then just put 8,000 plus. So then once we have all these rules, press save. And then what we'll need to do is apply rules right here. And what will happen is they will take probably 15 to 20 minutes to actually apply within your Google account. But once that's done, 
um, then you will move on to the next step. So the first thing we want to do is we want to go into negative keyword lists and we want to create three. So we want to have one called universal negatives. And then here you can put, so anytime, um, I'm going to recommend you read this article. And read the difference between these three. I'll, uh, I'll make a note. But essentially, we want to use always use um, phrase match. So any anytime anyone types in any of these terms on Google, universal negatives, we're going to apply these to all of our campaigns, so we won't show up. Um, these are just a few that I would use. And you'll build a list as you go. But that would be one. And then we want to have one called low funnel. And here we want to put products that are actually like the name of the product itself. So very specific terms. So what we want to do for this is duplicate your thing here. Go to keyword planner. Or you can also use your keyword tool if you have one. Uh, it doesn't matter. And as you can see here, so this product is called the HealthMate Enrich 2 Infrared Sauna. So what I would want to put in the low funnel is we want to put specific terms with buying intent. So we put HealthMate Enrich like this. So I want you to go through all of your products. And a good way to do this, if you go to this keyword planner, you go to the US, and then just simply put in your brand name. So HealthMate is the brand I'm doing here. You can see all these. Um, we'll actually probably put HealthMate Sauna just because. Now we can see there's all these terms here. So what I want you to do is download the keyword ideas into a Google Sheet. Um, And what I want you to do is just delete everything except the very first row. And then what we want to do is we want to categorize the terms um, as either specific or vague. So I'll show you what I mean. So we're gonna have two columns, put generic branded, buying intent branded this. So we'll have these two columns, generic, branded, buying intent, branded. And then I want you to sort them. So HealthMate Sauna, like there's no specificity here. It's just generic. It's just talking about the product. HealthMate Infrared Sauna, it's a little closer, but it's still pretty generic. Um, prices, price list. But see how it says then professional edition sauna. So this is a particular model. HealthMate three-person sauna, specific, like it's showing buying intent. HealthMate home sauna, generic, two-person infrared sauna. For sale, if it ever says for sale, you can put that in buying intent. So we want like very specific terms here that are showing like a specific model. So it's either the size or the power or um, they're looking for something specific or a, professor, a product name or for sale. Something like this. Price, I would not put in buying intent. Used, uh, I wouldn't even put it all. That's actually a good one for the universal negative. Benefits you don't need. They're mainly looking for like for sale, four person.
put Sana. Anyway, we'll have our two lists, and then what I want you to do is take the terms in the in the low branded list, the buying intent, and we want to put them in this phrase match tool here. And we want to put phrase match like this. Make keyword list, select all, and go into our low funnel keyword list and just paste them. Oop. Copy and then paste. And then they will all be phrase match. And we want to create a medium funnel list. And we want to do the same thing with our generic branded terms. Phrase match. And then we want to put them in our list here. And then we want to do that for every brand that we have. So that's just an example of one brand. But we would use the same keyword list for all of them, but just every brand we need to do that for. So these lists will have that for all the brands. So low funnel is the buying intent ones. It shows specificity or buying intent, such as for sale. These ones are more generic and those will go in the medium list. So you'll do that for each brand. Um, and then the next thing you do is you want to create a campaign. <clears throat> To start, we want to have Google Shopping campaigns. So always make your objective sales. Always make sure your conversion goal is purchases. Go shopping. Continue with shopping campaigns. Standard shopping campaigns. Then put high funnel, high shopping. Always optimize for conversion value. You can leave this on, enhance CPC. Budget, just do like $5 a day to start. We will ramp this up eventually, but not now. Um, campaign priority, this is very important, put high. So what this means is that if we have multiple campaigns with the same products in it, it's gonna go to this one first. And then we're gonna attach our negative keyword list to this campaign, and it will filter them to the lower ones. So as we get, so high funnel, Let's say if I typed in the word sauna, it would show up in our high funnel campaign. And then let's say if I typed in health me sauna, we're gonna have a negative keyword here that will then skip the high funnel campaign into the medium campaign, where we'll bid higher for health mate sauna. And then to say it was health mate enriched to sauna, like a specific product, we'll have negative keywords in both of these from our low keyword list and we'll filter to both to our low funnel, which is where we'll bid the highest. But this campaign needs to be high. Always turn this off, search partners off, enter location. Always do the United States. And then we want to turn off Alaska, Hawaii, and Puerto Rico. Like that. In location options, always put presence in or regularly in. We don't want people interested, so they could be anywhere in the world that they're interested in the US will show it to them. We do not want that. And then ad group, we want to do the, we don't have one for every brand. So healthmate high is what I would put here. And bid, we want to just do this extremely low to start. So now we have our campaign. It will say healthmate high all products. So we do not want all products. We want to go in and we want to go brand healthmate. Save. And then make sure you do this, this is very important, turn off everything else. So the only ones that should be in the HealthMate ad group are the HealthMate products. Let's say HealthMate, and then we're going to go in, we're going to apply our custom label that we made. That one's not loaded yet, but I had one from before. And we're going to have all of our, product, our prices. So it should look like this. And you can do, just put the bid at like, I don't know, 10 cents for, for now. And then what we wanna do, let's go inside of our keywords, go to negative keywords, use negative keyword list, and in the high funnel campaign, so high shopping, we wanna have one, two, we wanna have all three. And lastly, we want to go into devices. 
we want to go to mobile phones, change bit adjustments, decrease by 66%, be 70%. In tablets, we want to bit adjust down 50%. Now we want to first, I'm not going to do it in this example, but you would then want to have that for every brand that you have. So it should be just the brand, everything else is off and only in subdivided by price like this for every brand. Once you have that, go to your campaigns and now copy it and paste. <clears throat> Okay, now we have high shopping two, take away the two and put medium. Now this is very important. We want to go into medium settings. We want to change the priority to medium. And then we want to go into keyword lists. And we want to remove the medium funnel negative keyword list. Remove. So the medium, the only who should be universal and low. And the priority should be now changed to medium. <clears throat> Lastly, we want to do that one more time. We want to take actually first in the medium, we usually go in, change the health mate name to health mate. And it's very important guys that you follow this exactly. And it's very important that <clears throat> um, when you're doing this, like Um, campaigns need to have all products in every campaign. Like if you have a product in the medium campaign but not the high campaign, then you're going to bid on the medium product regardless of whether... So if I, if I, if I put a term, in, if, if a product is in the medium campaign but not the high campaign, my medium bid will go to that product no matter how generic the term is. So even if it was just like sauna, if there's no bid for that product in the high campaign to take it first, it will go right to the medium. So it's very important that every product is in every campaign. That's why we copy paste because if you are trying to do it manually, it will be very confusing and you might make a mistake. Um, so it's easier to copy paste in each campaign. So you know that everything is the exact same. The only thing you're changing is the priority and the keywords. So now lastly, we want to take this. <clears throat>
So now that it's low, we want to go into the low. Change the priority to low. Go to keywords and the low should have only universal negatives in it. So remove the low one. So just to be clear, the high funnel campaign should have universal, medium, and low. The medium campaign should have universal and low. And the low campaign should have only universal. And the priority of each should be what it's called. So low, priority, low, shopping. <clears throat> Medium priority, medium shopping, high priority, high shopping. The last step here is we want to do two things. We want to go to shared budgets because the other thing is if one campaign runs out of budget, so let's say our high campaign is the highest priority and it runs out of budget, even though all the generic terms will start, then start filtering from the high to the medium, we're, we're bidding higher, which we do not want. So we want to put shared budget. We want to put all of our campaigns in the same budget. For. So when you go to the home, now it says 15 a day. And just when you're starting, please just do like $5 a day, $10 a day or something. And what we want to do before we increase past this is we want to make sure the right terms are showing up in each campaign. So the way you do that is when, so now you, you go into your low campaign, we should also bid higher here. We should change this to low. Each one should have. Now just put these at like 40, 50 cents or something. And the goal here is again, we just wanna make sure that the campaigns are working correctly and that the right terms are filtering into each campaign. So usually at this point, I would recommend you leave this um, for a couple of days and then come back and we wanna see impressions and we wanna see like what's showing up here. And once we do, we can actually go into the campaign, go to keywords, search terms, and we'll be able to see what search terms are showing in each campaign. But that will take a couple days, so I recommend don't do that right now. Just set them up as I have for each brand. So each brand should be in the high, medium, low. If I was gonna add a new brand now, what I would do is I would make it in the high, do everything I did for the original one. So let's say, so let's say you bring on a new supplier and your ads are already set up. Then you wanna do it like this, so you have Brand, cream pod, all products, always turn this off. Subdivide by price, like this. <clears throat> and then go on your high campaign and you can copy it. You can just copy the ad group, copy, and then go into your medium campaign paste and you won't even need to change the priority. It will be done automatically for you, but <clears throat> you'll then paste it in the medium and paste it in the low and just raise the bids um, like a little bit. This is just for testing right now. So don't worry about it. And once we validate that the right terms are showing in each campaigns, that will be in a new module, but this is it for this one. This is just the basic advertising setup. Um, and I would just want to make sure that, so the goal here should be, once you um, see impressions, you will then go to keywords, search terms, and make sure that in the medium campaign, the only search terms showing in the medium campaign should be the ones that we put in the medium keyword list. And the only search terms showing in the low campaign should be the ones we put in the low keyword list. And <clears throat> once we validated that that's the case, then we can start scaling and ramping up our ads, but we first need to see that. Um, and then I would also go in low, and I would paste my Dream pod campaign here and you also just want to rename it so it's um, reflecting the right campaign just an error
and then raise it like I wouldn't put it much about 40, 40 cents until we validate that it's working correctly. Again, our budget's only at like five bucks a day, so it doesn't really matter. But um, yeah, and then one more thing we should do now while we're here is go into your audience manager up top. Create an audience of website visitors and just name it your store name. So this is Adora Living 100 Day Website Visitors, like that. And then just put visitors of any page. Prefill, you can prefill if you want. Visitors for member duration 100 days. And this will be your remarketing list. Um, match. So just put like slash or something in it because every web page will have. Actually, just put put your and that and then that will be your um, remarketing list, your Dora Living website visitors, and it will populate as people visit your website. Yeah, so you should have this for each brand you have. Um, and once that initial setup is done and you start seeing some impressions, just send me a message on Slack or something. Um, send me a screenshot of the keyword showing up in each campaign. And once we validate that it's good to go, then we can scale up to the next one and start increasing our ads to actually get sales. But we want to make sure that the structure is set up right. That's very, very important. Um, another thing you can do is once that's good to go, you'll go in Bing. Once you're in Bing, what you want to do is you want to go to import from Google Ads, sign in with Google. Make sure your merchant center is there. Next, go advanced import, import specific campaigns. So this will be a thing later, but you'll just want to do them all for now. Um, I would check all these boxes, customize bids. Less competitive, so I usually decrease by 25%. And customized budgets do decrease, I usually do 80%, so it only spend 20 as much as your Google. Um, uncheck that. Uncheck that. And then you'll switch it to next, name it like Google Ads Auto Import. Do it auto, so we'll just do it like as you make changes in your Google account, we'll re, um, any changes to those campaigns. So if you new, add a new ad group to those campaigns, like let's say you go in here and you add a new brand to each campaign, um, you'll just, it'll automatically update it for you and just start import. And then it will be good to go. <clears throat> but that's kind of the initial advertising setup for, for Google and Bing. Um, if you have any questions at all, let me know, but I hope that's clear.